Fractured Secrets, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book Two, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Part One, The Siren. Chapter One. I have a confession. Gala crinkled her nose and hid behind one of the throw pillows on her couch, or I suppose it was our couch now. Ever since I'd agreed to attend Columbia, the girls had been moving at a hundred miles per hour to get me comfortable and settled into my bedroom in their apartment, our apartment. It was going to take me some time to get used to saying that. What did you do? She scoffed, pretending to be insulted. I didn't do anything. I'm basically the most angelic friend you have. I snorted at that. Gala was a sweet girl, but innocent wasn't at the top of the list of adjectives I'd used to describe her. It's more like I saw something. She bit her lip, playing up the suspense. Well, are you going to tell me what it was? I laughed. Gala almost seemed nervous, and that wasn't like her at all. Okay. She took a deep breath. I knew you weren't going to NYU. What do you mean? I mean, I knew it before you decided. I saw you at Columbia with me and Dom. Like, in a vision? I pulled my feet up underneath me and turned to face her, throwing the pillow away to get a better look at her. Gala nodded. That's incredible! You're not mad at me for keeping it from you? No, I'm not mad at all. In fact, I'm glad you didn't tell me before. If you had, I probably would have stayed at NYU just to prove you wrong. Then we'd all be grumpy. She grinned. Yeah, I figured as much. Plus, with as wonky as my visions are, I never can be too sure if it's real or a daydream, you know? I nodded. She hadn't had a single successful vision in the short time I'd known her, until now. Maybe your lessons with Rossell are paying off. Ugh, I hope they pay off quickly. I'm sick of seeing that smug old son of a... Hello! Dom burst through the front door with more fervor than usual. Hey! I glanced over my shoulder to greet her and immediately jumped out of my seat when I caught a glimpse of her. Dom! Your hair! Gala jumped up, too, and followed me over to our smiling friend. Dom did a small circle in the entryway, then twisted her mouth nervously to one side. Do you like it? I love it, Gala squealed. I do, too. It suits you. Dom's platinum blonde hair, which once hung in waves a few inches past her shoulders, just like Gala's, was now chopped short. Layers jutted out at fun angles, framing her high cheekbones like a rock star. She looked a little like Blondie from the 80s. Phew, Dom exhaled. I mean, I love it either way, but I'm relieved to hear you like it too. I finally feel like I'm ready to tackle the first day of classes on Monday. We spent the next few minutes gushing over Dom's new do, before I finally had to call it a night. In just three short days, I would walk onto campus and finally get a little backstory on who I was and where I came from. The only problem was that I had about 18 years of catching up to do just to even the playing field with my peers. They'd all grown up in this world. They knew what it meant to be a keeper. I didn't. But with a few books from my aunt and the girls, I was absorbing as much information as possible. I wanted to be ready on Monday, or at least come prepared with enough background information to not look like a total dunce if the professor called on me. Did professors call on students in college? Night, girls! I retreated into my room and pulled out my toiletries bag. The amber bottle that housed my vitamins clinked at the bottom. There were only a handful left now, and I still wasn't sure where I could order more. I'd swing by Millie's shop tomorrow to see if she knew what they were. Millie knew everything about medicine and supplements. Surely she could get me some more, even if she didn't know where my mom originally ordered them from. Wait a minute. My mom ordered them. 
Gala! I darted back out of my bedroom door, an idea still stretching its way through my mind like taffy. Gala, I need your help. My roommate startled with wide eyes and open mouths as I burst back into the living room, stumbling over the throw pillow I tossed haphazardly on the floor earlier. Here! I shoved the amber bottle into Gala's hand. My vitamins! My mom was a freak about me taking these every day. She had them specially ordered and everything. Do you think there's a strong enough connection to her that you might be able to use a bottle to induce another vision? Everly, you know my visions are only mediocre at best, and that's if I can even get them to work. But you're getting better. You knew I was coming to Columbia, didn't you? Dom raised a knowing brow. That traitor. She knew it too, and neither one of them admitted it to me. I did, Gala said. But that was like one in a hundred. I'm still really bad at this. Will you try, please? Gala twirled the bottle around an inch from her nose, taking a closer look. These look kind of sketchy. Never mind the vitamins, I huffed. Do you think they have a strong enough connection to my mom for you to see her? I'll take anything, anything you can learn about where she might be. She shrugged. Only one way to find out. Dom and I followed her back to the couch. Gala sat cross-legged on the floor in front of us, holding the bottle between both hands. Eyes closed, she began mouthing something so quietly, I only heard the softest ghost of a whisper drifting across the space between us. One minute stretched to two, three. Her mouth stopped moving, but her eyes remained closed. I glanced at Dom, who gave a small, reassuring nod. Maybe it was working. After about five minutes, Gala still hadn't moved. I was nearly ready to chalk it up as a failed attempt when at last her eyes popped open. Her normally rich brown irises were stained black and enlarged until the whites of her eyes were just barely visible around the edges. She stared into the distance, beyond the room we sat within, seeing something I couldn't even begin to name. And when she spoke, her voice wasn't hers. It was deeper, raspier, full of authority. And I knew. Gala saw my mom. The bars, she began, are firm and unrelenting. There's nowhere to go. It's impossible to run. My breath hitched. Dom gripped my hand in hers as we both scooted to the edge of the couch, leaning in closer to Gala so as not to miss a single word. The woman has great power. Her eyes glow with it, blue like the ocean. It's bursting at the seams, but it cannot be released. She must wait until he returns to set her free. She dropped her chin and closed her eyes again. No one moved a muscle. I didn't even dare to take a breath. After several more seconds of silence, Gala's body was racked with tremors. I jumped to her side, but they passed just as quickly as they had come on. She lifted her head and blinked her pretty brown eyes a few times before grinning. I think it worked. You saw her? My mom? I think so. Gala nodded emphatically. She looked a little like you, but her eyes were so mesmerizing. Your mom's kinda hot. I shook off her commentary and grabbed Gala by the knees. We were all on the floor now, anxiously waiting to hear what else she might be able to reveal. Okay, tell me everything. I did. Gala looked confused. I spoke out loud during the vision, right? Yeah, but your language was vague. What did you see? I saw your mom behind bars. She was in some kind of cell, and her eyes were glowing with power. She shrugged. That's about it. You said she was waiting on someone to release her. Who? I don't know. The visions aren't always clear, especially when they involve the thoughts of a subject rather than physical details. It's okay. Dom patted my back, picking up on my frustration. 
She's got her powers, so she'll be able to bust out of that cell in no time. She was a messenger, right? She had her powers bound after I was born. My shoulders slumped as I realized we were no closer to finding her now than we had been before. Not true, Gala said. If her eyes were glowing, she's got her powers back. How can that be? And if she has her powers, why is she still hanging out in the cell? The binding only works on Earth, Dom said. If she's in Keeper territory, her powers would be fully restored. And if that's the case, there are different enchantments placed on Keeper prisons to prevent escape. But Millie reported her as missing to the Council. They said she hadn't been located. Wouldn't they confer with the other Keepers? I'm sure they did. But they may not get the truth if whoever took her as a prisoner doesn't want anyone else to know. But why? Why would someone want to take her at all? I buried my face into my hands. None of this made any sense. I wanted to ask Gayla to try again, but the way she was sprawled out across the floor now told me that it had probably taken a lot out of her. She was awfully pale. Can we go to the Keeper territories ourselves and try to find her? Dom frowned. Even if it were that easy, which it's not, you'd die if you tried to access the Keeper lands. You're still immortal. I cursed under my breath. The answer was so close, and yet there was still not a thing I could do about it. Not unless I somehow got my powers to shift into gear. Assuming I had any, that is. Chapter 2 Sean knocked on our door the next morning right on time, but my Atlantean guard dog was looking much less Doberman and much more Basset Hound this morning. What's up? I asked as we made our way out onto the street. Uh, nothing. I'm good. How's life with the Olympians? It's great, actually. Gala's visions are starting to work. Mm. He shoved his hands into his pockets and stared straight ahead as we walked. Did you hear me? She had a vision last night, right in front of me and Dom. She saw my mom. Mm-hmm. He wasn't listening to a word I said. Sean, I nudged him with my elbow. Yeah, I'm good. Ugh, no use talking to a broken record. I left him alone and got lost in my own thoughts the rest of the way to Millie's shop. It was a long walk, but that was good. I had lots of thinking to do. I would try to get Millie alone once we got there and show her my vitamins to see if she could order me some more. And while we were on the subject, I might try to get a little more information about my mom's powers as well. Dom had seemed really confident that being in Keeper territory would restore them. Surely Millie would know something about that. Finally, we reached the door to the apothecary. Sean paused a few feet from the entrance. Aren't you coming in? I asked. Nah, I'm going to head back. I'll pick you up when you're done with your shift. Sean, that's crazy. You just walked for like half an hour. Come in and rest for a second. Get a drink before you head back. He pursed his lips, but I grabbed him by the arm anyway and tugged him inside with me. I kind of wanted Millie to have a look at him, too. He was acting very strangely. Good morning, Abby called out from behind the counter. Hi, Sean. He yanked his arm loose and spun around, bolting out of the door in about half a second. Abby's lip trembled, and she cleared her throat. Excuse me for a minute, she said, brushing past Millie on her way to the storage area in the back of the shop. Uh, good morning, I called out to no one in particular. What was that all about? Millie shrugged, though I suspected she knew more than she was letting on. Who knows? How are you doing this morning? All ready for school to start in a couple of days? Just about. I've got one more textbook to pick up, then I think I'm set. I pulled the amber vitamin bottle from my purse and set it on the counter in front of my aunt. Hey, do you know what kind of vitamins these are? She picked it up, examining the glass and the pills inside. Nope, never seen these before. They don't have any markings. 
she squinted at the few pills rattling around in the bottom of the bottle. My mom always special ordered them for me, but I don't know from where. I was hoping to get some more. We can definitely get you some more vitamins, and maybe some that look a little more trustworthy. Millie laughed. That made two people in the last 24 hours who implied my vitamins were sketchy. But they were totally normal. I'd been taking them my entire life, and generally speaking, I wasn't too weird or messed up. No, I think it has to be these. Mom said she tried several different kinds when I was younger, and I had bad reactions or something. I don't know. All I know is that she was kind of a dictator when it came to my vitamins. It had to be this kind, and I had to take them every day, right on time. Millie frowned. Hmm, was all she said to that. Well, I can send one off to the lab to see if they can break it down and figure out what it's made of, if it's really that important to you. Thanks. I know it sounds silly, but it really is important to me. It's like the last connection I still have to her, you know? Millie pulled me into a quick hug, kissing the top of my head as Abby re-emerged from the back. I know, sweetheart. I'll do my best. Unfortunately, with Abby back in the room, I couldn't inquire further about my mom's powers. I'd have to save that discussion for later. Millie stepped out to grab us some deli subs around lunchtime, and Abby cornered me the instant the door swung shut behind her. Hey, can I talk to you about something? It's kind of personal. Yeah, sure. I scanned the shop looking for some excuse to get me out of this, in case she started asking about keeper stuff that I couldn't reveal. Had she overheard something? Maybe she saw Millie enchanting a drought for one of the Olympian men who swung by earlier. Shoot, I was not ready for this. Have you talked to Sean much lately? Oh, that. I might have rather dealt with the keeper's secrets than talk to Abby about Sean. Um, not much. Why? He seems a little standoffish lately. I was just wondering if he maybe confided anything to you about why he's behaving that way. I paused to take a good look at the girl. Her puffy eyes and blotchy nose revealed that she was much more upset about this than she tried to let on. And if there was something truly wrong with Sean, I probably needed to suck it up and work with Abby to get it figured out. I'm sorry, I said. I noticed he was really weird this morning with his head in the clouds, but he didn't say anything to me about why. She sniffled. Okay, thanks. Wait. I caught her elbow as she tried to turn away. Is everything okay? Do you know something I don't? Does he need help? I... Her lip trembled again. I think I messed everything up. Her words were gobbled by sobs, and she buried her face in my shoulder. It's okay, I said, lightly patting her on the back. She sucked up a nose full of snot and released another wave of wails. Poor girl was ugly crying on me, and I was too uncomfortable to do anything but awkwardly pat her on the back. How on earth was anyone so worked up over Sean? Don't cry, Abby. I'm sure you didn't mess anything up. Tell me what happened. Last I know, he was rushing to comfort her after we eliminated the man poisoning her father. She was the first person on his mind. There was no way she could have messed up their friendship. I kissed him. Okay, maybe there was one way. She inhaled snotty mouthfuls of air. He came over to check on me the other night. He was so concerned and just really seemed like he cared. But I must have misinterpreted it, because I kissed him and he left right away. Now he's not talking to me at all. I pulled away to grab her a tissue, and she just kept right on spilling her secrets to me. Now I know he was only being nice to me because my dad was sick. And now my dad is feeling better, but I almost wish we could go back to how things were a week ago when Sean still cared. What kind of terrible person does that make me? 
Her words were drowned out again in a soft cry, followed by a loud trumpet-like blow into her tissue. You're not a terrible person at all, Abby. Sean is just a supernatural being who can never be with a mortal. Ugh, how was I going to make her feel better about this? He's just a guy. Guys this age don't know how to show their emotions. He probably really likes you, but he's scared, you know? I'm sure things will get back to normal between you two soon. But for now, maybe just give him a little bit of space. I just wish I could find a guy who wasn't afraid to show interest. Someone who puts me first and lets me know how he feels. Someone brave enough to let me know that he's only got eyes for me. There's got to be one out there somewhere, right? The front door chimed. I turned to greet our new customer, seeing as how Abby was in no kind of shape to talk to anyone, and my jaw dropped. Abby gasped behind me. Everly Gordon, I've been looking all over the city for you. Is that... Abby whispered. Clayton Miles. The A-list actor gracing every tabloid in the country walked forward with his hand extended. Abby reached out, soggy tissue still clamped between her fingers, and shook his hand. Clayton Miles, she repeated, dumbstruck. She still had his hand gripped in hers, the snot rag the only thing separating them. Abby, I pulled her gently away from him. Why don't you go get cleaned up? I need just a minute. She nodded, mouth still agape, and retreated to the back of the shop. As soon as the green curtain swished shut behind her, I turned to face our handsome new visitor. Why would you be looking for me? A quick glance over his shoulder revealed that he was alone. Well, I'm in town to film a movie, and I remembered you said you were in the city. You're going to Columbia, right? Did I mention where I lived to him? We only spoke for half a minute on Gala's boat in the Hamptons. I definitely didn't say I was going to Columbia because I didn't think I was at the time. There are eight million people in this city. I can't imagine why you would attempt to find me. And how did you wind up here at the apothecary? Something about this seemed off. The keepers are a tight-knit bunch, he winked, and I noticed his hazel eyes still contained the standard Agarthian golden flecks. I guess he couldn't completely hide his true identity. I resisted the way my stomach still wanted to somersault at the sight of him and focused on getting to the bottom of this. I'm not a keeper. Your tight-knit bunch doesn't even know who I am. They know your aunt. Come on, Ev. He reached out and allowed his hand to glide down my upper arm the way a friend or a lover might do. Lighten up. My movie is filming on your campus, and I just thought it would be nice to have a friendly face around the set. Maybe you can show me some of your favorite spots around the area. It's Everly, I said, stepping away. And I don't have any favorite spots on campus. I haven't even started school yet. I looked through the store front windows again, searching for any reasonable evidence that might indicate why he was truly here. Was I being pranked? Did Gala put him up to this? If so, the prank was going sour. He might charm every girl in his path. He even charmed me the first night we met. But I was less than impressed by this encounter. In fact, it was a little unsettling. Never in a million years would I have thought getting hit on by a gorgeous global celebrity would leave me feeling creeped out. Okay, he raised both hands in the air. I can see that you're busy working right now. I shouldn't have interrupted you unannounced like this, but I happen to know there's a back-to-school party next week at St. A's, and I'd love it if you came. I'm going so I can get into character for my role. St. A's? Don't worry, I can get you in. I don't... no. I shook my head. I don't know what that is or care to attend any parties... Look, Clayton, I appreciate you stopping by, but I really just want to focus on my schoolwork. I'm not interested in... He laughed, cutting me off. This guy obviously wasn't used to rejection. 
But did I really just reject Clayton Miles? Who was I? I was a girl on a mission, that's who, and I didn't need any boys, celebrity heartthrob or otherwise, distracting me from my studies. I had to find my mom. Don't say no. Just say you'll think about it. He winked again and turned toward the door. I'll see you around, Ev. It's Everly, I called out, but the door had already swung shut behind him. Chapter 3 I'd forgotten all about Clayton by the time Monday morning rolled around. I hadn't seen much of Sean, either. He'd laid low, content that Gala and Dom were sufficient to keep me well guarded in his absence. There were some definite perks to living with keepers. Dom and I shared our first class Monday morning. It was the one I'd been looking most forward to. A review of the ancient languages. Though it was more like an intro than a review for me. Still, apparently Professor Brossard was the go-to guy when it came to ancient texts and forgotten languages. I guzzled down my latte from the honeypot and quickly wiped the foam from my upper lip. Easy there, killer, Dom laughed, but she looked just as excited as I felt. Her short hair bounced with each eager step she took, making her look more alive than I'd ever seen her. Maybe my enthusiasm was contagious. I can't help it. This feels like the first real step in finding my mom. I can't wait to meet Professor Brossard. Dom paused on the sidewalk, pointing up ahead. Hang on, what's going on up there? I followed her look with a groan. Looks like a film set. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that flyer at the honeypot. I think it's a Clayton Miles movie. It is. Did I mention he stopped by the apothecary the other day? Uh, no. She turned and drilled her eyes into me. And that's definitely something you should have mentioned. I guess I'd been too concerned about Sean to mention Clayton, and I obviously didn't bring up either one to Gala. There was no need to hurt her feelings by sharing stories of Sean and Abby. I'll explain, but is there any other way to get to our class? Not if you want to be on time. All right, but let's try to hurry past the set. I don't want to get caught up in the crowd and be late. I filled her in on my strange meeting with Clayton a few days earlier, pushing as quickly as we could through the thick crowd that had gathered around the set. They were mostly freshmen, if I had to guess, wide-eyed and gushing over their luck at getting to attend such a famous school right alongside real celebrities. I rolled my eyes and continued telling Dom what happened, conveying to her with my mind what I couldn't say out loud in front of the mortals. Ha! <laughs> the mortals! As if I were any different! I just got into the part about him inviting me to the party when the crowd parted. Dom's jaw dropped. Don't look now, but... Everly! I turned to find two muscular arms reaching out from a shirtless hunk of a man. No, not a hunk. Clayton. I couldn't let his good looks distract me, but there was no ignoring him, even if I tried. He swept me up against his chest and spun me in a circle. I'm so glad you came out to watch us film. Wiping my face, I stepped away from him as soon as my feet reconnected with the ground. Why are you all wet? They had to spray me down with water to look like sweat. Do you like it? I look athletic, right? He flexed, and a chorus of sighs and whistles from the student body surrounding us drew my attention back to the crowd. Cell phones were pointing at us from all directions. One girl even spoke into her camera, apparently live-streaming the event. Live-streaming me. Say cheese. Clayton whispered. He winked and blew a kiss to the camera. No, Clayton, I've got to get to class. That's my girl. Go learn something good, he called out as I stomped away. Gross. I locked arms with Dom and scuttled away as quickly as I could without breaking into a full run. That was way worse than I was expecting, Dom muttered once we'd put some distance between us. A few cell phones still filmed me walking away, but most had turned their attention back to Clayton and the movie set. 
It's over the top, right? I'm not his girl. Definitely over the top. And you're right, something seems fishy about it. A trio of girls up ahead stepped onto the sidewalk in front of us. In almost perfectly synchronized time, they crossed their arms over their chests and shot daggers at me through their eyes. Excuse us, I said, stepping around them. We were about to be late, and that was not the first impression I wanted to make with the professor who was going to help me decipher the tablet and find my mom. One girl scoffed, but they were the least of my worries. What is wrong with people today? I asked Dom. Well, those three are Agarthians, and they're probably jealous. Jealous about what? You and Clayton. Ha! Huh, they have no need to be jealous. That guy weirds me out. And even if I was into him, he can't be with a mortal. They know that. Well, he can't bond with a mortal. That doesn't mean he can't date one. But I thought keepers all had soulmates anyway. Why would they care? They are probably hoping he is their soulmate. Even keepers aren't immune to a good-looking guy and a little glamour, and they hate to see one of their kind fraternizing with a mortal. It's like a slap in the face. Are they really holding out hope that Clayton Miles might be their soulmate? I cringed. Seems a little desperate. Also, they would probably know it if he was, right? Dom shrugged. They say you know your soulmate when you find them, but until you do, no one really knows what to expect. It's a little different for everyone, I imagine. But don't let those girls bother you. Let's just get on to class. Right. I risked one last look over my shoulder at the girls. They followed us, eyes hard set and trained on me. Thank goodness I had Dom here. After just three minutes on campus, it seemed that I was already developing an army of enemies. This year was going to be just splendid. Thanks a lot, Clayton. Chapter 4 We slipped into the classroom with two minutes to spare. I threw out my empty latte cup and settled into a seat next to Dom just a few rows from the back, extracting a notebook and pen from my bag. A quick glance around the room told me that I was likely the only mortal here. A cluster of white and blonde-haired Olympians sat near the front, including a male who looked like he might grow up to be a weatherman. His hair was so perfectly placed that even an Oklahoma tornado wouldn't do much to move it. Behind them was a crowd of what I assumed were Atlanteans, all with gorgeous sparkling blue eyes and reddish-brown hair. A pang struck me at the thought that in another world I might have been sitting there alongside them. The other students varied in appearance, some of the Agarthians maintaining their beautiful golden eyes, and some changing their appearance to better fit in around the mortals on campus. But they were all too beautiful to truly look human. Everyone except me. I was squarely in the mortal department when it came to looks. And I wasn't the only one who noticed. A few beautiful faces turned to stare, leaning in close and whispering amongst their friends. Relax, guys. She's Atlantean. She just hasn't gotten her powers yet. Dom huffed out an annoyed breath and turned to me. It'll be fine. They'll get used to you. How do they know I'm immortal? It's hard to explain, but once a keeper has received their powers, it becomes very obvious to all the others who and what they are. It's almost like an aura around them. How cool. What does my aura look like? You have no aura, Dom frowned. Or at least not the keeper kind. Well, that explained all the dirty looks I'd gotten since entering the room. There was some shuffling in the seats behind us, followed by a grunt of disapproval. The mortal is here. The newcomer didn't even attempt to lower her voice. I turned to see the three Agarthian girls from outside earlier. Great. This day just couldn't get any worse. Thankfully, a door at the front of the room opened then, and a tall, older man entered. He was in no hurry to settle in, slowly removing a book and glasses case from his bag. He opened a laptop, furrowing his brows and clicking around with a stream of whispered curse words. Finally, his brows lifted with a sigh. 
Ah, there we go. A large screen behind him lit up with a picture of the professor and a short bio. I'm Professor Brossard. Welcome to a review of the ancient languages. He smiled, moving his gaze across the faces in the classroom, faltering only slightly when he landed on me. Mercifully, he said nothing and continued with the lesson. There wasn't much of a lecture, more just a review of the syllabus and what we could expect to come throughout the semester. The final slide showed a picture of the professor with another man standing in front of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The men looked jovial. Professor Brossard wore a floppy canvas hat and a big grin under his sunburned nose. His companion wore a similar hat, but it wasn't enough to hide his curly orange hair. One section of curls stood out from the others, bright white, and it hung low over his forehead. His eyes sparkled a bright aqua blue, like my Aunt Millie's, and something about him intrigued me, making it difficult to pull my eyes away. I imagined he had lots of good stories to tell. We were dismissed a few minutes early, and the other students immediately shuffled through the aisles to get out, but I wasn't so eager to leave. Hey, Dom, I think I'm going to hang back for a few minutes. I need to talk to the professor. She nodded, clearly seeing my true intentions. I had to find out if he could help me read the tablet. That's fine, but I can't stay with you. I've got to get on the other side of campus. Sean is nearby, though. I'll text him to meet you on the low steps after class. If you must, I grinned. Millie would be upset if I took off without my trusty bodyguard or at least a friendly keeper of some kind. But I wouldn't resist today, not after seeing those cruel looks from the Agarthian girls. I waved goodbye and made my way down to the front of the room. Most of the other students had already filtered out, but the professor was busy shutting down his computer. I cleared my throat as I approached, hesitant to interrupt him. Excuse me, Professor Brossard, do you have a minute? I think I can spare one. He bent over his desk, shuffling through papers and tidying up. He didn't seem particularly interested in chatting, but I figured I may as well continue since I was already here. Great, thank you. I'm Everly Gordon. I'm Atlantean, I added quickly. He would see that I had no aura, as Dom put it. I just haven't received my powers yet. Yes, yes, I figured that was the case, Otherwise, they wouldn't have allowed you into my room. My mouth pulled itself into an embarrassed smile. Right. Well, I'm honored to be in your class this semester. I look forward to learning from you. You see, I have this artifact that I can't decipher. I don't recognize the language, but I hear you are really knowledgeable with things like that. So I'm hoping after learning from you, I'll be able to get it figured out. It is my specialty. He stopped shoving things into his bag and finally looked up at me, appraising me for just a moment before asking, What kind of artifact? It's a stone tablet, or a piece of one anyway. It may have been broken. I see. He zipped up his bag and slung it over his shoulder, squinting at me before continuing. I'd be happy to take a look at it if you'd like. Really? That would be amazing. When would be a good time? tonight? I have a dinner meeting this evening, but I can probably examine it before I go. How about 5.30? That sounds great. Are you familiar with the honeypot? I am. Let's meet there. Ancient tablets shouldn't be quite as shocking to our people as they should be to mortals, so it's a safe place to discuss our findings. Our people. At least he considered me on the same level as the other keeper students. Very good, sir, and thank you again. I'll see you later. I practically skipped out of the room. Maybe this day would turn out all right after all. Chapter 5 The other students had completely cleared the hallway outside of our classroom. There wasn't a person in sight. There was, however, an adorably fluffy orange and white tabby cat sitting across the hall when I exited. Hey, little guy. The cat stood and meandered over to me, winding itself lazily between my feet. I reached down to pet its head, 
but it ducked and moved off to the side. I don't think you're supposed to be in here. Come on, let's get you outside. The cat moved in front of me and stopped, rolled onto its back, and shot me an expectant look. You want me to rub your belly? It was an awfully canine move for a cat, and one that usually resulted in playful bites and claws to the arm from my experience with our barn kittens back in Oklahoma. I reached down, and sure enough, the cat latched onto my arm with claws from all four feet. But it wasn't playing around. The animal instantly drew blood and bit me with a feline ferocity I'd never experienced, more like a tiger than a barn cat. Ouch! I tried to yank my arm away, but the cat held on tighter, kicking me with its back feet and shredding my skin with its front claws. One of the Agarthian girls from earlier rushed around the corner. You found my sweetie kins! Instantly, the cat released me and sulkily trotted back over to the wall where I first found it. Your cat mauled me! Why would you bring a beast like that on campus? The question burst from my mouth before I had time to think it through, and the cat hissed. But in that moment, I didn't care if the girl could overpower me. It didn't matter that she'd tried to murder me with a glare earlier that day or rudely pointed out my mortality in class. My arm was bleeding, and I was ticked off. But the Agarthian girl didn't react angrily. She appeared quite calm, in fact. A slow smile spread across her face, and her brown eyes flashed with a golden glow. Please give me my cat. No, I told you it just attacked me. Give me my cat now. The girl's eyes glowed brighter, and something shifted within me. Back in the recesses of my mind, I knew I was being glamoured. She was a siren, like Tate. I knew it, but there wasn't a darn thing I could do about it. Okay, I muttered, stepping toward the animal. It turned and quickly padded down the hall opposite the girl. What are you waiting for? she asked, her voice somehow made up of multiple harmonies. Even as she commanded me to do her bidding, I found myself enchanted by the sound of it. Go get it. The cat waited for me at the end of the hall. I moved for it, and just as I could almost reach out and pick it up, it moved again, turning to the left. It halted outside of a bathroom door. Stay, kitty. I lifted both hands and tiptoed forward, aware of the Agarthian girl on my heels. She made no attempt to get the cat herself, and I knew she was playing with me for her own entertainment. I approached the animal again, and the bathroom door swung open. The cat darted inside. I turned back over my shoulder, and the girl threw her hands in the air, her expression a clear and silent insult to my intelligence. She may as well have shouted, Get in there and grab it, you idiot! Of course, she didn't have to say anything else. I was still under her spell from before, bound by her command to get the cat. I knew I could do nothing else until my task was accomplished. She followed me into the bathroom, where a second Agarthian from the Mean Girl squad stood waiting. Once inside, the second girl raised a hand and the door slammed shut behind us. Did you just... My words were cut short by a huge gust of wind that slammed me back into the wall, pinning me there, unable to move. The first girl laughed. You weak little mortal. She turned toward the second girl. You can drop her, Stella. She's not going anywhere. Are you mortal? The pressure of the wind released me, but the glow of the girl's eyes and the melodic sound of her voice was just as strong a captor. I timidly shook my head, eliciting laughter from both girls now. The cat circled in place on the floor, and in a move I never saw coming, grew and shifted, standing on its feet and rising up to our height. Its fur appeared to melt into smooth, tan skin, and its face morphed into the beautiful feline features of the third Agarthian girl. Her strawberry blonde hair 
fell loosely to her shoulders, and her large green eyes still sparkled with golden flecks. She grimaced and marched over to the sink, scooping palmfuls of water into her mouth and swishing before spitting back into the basin. Ew, you taste disgusting. I can't believe you bit her, the first girl laughed louder now. She was having way too much fun at my expense. Shut up, Camille. She was about to walk away. Maybe if you had shown up on time. Enough, girls. Stella, the one who could apparently create gusts of wind with her bare hands, seemed to be in charge. The other two girls silenced at her command, and all eyes turned toward me. What are you doing here, mortal? Stella made no attempt to change the color of her eyes. They were a beautiful amber color, like Tate's. Her hair was a rich espresso, and her skin a flawless, deep golden brown tan. I imagined this was as close to a pure Agarthian appearance as they could get. She was strikingly beautiful, even with her face twisted into a mocking hatred. Being trapped against my will, I scowled. Camille snorted. No one is holding you here. She sneered, fully knowing that I couldn't resist her glamour. I mean, what are you doing in keeper classes at Columbia? And don't tell me you belong here. No one has ever had to wait beyond their 18th birthday for their powers to come in. I'm not buying your story. I gulped. At least none of these girls were telepaths like Dom. It doesn't matter if you buy my story or not. It's the truth. Probably. She raised her hands and another gust of wind slammed me backward, causing me to knock my head against the wall. Watch your mouth, mortal, and watch your back, too. No one is going to sit quietly off to the side while you try to get cozy with one of our most sought-after males. If you can't keep your hands to yourself, we'll just have to show you your way out of New York. The girl was fuming. I should have kept my big mouth shut if I knew what was good for me, but I couldn't resist just a little more trash talk. My words were the only power I had over them, after all. Ah, oh, what's wrong? Are you sad that he might be more attracted to a human than any of you? And what about your own soulmates? Nervous that maybe they don't exist? That maybe their souls have been fractured by all the other Agarthian men who've taken mortal lovers? I was going out on a limb with that one, but seeing as how the Agarthians seemed to hate fractured souls more than any of the other keeper races, I thought it might be a bit of a sour spot for them. And I was right. My words definitely struck a chord. The cat girl immediately shifted back into her feline form, jumping at me at the same time my hand turned the knob behind me. I'd caught them by surprise and knocked them off their guard. The door was unlocked, and I spun out into the hallway, pushing it closed behind me before I could suffer another claw attack or hurricane from Stella. I'd been prepared to run, but the guy across the hall stopped me in my tracks. Tate! Thank goodness! I need your help! I swear he was bathed in golden light, like a gift from above. A ridiculously attractive gift. He leaned propped against the wall, one ankle kicked over the other, expressionless with those gorgeous golden eyes trained on me. I gripped the doorknob hard, feeling the girls on the other side working to shove it open again. Little mortal! Camille's sing-songy voice was muffled, but I still felt its power fluttering through my mind. I can't hear you, I shouted, drowning her out. La, 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 la. Yep, I was restoring to the tactics of a ten-year-old. But it worked. Her already muffled voice was drowned out by my immature shouting. A gust of wind blew out of the bottom edge of the door, nearly knocking me off my feet. But I leaned against it with all my weight and somehow managed to keep them inside. But I knew it wouldn't hold much longer. Please, I cried out again to Tate. Don't just stand there. They're trying to hurt me. He didn't say a word. His golden eyes looked straight into me, somehow making my body come alive. 
After what felt like several minutes, though it was probably just half a second or so, I was burning up. Come on, Tate, do something! The door gave way, and my body was thrown to the ground. I jumped up, barely risking a glance over my shoulder, as I heard Stella say something to my hunter. I never made out what it was. I was too busy running. Within seconds, I was back at the front door of the building, relieved as the sunshine blasted down upon my cheeks. But I didn't dare stop. I wanted to put as much space between those Agarthian girls and me as possible. And Tate? I didn't even know what to think about Tate. I knew he wasn't there to protect me. I knew he was just as big an enemy as anyone else on this campus. And yet I felt betrayed. Why wouldn't he help me? Chapter 6 I ran and ran and ran. If I just kept moving, I wouldn't have to worry about the strange looks I got from other students or respond to the offers for help. Humans couldn't help me. Not with super-powerful Agarthians on my tail. Though truth be told, I wasn't even sure if they'd followed me out of the classroom building. And like all good things, eventually, the adrenaline wore off. The burn in my legs brought me to a stop, and the stitch in my side bent me in half. I'd somehow wound up in a parking lot. It was mostly empty, well shaded by established trees, and it had no identifying features. I didn't even know which side of campus I was on anymore. I wished I'd paid better attention during my original tour with Dom and Gala. But the campus wasn't too large, so I had to be near one of the main roads by now. If I continued straight ahead, I'd run into one eventually. After rubbing out a Charlie horse in my calf, I stood up to find my snowy white owl friend sitting on the asphalt a few feet in front of me. Ugh, I groaned. Please tell me you're not here to warn me of impending doom again. I stepped to the side and tried to get around the owl, but it bounced right back over in front of me. I squatted down to look into its sentient yellow eyes. I'm trying to get away from some Agarthians who are trying to hurt me right now. I don't know if you can actually understand me or not, but if you can, I need you to move. Now. I stood and tried to zag back to the left, but like before, the owl mimicked my movements and blocked my way again. Okay, really? Is this like back in the alley? Are you trying to guide me somewhere? You're better than a dog, even a fluffy helpful one like Lassie. The owl blinked. Look, bird, I honestly do not have time for this right now. You're cute and all, but I've got to get out of here. We stared each other down for a few breaths, and then, without any warning, I lunged forward into a sprint. The plan was to catch the owl off guard and run right past it, but of course it saw me coming. Who knew owls had such great reflexes? Either that, or the bird read my mind like Dom and knew what was coming. But I refused to believe that. It was just an animal, right? The owl lifted off of the ground, flapping in place about as high as my shoulder. We collided, and out of instinct alone, I swatted the bird away. My hand made contact with the creature, and it was tossed several feet over to the side. I should have used that opportunity to take off and run, but I couldn't just abandon the poor little guy. Even if it was an annoying distraction in my escape, I had to make sure it was okay. I trotted over to where the owl sat on the ground. Its feathers were ruffled, but otherwise it looked to be in good shape. Good enough, anyway. It didn't look happy, though. Are you all right? The bird hopped on its feet and flapped a few feet into the air before landing again. Good. Now please don't try to stop me again. I've really got to go. The owl responded with a long blink. I stood, walking backward away from the animal. We'll catch up again soon, I'm sure. You can show me whatever it was you wanted me to see next time. I sighed, shaking my head at how crazy I probably looked. But at this point, I determined the owl was as big a part of my posse as Sean or Gala, or maybe even more than that. We were friends, in a weird, college-student-meets-wild-animal sort of way. I spun back to the front and froze in place, shocked to see a shiny black coupe barreling straight toward me. 
My fight or flight had been all used up, and I could not get my body to react in any sort of reasonable way. My scream matched the pitch of the brake squealing across the asphalt almost perfectly, and time seemed to slow down as the details all clicked into place. An astonishingly handsome young man sat in the driver's seat, his expression clear as the car sped toward me, Clayton Miles. He had what almost looked like a smirk on his face as our eyes locked onto each other. Dark smoke billowed from behind the vehicle, and a burnt rubber smell filled the air. My owl! He'd tried to warn me, and I didn't listen. I'd have to bring him a dead mouse or something later as a reward for trying to save my life. Again. The car was only a couple of feet away from me now. It was still slowing, but not enough. And it struck me how odd it was that I was able to think through all of this in less than a second. My body wouldn't move, but my mind wouldn't stop. And just like that, time was restored to its usual frantic pace, and the car slammed into me. Its bumper bit into my thighs, knocking me down at the same time it finally came to a stop, shadowing only my feet as I lay on the ground. Ouch! I slid backward and stood, brushing the dirt from myself. That was going to leave a heck of an ugly bruise later. My black and blue thighs would go great with the still bloody scratches running down my forearms from the nasty Agarthian cat girl. I was quite the beauty queen. The driver's side door swung open, and Clayton dashed forward. Everly, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. I took a step back. It's fine, really. You barely got me. I can't believe I actually hit you. Are you okay? He knelt and reached for my legs, but I moved back again. We need to get you to a doctor. Without your powers, you'll need medical attention to get healed up. He raised his eyes to mine, as though he were silently looking for confirmation that I still did not have my powers. Clayton? I put up both hands to stop him. Seriously, I'm fine. I'll see you around. I turned to walk away, but I only made it two steps before I was swooped up into his arms. Nonsense, he said. I'm not a hit-and-run kind of guy. If you won't let me take you to the hospital, then at least let me drive you home. I'll probably be safer walking, I mumbled, leaning away from his chest. He gripped me tighter, pulling me against him in a way that made it impossible for me to ignore the way he smelled, like bourbon and vanilla, and something woodsy that I couldn't quite put my finger on. He pulled open the passenger side door of his car and gently deposited me onto the tan leather seat. I yanked on the handle as soon as the door closed behind me, but it wouldn't budge. Leaning across the console, I reached for the driver's side door next, but Clayton was already there, tisking at my feeble efforts to bust free. I had managed to escape a siren, a shifter, and some girl who could control the wind, but there I was, run over and trapped by child locks in a movie star's car. What a first day. Chapter 7 Shifting my weight to one side, I tried to casually pull my phone from my back pocket, taking my time so as not to draw too much attention from Clayton. He was still babbling on about how I should really seek some medical attention, but I only half listened. Sean might still be waiting for me on the low steps. If I could text him soon, he might be able to get over here and rescue me before Clayton got me too far away from campus. I really didn't relish the idea of Clayton bringing me all the way home. I was sure he could find our address just fine on his own if he really wanted to, but I wasn't going to offer it up to him. Dom was in class, and Gayla had probably left already too, which meant we'd be alone. Nope, there was no way I was going to let that happen. Finally, I wrangled the device free and rested it by my leg, out of Clayton's direct line of sight. Which way do I need to turn? He looked in my direction, and I did my best to put on an innocent face. Uh, let's see. We were back on Broadway. I didn't want to lead him to my apartment, so I figured my Aunt Millie's house was my next best bet. Hang a right. 
With his attention back on the road, I tapped my now cracked phone screen. Nothing. After several more taps and a solid effort to restart the device, it was clear. My phone was dead, probably destroyed when I fell on it after I got hit with the car. Freaking Clayton. The sound of his turn signal at the next intersection brought my attention back to him. Actually, you need to keep going a few more blocks, I said, my heart rate increasing with each word. Where was he taking me now? You're sure you're not injured? I nodded, unsure how that was relevant to my question. Great, because I want to make this up to you. He veered the car off in a direction I'd yet to explore. I was checking out some of the locations where we'll be filming in Morningside Park, and I'd love to show you a really beautiful area over there. It can be like our own little secret getaway in the city. Oh, I'm really fine with just going back home. You don't have to make it up to me at all. I tapped my phone desperately, praying that it might miraculously start working again. I refuse to take no for an answer. It'll be quick, I promise. He flashed a bright smile and winked at me. Okay, so I could definitely see why so many other girls were smitten with him. He was undeniably good-looking. But he still gave me the creeps ever since he showed up unannounced, supposedly searching the city for me. I needed to remember that when my heart began to flutter against my will. A few minutes later, he whipped his car into a spot just a couple of blocks away from a stunning old cathedral. The locks clicked up, and for a second, I considered making a run for it. Clayton watched me closely, almost as if he was suspecting what I was thinking. But my legs were sore, and he was probably fast and strong. Realistically, he'd catch me without any difficulty. Maybe if I played nice, I could get through this quickly and get back home before anyone even noticed I was missing. That seemed like my only viable option at this point. I followed him across the street where he led me to an open platform overlooking a gorgeous park full of steep rock faces and flush with trees down below. Wow, this is... Pretty incredible, right? Clayton grinned and reached for my hand, which I quickly shoved into my pocket. We weren't friends just because he showed me some trees, and we definitely weren't in hand-holding territory. He pretended not to notice my coldness and gestured toward a staircase to the right. Come on, the spot I want to show you is down this way. My feet were heavy, reluctant to follow him down the winding staircase that would take us who knows where. Over my shoulder, way down the road, I could make out the gate that led onto campus. If I ran really hard... Clayton Miles! Oh my goodness! A group of squealing Bernard students hurried across the street. I turned in time to see his eyes narrow just a fraction for the briefest of seconds before he slapped on the smile he was famous for. The girls practically cooed as they skipped over to where he stood. Hello, ladies. We're so sorry to bombard you like this, but would you mind taking a picture with us, just one? He glanced in my direction, and I gave a small nod. Here, hand me your phones, and I'll take a few for you, I said. The girls were practically bouncing with delight as they handed over their devices. I snapped a picture, then another, and when I picked up the third phone, an idea struck me. Whoops, I called out with a giggle. I accidentally backed out of the camera. Hang on. I fumbled around with the phone, doing my best to look technologically inept, when in reality... I was tapping out a text as quickly as I could to Sean. Photographic memories definitely came in handy when recalling phone numbers. S.O.S. Everly. Morningside Park with Clayton Miles. Come quick. Do not respond to this number. I gave it just a second to send, then quickly deleted the message and said a silent prayer. There we go. I snapped the last picture and handed the phones back to the girls. Thanks, Clayton said as I rejoined him near the stairs. Sorry about that. It's unavoidable sometimes. No need to apologize. 
we began our way down the stairs, winding down to the park below. It was truly a lovely sight. If my legs weren't so sore and I was with anyone else, I might have even enjoyed it, especially once we reached the bottom and wound our way over to a pond with a rocky waterfall. Here, Clayton grinned proudly. I thought of you the moment I saw this the other day. It's lovely, I inhaled and closed my eyes. With the sound of the rushing water and the scent of the greenery around me, I could almost imagine I wasn't standing in the middle of one of the most populous cities in the world. Clayton's touch jerked me back to my senses. He gently took my arm in his hands. What happened? he asked, eyeing the scratches. I, uh, had a little run-in with a feral cat. His jaw twitched, but if he suspected the Agarthian girls, he didn't say anything. Hopefully those powers will come in for you soon. Then you won't have to worry about cat scratches or bruises anymore. With a frown, he ran his fingers gingerly over my skin. For a moment, I almost forgot who I was standing with. Here in the park, with birds chirping and children playing in the background, Clayton seemed more innocent, more genuine, more human. Perhaps I was being too harsh. Maybe he really was just looking for a friend. I wouldn't allow myself to get too close, but maybe I could relax my defenses just a little. After all, if he wanted to hurt me, he could have done it a hundred times over by now. We walked through the park, commenting mostly on the things around us. We laughed as he nearly got hit in the head with the soccer ball. We admired a particularly colorful flower bed, and we grumbled together as we circled back around to the staircase that would lead us back up to Morningside Heights. So many stairs, I complained. Clayton's brows raised in the middle. I forgot about your legs. You must be so sore. Here, let me help. He scooped me into his arms again, only this time I didn't resist. I breathed in his smell and allowed myself to enjoy it just a little. He began the ascent effortlessly. I wasn't exactly light as a feather, but I remembered the keepers were stronger than your average Joe. This was nothing for him, so I wouldn't object. We passed a woman carrying a tiny dog in her oversized bag. She grinned warmly at us, assuming we were a couple. Clayton hammed it up, of course. He pulled me closer and snuggled my cheek, much to the woman's delight. She laughed and did a little clap before moving past. Laying it on a little thick, aren't you? Clayton paused. Oh, I don't know. I kind of like the way you feel in my arms. Maybe I was doing it just as much for me as I was for her. He pulled me close again with a crooked half-grin. This was what he was famous for, a charming smile and clever one-liners. He'd used them on many women before me, all featured in the celebrity magazines with shocking headlines about how Clayton Miles did it again, one actress or singer after another. I shouldn't have been so gullible to fall for the same tricks. But in that moment, with sunlight falling across him like glittering confetti through the filtered canopy of trees, he just seemed so likable. So when he brought his face down toward mine, I lifted my chin to meet him halfway. My eyes closed, and I prepared for our lips to touch. What I did not expect was for him to drop me as an owl torpedoed him from out of nowhere. Ah! He waved an arm around his head. The owl flapped off into the trees again, and he turned to where I sat, shocked, with my jaw hanging nearly to the ground. Was that an owl? My mind raced. I almost kissed Clayton Miles on the lips, but my owl stopped me. Why? I doubt it, I muttered, rising to my feet. Seems unlikely that an owl would be right here in the middle of the afternoon in the city. For some reason, I felt like I should keep my friendship with the little bird a secret, at least from Clayton. Everly! I turned toward the familiar voice and caught sight of Sean flying down the stairs like his feet were wheels. Finesse. 
So that's what Sean's powers looked like. Are you all right? He'd barely broken a sweat, but I could tell from his breathing that he'd run a really long way. I'm fine, I said. Just ready to go home. Sean turned and glared at Clayton, a clear warning that he better not have laid a hand on me. Clayton's expression hardened, but he made no attempt to stop me from leaving. Thanks for coming with me, Everly. I enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again sometime. The warmth in his tone made me want to believe him, but the coldness of Sean's glare said it was best to keep going. And sorry again about earlier, he added, as Sean and I turned toward home. Don't worry about it. See ya, I called out. Sorry about what? Sean asked under his breath, gaping at the scratches he just noticed adorning my arms. I'll explain when we get home. It's been a weird morning. Chapter 8 Sean refused to leave the apartment after I detailed my eventful morning for him. He couldn't believe the Agarthian girls would be so bold as to attack me right there on campus and over a boy who I didn't even like. Probably. I mean, I didn't think I liked him anyway. He also thought the whole Clayton accidentally hit me with his car thing was a little suspect, and it was. But he just seemed so genuine at the park. I didn't know what to believe anymore. Are you sure he wasn't glamouring you? Sean paced back and forth in our living room. We were just about to leave for my meeting at the honeypot with Professor Brossard, but he wanted to be sure he had the whole story straight in case we ran into any familiar faces while we were out. I'm pretty sure he wasn't. Camille definitely did. I pursed my lips at the memory of the Garthian girl forcing me to retrieve her cat, or friend or whatever. But I didn't get that feeling of losing control with Clayton. I had my wits about me the entire time. Hmm. Sean ran a hand through his hair. I just can't imagine what he wants with you. Ah, uh, I put my hands on my hips. Maybe he actually likes me? My cheeks flushed at the thought. But would that really be so hard to imagine? And since when did I start arguing on behalf of Clayton Miles anyway? You know, some guys aren't afraid to show a girl that they like her. I shot him a knowing look, though I knew I was being unfair. He could never be with Abby, and it wasn't right for me to tease him about it. Sean pretended not to notice and shrugged, quickly changing the subject. It just seems weird, but we can worry about that later. We've got to get going or you'll be late for your meeting. Thankfully, our conversation shifted to the tablet as we walked over to the coffee shop where I would be meeting with Professor Brossard. Sean seemed almost as excited as I felt. We might finally be on the precipice of something huge, I knew Russell had something to do with my mom going missing, and with the way his stone tablet called to me after her disappearance, I couldn't shake the thought that it was connected somehow, too. And we were finally about to discover what it said. The honey pot was crowded for a Monday night. Students filled the place to the brim, gathered in small groups throughout the warm and welcoming shop. I'll stay off to the side and catch up on my reading, Class has just started, and I'm already worried about falling behind. But I'm here if you need me for anything. Sean patted my back before going up to the counter to order a drink. The espresso-filled aroma of the shop had me jonesing for a hot cup of my own, but I didn't want to waste any time in line, not when I was this close to the truth. I scanned the room until my eyes settled on the oldest man in the place— Professor Brossard sat alone at a table near the back of the shop. His salt and pepper hair would lead me to believe he was probably in his late fifties, but as an Atlantean, it probably meant he was actually in his seven hundreds or eight hundreds. What a bizarre thought. Gripping the tablet inside my bag, I eagerly made a beeline back toward the table. A familiar, chilly voice snagged my attention before I reached him, though. With a quick glance to my left, I found myself halted in place as though the icy gold eyes staring back at me could actually freeze me in my tracks. Osborne, 
continued talking to the two shifty-looking students sitting opposite him, but his eyes were definitely locked onto me. Finally, after flashing a quick sneer in my direction, he turned back to the conversation at hand. I sucked in a deep breath and finally got my feet to cooperate again. Everly! Professor Brossard looked up and gave a small wave. Hi, Professor. I slid into the seat across from him, still a little breathless and on edge from seeing Osborne. What was he doing here? Was there another fractured soul on campus? Other than me, of course, assuming that I was even fractured. Tate was already all over my case. Well, except when I actually needed him. Jerk. You okay? Professor Brossard's fuzzy brows gathered in the middle like one long caterpillar. Yeah, sorry. I just thought I saw someone. I shook it off. Time to focus. Did you bring the artifact? I did. I fumbled around in my bag and carefully laid the stone tablet in front of him. It looked almost fake in this modern setting. It still hadn't shown any life since I dropped it that night in the gallery, but I knew it was special. Fascinating. The professor leaned in close. May I? He gestured toward the object. Of course. My blood rushed in loud waves through my ears as I waited with bated breath for his interpretation. He picked up the tablet, cradling it in his hands with great care. I watched several different expressions transition across his face, awe and wonder, followed by surprise and then frustration. What is it? I asked, unable to wait any longer. Well... He rubbed his wrinkled forehead. I'm not exactly sure. My lungs deflated. Do you have any guesses? He shook his head. It looks a bit like cuneiform, but I don't recognize any of the symbols. And from the looks of it, it's much older than the cuneiform tablets I used to translate back in the Middle East. Where did you get this? Oh, uh, shoot. Why did I not think of an answer to this earlier? It was passed on to me from an old family friend. More like stolen from an old family enemy. But potato, potato. Well, it must be very special to your family, even if there is no way to know what it says. He laughed and handed the tablet back to me. I forced a friendly giggle, but the situation was not funny to me at all. Surely someone would be able to translate it, right? Professor Brossard frowned. I used to know someone who might have been able to make something out of it, but he's long gone. I'm sorry I can't be of more help to you. No, I refuse to accept that as an answer. What about overseas, back in Egypt? There must be more people who learned alongside you. Perhaps one of your old classmates would know? There aren't many of my old classmates left, I'm afraid, and the ancient languages aren't exactly a hot topic for modern-day studies. People just don't care anymore. I care! Whoops, that was too loud. I noticed several faces from the surrounding tables turn to look in our direction. The professor pulled back with raised brows. Well, Miss Gordon, I'm sorry, but I suggest you rethink your approach. Especially considering your mortal condition, you won't gain any favors with demands. He stood. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a dinner meeting to attend. He shuffled past me in a hurry, leaving me at the table to myself. I shoved the tablet back into my bag and rested my forehead on the cool tabletop. What was I supposed to do now? You have a habit of causing scenes, don't you? Crap. I lifted my gaze to find Osborne now sitting in the professor's chair across from me. Where was Sean? Wasn't he supposed to be saving me from moments like this? I glanced over my shoulder to find him on a bar stool near the front door, nose buried in a textbook while he sipped some frozen drink with a mountain of whipped cream on top. Care to tell me why you're shouting at professors? 
Osborne grinned, like he'd caught me with my hand in the cookie jar. No. Care to tell me why you care? Pretty sure we established you're not supposed to come around another hunter's case. That wiped the smile from his face real fast. I happen to be on another case here on campus, and I can't help but notice how all these fractured souls seem to be popping up in your vicinity. His eyes glowed, and the energy shifted between us. The back of my brain seemed to hum with anticipation. Glamour. So tell me, mortal, what do you know about Rasputin? Ras... who? I wanted to please him. I didn't want to come up short for his request, but I had no idea who he was talking about. Rasputin, he repeated, the mastermind who taught your fractured friend how to poison with dark magic. I know nothing about him, I replied honestly. Osborne cursed loudly, once again drawing attention to my table. I wouldn't be surprised if they never let me into the honeypot again after this. Is something wrong over here? Thankfully, Osborne's filthy mouth drew Sean's attention as well. He stood at the edge of our table, a vein popping from his neck as he glared at the hunter. It's fine, right, Osborne? I lifted my brows. The glamour was gone, snapped by Osborne's angry outburst. But I wanted to drive home the fact that I still was not the person he was looking for, and he knew it. He grunted and waved his hand in a gesture that said, Be gone. He didn't have to tell me twice. Chapter 9 What the heck, Ev? Sean walked backward in front of me, his hands splayed to the sides. I swear, I can't leave you alone for five seconds without something dramatic happening. Why were you talking to Osborne? Not by choice, that's for sure, I spat back. Now was not the time for a condescending lecture from Sean. Maybe if my guardian had been paying better attention, he wouldn't have ever gotten to me. Your guardian was under the assumption that you were meeting with your professor, not a hunter. I did, and it was useless. Professor Brossard can't help, and according to him, nobody can. That's not possible, he muttered. Obviously, but I don't know what else to do. Well, you could start by staying away from Agarthians. Really? You want to keep going with this? I don't go around looking for trouble, okay? Trouble finds me, just like it found my mom. But it's fine. If you don't want to stick around and help protect me, I'm happy to find someone else who does. You need to fix your own problems anyway. My problems? And what would those be? Oh, I don't know. Maybe being in love with a mortal... How was that kiss, Sean, good enough to break Abby's heart? Because she sure thinks you hate her right now. His face grew red, and he turned around to stomp on ahead of me. Then he looked back over his shoulder with a scowl. Abby is none of your business. And you know what? I don't think you need to talk to her anymore, either. I don't need you stirring the pot. Well, someone has to talk to her, since you ditched her. He stopped and threw his hands in the air. You want me gone? Fine. I'm happy to step down from my current assignment, and I wish the best of luck to anyone else who thinks they can possibly keep you under control. He gave a sarcastic salute and stomped off into the darkness. I was left standing just outside my apartment building. I could feel the pressure of a hundred gallons building up behind my eyes, threatening to break down the dam. Choking down a sob, I pulled open the door and made my way up to our unit. Hey, girl, Gayla called out lazily from her spot on the couch. She was binge-watching something on TV, barely noticing what kind of shape I was in. Thank goodness it was Gayla and not Dom. I didn't need some mind reader watching a hot mess playing out in my brain right now. I cut straight from my bedroom and closed the door behind me. Somehow, I managed to hold in all the tears until I crashed onto my bed, burying my face in my pillow to muffle the sound of my cries. And even at 18 years old, as a college student, living in New York City, the only thing I wanted in that moment was my mom. 
Where was she, and how would I ever find her now? I didn't have Sean's help anymore, that was for sure, and I wouldn't request another guardian. I stood out enough as it was, being the only mortal in my keeper classes. Some Atlantean guardian hovering over me at all times would only draw more attention and fan the Agarthian flame. A new guardian would also prevent me from the only other option I had left. If interpreting the tablet was officially off the table, I had no choice but to take matters into my own hands. It was time to experiment with dark magic. I kept my chin down for the next few days. Gala and Dom traded off escorting me to class, and the only time I saw Sean on campus, he quickly looked the other way. The girls begged me to call him so we could make up and all hang out again, but I refused. Anyone who could bail on me so quickly just because I pointed out his own issues wasn't someone I wanted to beg to come back into my life. Sean was stubborn, but he had nothing on me. Thankfully, with my Olympian friends by my side at all times, the mean girls on campus didn't make any more moves on me either. Life was almost simple, or it was on the outside, anyway. Inside, my mind was still a mess. Every waking moment that I wasn't in class or walking to or from campus, I was holed up in my room, poring over various old manuscripts I found at Millie's shop. She didn't have much information about dark magic, unsurprisingly. I'd attempted a couple of the incantations I found, tucked into old pharmaceutical books here and there, but nothing worked. Or maybe I just wasn't pronouncing them correctly. I certainly wasn't about to ask the girls for help with that. By Thursday afternoon, I was about ready to throw in the towel. I'd even considered calling Osborne to see if I could get some info about that Rasputin guy but I enjoyed staying alive too much to attempt that. Blowing the hair out of my face, I pulled out the last book in the pile I'd borrowed from Millie. Calling it a book was being generous. It was more like a dirty old pamphlet. A cornflower blue cover was rolled at the corners and bore brown stains of various sizes. The yellowed pages smelled a bit like cigarette smoke, and the spine was barely held together by two staples. The third staple had fallen out long ago. Small, simple letters spelled Adverse Effects of Dream Waltzing and How to Remedy Them, a personal account by Chrisana Vadim. Dream Waltzing. That didn't sound like it would be particularly useful in finding my mom, but it was an awfully romantic-sounding power. I flipped open the worn cover to scan the table of contents and see if I might find anything useful inside. There was an introduction, standard practices, adverse effects, the victim, the perpetrator, and the treatment. Ooh, now we were getting somewhere good. I read on, chewing off a loose hangnail as I committed every word to memory. It seemed that dream waltzing was a fancy way of describing the act of entering another's mind. Not like a telepath, like Dom, but to actually interact with the other person within their mind typically while they slept, hence the name dream waltzing. In this case, a fractured soul abused the ability and tortured a human victim in her sleep, trying to force her to later murder his enemy during her waking hours. The perpetrator was a man by the name of Renard Soule, a fractured soul. Raised in St. Amand, it is believed he learned the dark arts with the clan in the forests of Felaton, though he refused to reveal the name of his teacher. It is believed that he was born from an Olympian mother and a mortal father. As such, he was naturally capable of powers of the mind. A search of his home after his elimination revealed a book of spells, including the incantation used on the victim, Alma Cancia Descansan Nitardariel. I mouthed the word silently to myself, could this be it? If I could somehow find a way to dream waltz into my mother's mind while she slept, maybe she could tell me where she was. It was definitely worth a shot. The worst-case scenario would be that I might fail again. Well, either that or it would work, and I'd be caught and killed by Tate for practicing dark magic with a fractured soul. No risk, no reward, though, right? 
Two knocks sounded at the door, and it swung open before I could even ask who was there. Slamming the pamphlet closed, I pushed it under a school textbook and turned to see who my uninvited guest was. Gala. And right behind her was Dom. Shoot. I immediately thought back to our lecture earlier that day in my politics of the keeper's class. If she tried to get into my brain, hopefully she'd be just as bored as I had been during that lecture and decide not to stick around long. Get up, Gala said with her hands on her hips. We're busting you out of here. Excuse me? We know you've had a rough first week, sweetie. Dom made her way over to my desk, glancing only briefly at the stack of books before resting her focus back on me. But we want to help you try to bounce back. Yep. Gala slid into place beside her. So get your nose out of the books, girl. It's time to have some fun. We're taking you to your first college party. Chapter 10 A party? On a Thursday? I don't think so. I risked a glance back to the pile of books on my desk. I was kind of in the middle of something way more interesting than a party. Dom followed my gaze to the books and frowned. Get out of my head. She blinked hard, hearing me loud and clear. I thought she might object, but her shoulders loosened and she took a step back. I felt a tad guilty, but honestly, it was a little invasive to have someone reading your thoughts all the time. I knew she was concerned, but it would be safer for her not to know what was going through my mind. I wasn't worried about getting myself into trouble. I wouldn't be able to avoid it if I was fractured anyway, but I definitely didn't want to drag my friends down with me. Yep, a party on a Thursday and any other day of the week. Welcome to college. Mischief glinted in Gala's heavily made-up eyes. She marched over to my closet and began shifting through my clothes. Maybe I'll let you borrow something of mine, she added, obviously unimpressed by my Oklahoman wardrobe. Objecting would be futile. I could tell by the way Gala moved that they weren't going to let me skip out on this. Fine, I conceded. But promise me we won't be out too late. I still have class in the morning. Gala crossed her heart. Scout's honor but her wink at the end did little to convince me she would stay true to her word. An hour later, we stood on Riverside Drive in front of a tall, Parisian-looking building adorned with windows and private latticed balconies. The building seemed alive, laughter trailing out through the windows, which glowed faintly in the twilight hour. I glanced at my friends. Are you sure we're not overdressed? We stood on the sidewalk, fully decked out in cocktail dresses and the highest of heels. Gala looked like a model, her platinum blonde hair falling in perfectly coiffed waves over her bare shoulders. She had more unbelievably toned leg on display than I knew was possible without being completely naked, and she left every girl within a three-mile radius feeling completely inadequate. Dom, of course, looked just as good in a slightly more modest dress, more sassy than sexy, and I stood awkwardly between them in one of Gala's less revealing numbers. St. A's won't let you in if you're not dressed to the nines. Gala dipped her chin toward the entrance. Shall we? I followed them to the door where a freshman in a literal tuxedo stood as a doorman. He nodded at Gala and Dom, but promptly extended his arm in front of me before I could step inside. Gala sighed and rolled her eyes. Let her in. She's one of us. The boy frowned, squinting at me like he was missing something. I don't think so. I was given strict orders. Move. A deep voice rumbled from over the boy's shoulder. I looked up to see Clayton grinning down at me. You came. His voice was lighter now, and despite what was good for me, it sent a warm feeling through my belly. Dom shot me a look of clear warning, but if they dragged me all the way here to get my mind off of school, then I might as well do it with the hottest young star in North America. She came with us, actor boy. 
Gala pushed Clayton out of the way, unimpressed by his fame and good looks. None of it was anything new or special to Gala. She didn't care about Clayton. She was here for the party. With a playful half-grin, I shrugged and followed the girls deeper into the building. This was nothing like the college parties they showed on TV. It looked more like an upscale fundraising gala. But instead of wealthy oil tycoons and their trophy wives, the elegantly designed interior was full of drunken, rich 20-year-olds. Be right back, Gala said with a wink. I don't know if ambrosia is really a good idea tonight. Relax, Mama Dom. I'll only have one. Gala dashed off through the crowd before Dom or anyone else could object. She'll be okay, I said, trying to reassure my friend. We'll keep an eye on her. Dom and I moved cautiously through the crowd of keepers, many of whom had already succumbed to the blissful embrace of ambrosia. It was obvious who had consumed the sweet nectar and who had not. Those under the influence almost appeared to glow with a new kind of life. They were full of joy and free of care, practically floating through the room like the unearthly creatures they really were. Have you been to the hall before? Clayton's voice caught me off guard. I swung around to find him looking like a god, with his hands in the pockets of his snug-fitting charcoal suit pants. His white button-up was undone at the top, revealing just enough of his golden tan chest to leave me wishing I could see more. Phew, was it getting hot in here? Nope, never even heard of the place. I slapped a demure grin on my face and yanked my attention back up to his eyes and away from the muscles under his shirt. St. A's is kind of like Columbia's version of a secret society, but it's less a secret than just an elitist group. Most people think you can only get in if you come from a really wealthy family, but the truth is you can only get in if you've got the right kind of soul. It's a keeper society, then? Clayton nodded. Well, I guess it's good that keepers and extreme wealth kind of go hand in hand then, huh? Clayton laughed, the golden flecks in his hazel eyes glittering in the light of the room. Come on, I'll show you one of the coolest parts of the building. Dom reached out to touch my arm, a gentle reminder to stay close. I'll be fine, I whispered to her. You just keep an eye on Gala. Don't worry about me. She looked nervously back and forth between Gala and me. Seriously? I squeezed her shoulder. There are a hundred people here. He'd have to be an idiot to try anything in front of all these witnesses. No one will mess with me. Dom released a loud sigh. I'll come find you just as soon as she's done. Then, turning toward the bar, she called out to Gala. Let's go. Clayton laced his fingers with mine and pulled me down the hall. I didn't pull away this time. No, I was going to enjoy myself, even if just for one night. After all, it might be the last chance I had. Who knew what would happen after I'd tried the dream waltzing spell? Watchful eyes of countless other keepers followed us down the hall. We reached a wooden door near the back of the building, and Clayton gave my hand a quick squeeze before releasing my fingers. Here we go, he said, with a conspiratorial grin. He had just reached for the knob when a loud voice called out from across the hall. Hey, you're not allowed down there. A familiar thrill worked its way down the back of my neck and between my shoulder blades until my whole body came alive with a slight buzzing sensation. Tate? I looked around as Clayton dealt with a bossy undergrad. Do you know who I am? He asked the younger man. Yuck, that was kind of tacky. But maybe the other guy had made some kind of obvious mistake. Clayton, Miles, I, I'm sorry, but the basement is for St. A's members only. The tingle grew stronger, through my arms and across my chest, pulling me. Where, exactly? Nothing seemed out of place around me. A frantic scan of the room revealed nothing unusual at all. No sign of Tate anywhere. 
Clayton turned toward the young man, crossing his arms over his broad chest. You're going to back away and allow me and my guest to have a look downstairs. Sound good? The guy nodded. Yes, of course. There are suits and towels in the bathrooms. Wait, what? Clayton pulled open the door and gestured for me to move down a narrow staircase. After you. Chapter 11 Did you just glamour him? I like to say I used my powers of persuasion instead. All right. This was the real Clayton, the jerkwad who wasn't afraid to use other people to get what he really wanted. Now I remembered why I had been distrustful of him before. Why on earth did I allow myself to get so taken by his good looks that I forgot how to use common sense? Right, so I think I've changed my mind. I need to go find Dom. My shoulder pushed into his chest as I tried to squeeze my way past him, but he was like an unmovable slab of granite. No, he said firmly. He pulled the door closed behind him, and his eyes clearly glowed with a warm golden hue in the low light of the staircase. I brought my fingers to my ears as quickly as I could, but it was too late. I'd looked into his eyes. I'd heard the music in his tone. I was glamoured. Keep walking. I obeyed without a word of protest. I had to. An internal battle with my own mind was raging strong. I knew I was glamoured. I could feel its power wriggling in the back of my head like a worm. But as long as it remained there, I was helpless to object to a word Clayton said. Even worse, I wanted to please him. We reached the bottom of the stairs. In the center of the basement was an enormous in-ground swimming pool, complete with a hot tub and waterfall edge dripping over a stone grotto. I remembered how much you liked the waterfall at the park. Clayton said with a mischievous smile. So I thought I would show you one we can play in. My heart pounded against my ribs, desperately trying to break free and get away from him. But instead, I bobbed my head, awaiting my next orders. Over there, he gestured toward the far wall. Get a swimsuit from the bathroom and put it on. I want to see you out here again in less than five minutes. The bathroom was pure white, with silver-veined marble lining every surface. A small closet inside held a variety of swimsuits, each one smaller than the last. I squeezed my eyes tight, hoping with everything I had that when I opened them I would be somewhere else, anywhere else. But, alas, upon opening them I was still trapped in the basement of some frat house, staring at a rack full of itty-bitty bikinis. I settled on a little black number and rejoined Clayton back near the pool, leaving Gala's dress and shoes in a neat pile on the vanity. He sat on the edge of the pool, now stripped down to nothing but a pair of swim trunks he must have found in the men's bathroom. Blue and purple lights alternated beneath the surface of the water to create an ethereal glow throughout the room. It was lovely, as much as I hated to admit it. Clayton tapped the spot next to him. Join me. I tiptoed to the water's edge, staring nervously into the depths below. One slip and I'd drown. Surely Clayton wouldn't let me die here, right? With a deep breath of chlorine-scented air, I dropped to the ground beside him, allowing my legs to dangle into the pool. My purple toenails blurred in and out of the water's ripples, temporarily distracting me from the dangerous man controlling my mind. You look good in that bikini, he purred. But those legs... He ran a smooth hand across my thigh. It's a shame they're so bruised. I turned away. They were bruised because of him, and the irony of it all was not lost on me. We'd come full circle, and I was never more grateful for not kissing someone before. Now we sat while he ogled me in a bikini he forced me to wear. I did not appreciate being objectified, and as soon as this glamour wore off, I would let him know about it. Come on. He dropped into the water, his head disappearing for just a moment beneath the surface, before he reemerged, 
treading water like it was nothing for him. He turned and faced me with a grin. The water's warm. Why did my mom never enroll me in swim lessons? I can't swim. My chin dropped to my chest, shame flooding me. I wasn't ashamed that I couldn't swim, though. I was ashamed that I had to let him down. I didn't want to let him down. I only wanted to please him. Stupid glamour. That's okay. Jump in. Now. My fingertips dug into the concrete edge, even as my body betrayed me. I couldn't refuse a direct command while I was glamoured. It didn't matter if it would kill me. Eyes closed, fingers now clamping the sides of my nose. I scooted toward the edge and removed myself from the safety of the solid ground with a splash. The water was warm. At least I would die at a comfortable temperature. I felt myself sink, falling further and further until my feet hit the concrete at the bottom of the pool. I kicked hard, flailing my legs in an effort to reach the air again, but it was no use. I was too deep. I tried again and again, my lungs burning in my chest, crying out for sweet, sweet oxygen. My legs were growing weak, my mind losing focus. I wouldn't last much longer. This was it. This was the end. Two arms wrapped themselves under my arms, and a rush of water enveloped me as strong legs kicked us back to the surface. As soon as my face broke through the top of the pool, I coughed and gasped for air, water burning at the back of my throat and nose as it dripped back into the pool with a mixture of my own snot and tears. You really can't swim, Clayton chuckled to himself. There was no apology, no remorse in those still glowing eyes of his. I wanted nothing more than to break loose from his grip. I might even consider the bottom of the pool a more enjoyable place than being wrapped up in his arms, pressed against his hard, wet chest. No, I told you I can't. That was fun, though, wasn't it? He asked, a grin creeping up one side of his jaw. No? Tell me it was fun. It was fun. Ugh, maybe it was fun for you, you sadistic jerk. That's what I wanted to say, but of course I couldn't. That wouldn't please him. Wanna do it again? No! My throat still burned from before. I was still breathing heavily in an effort to replace the oxygen I'd lost the first time I went under. I couldn't do it again. Tell me you do. I do. Dang it. I didn't. Tell me exactly what you want me to do to you. I fought the urge to speak the words he wanted to hear. Biting down hard on my tongue, I tried to command it to stay still, to prevent myself from saying any more. I wanted to tell him to take me back to the edge of the pool. I wanted to tell him to let me go. That's what I really wanted. But that wouldn't please him. The words caught in my throat, snagging like cotton on a rough wooden fence post. My mouth was clenched as tightly as it would go, and the taste of blood flooded the inside of my lips where my teeth tried to hold them in place. If I dared to open them, I knew what would happen. I'd ask him to throw me under the water again, and I couldn't let that happen. Too slow, he grinned, and with no additional warning, he released me. I leaned forward, frantically grasping for his legs as they propelled him away from me. The heat rose in my chest faster this time, practically lighting my lungs on fire with an electrical sensation. My blood buzzed, begging me to give it the oxygen my body required. As my feet touched lightly to the bottom of the pool, I decided to reserve my energy. My limbs already felt tingly. I wouldn't exhaust them further. I knew I couldn't make it back to the surface anyway. I'd already tried that and failed. I'd just have to sit here and hold my breath until he hopefully decided to rescue me again. It didn't take long this time, and as his arms wrapped around me, I felt a jolt of electricity shoot through my veins. I coughed and coughed at the water's surface, rubbing the sting of chlorine from my eyes. Water wouldn't stop coming out of my mouth, how much had I swallowed? I coughed some more until I gagged, then finally inhaling a deep lungful of air, 
I opened my eyes. Tate! Are you okay? he asked. Concern tugged at his brows, and his face was red hot. I will be, I whispered, my voice raw. He swam over to the edge of the pool and gently set me back on solid ground. The worm in the back of my head was gone. The glamour was broken. I quickly stood and ran to where the towel sat on a chair outside of the bathrooms. Wrapping myself in a fluffy bath sheet, I turned to watch the fireworks show going off in the pool. What were you doing? Tate was swimming like Michael Phelps over to where Clayton waded in the shallow end of the pool. I was doing what you asked me to, man. Back off. You almost killed her. I wasn't going to let her die. Tate finally reached him and reared back a fist. I almost cheered as it moved to connect with Clayton's perfect nose, but his eyes began to glow again as he shouted, Stop it. It didn't stop Tate in his tracks like it would have done to me, but it did slow his momentum enough that his fist connected with Clayton's face with only a soft smack instead of the pounding I'd been hoping for. You took it too far. Tate was furious. The initial impact of Clayton's glamour wore off quickly, but Tate wasn't interested in hitting him again. He swam over to the edge of the pool and lifted out of the water, his collared shirt and suit pants drenched and clinging to his perfectly toned body like a wax mold. My jaw slammed shut, and I pulled my eyes away as soon as I remembered what exactly I was looking at here. Two beautiful dudes who had both attempted to drown me, glamour me, and now spoke like they were in on it together. They were gorgeous, but they were villains. I tiptoed toward the door, trying my best to not draw any attention. I didn't take it far enough, Clayton spat back at Tate. Look at her. Still just a frail little mortal. She has no powers at all. They both turned in my direction. Crap. Take my jacket, Tate yelled at me. You're dripping wet, and it's chilly outside tonight. His suit coat lay on the floor just a few feet from where I stood. I scurried over and nabbed it, throwing it over my shoulders as I dashed toward the stairs. No use sneaking now. They knew I was making a run for it. I didn't wait to hear what they said next. I'd heard enough. Tate wasn't the only bad guy after my soul, apparently. He had help, and lots of it. I didn't know who I could trust anymore. Chapter 12 I burst through the door at the top of the stairs and scanned the crowd, desperate for a friendly face. My eyes finally landed on Dom, and I rushed forward into her open arms. Her face was pale as she held me back at arm's length to examine me, then pulled me close again, patting my back. Oh, Everly, I'm so, so sorry I let you go with him. I want to hear what happened, but first, let's get you out of here and find you some clothes. She released me and turned around. Gala. Then, taking notice of the onlookers beginning to gather around, she put both hands on her hips, swiveling her head back and forth to make sure they were all paying attention to what she said next. There is nothing to see here, people. Turn around and go about your business. This girl clearly does not need you all staring at her right now. Gala stumbled into the circle, brown eyes bright and mouth in the shape of a perfect O. We're leaving. Dom looped one arm through mine and one arm through Gala's and tugged us toward the door. Move it, people. The other college students scattered. No one messed with Mama Dom when she was angry. With one last glance over my shoulder as we ducked out the front door, I saw the tall, toned figure of Tate, my rescuer and hunter, my enigma, dripping wet at the end of the hall, and something stirred within me, I didn't know whether to feel grateful or angry. I probably should have been more afraid, really, but he had a knack for showing up and saving me just before things got really bad. Our eyes met briefly before Dom yanked me outside. I pulled Tate's suit jacket tighter around my shoulders as the cool evening air cut through my wet towel. We turned back toward the apartment, and like a flash in the night, Sean appeared suddenly before us, 
panting as he bent forward to rest his hands on his knees. Sorry, Dom whispered. I called him when I lost you back at the party. I, I came as fast. He stood and looked me in the eye, his face contorted into a mask of regret. I'm sorry, Everly. It's fine, I said, trying to choke down the emotion that was welling up in my throat. It's not fine. It was a stupid fight, and even if I wasn't assigned to you, I still wouldn't want you to get hurt. It was a stupid fight. I'm sorry I started it. I need to work on keeping my mouth shut. If anyone should apologize, it's me. No, really. I needed to hear it, and I need to talk to Abby. It's the truth, and it's no reason for me to stop protecting you. If I had been here tonight doing my job, then... Wait, what did happen here tonight? He seemed to have just noticed me trembling in the wet bikini, towel, suit, jacket combo. Gala nodded emphatically, eyes still a little glassy from the ambrosia. Yeah, spill it, girl. So I did. I told them everything that happened as we walked back to the apartment. Sean was like a raging bull by the time we reached our building, and Dom just kept shaking her head and apologizing. You can't blame yourselves like this. We stopped outside of the entrance to our building. It's not your fault. I'm a big girl. I should have known better. Just know it won't happen again. I will never allow myself to be alone with Clayton Miles or any other Agarthian again. Never say never, Gala mumbled as a shiny black coupe pulled to a stop beside us. Clayton rolled down the passenger's window. Can we talk? Sean rushed the vehicle before I could give an answer, and Clayton rolled the window back up until it was barely cracked open at the top. Sean's fist connected with the passenger's door instead, leaving a sizable dent. Sean, holy cow! That car didn't do anything to you! He shook out his hand. No, but I needed to release that somehow. I feel better now. Then he turned to Clayton. To answer your question, no, you can't talk to her. Wait. Dom stepped forward, her head tilted slightly to the side. She touched the window, staring at Clayton for a long minute. Then with a small nod, she turned to me. It's okay. What? Sean spun toward her. There is no way in... Really, she held up a hand. I think you should talk to him. Just don't get in the car, okay? I took one hesitant step forward, pulled on the jacket again to cover myself and find some warmth, then turned to my friends for reassurance. Sean scowled with his arms crossed, ready to pounce on Clayton at the first sign of foul play. Gayla stared dreamily at the lights glinting off the facets of her bracelet, seemingly unaware of the weight I was feeling. I knew she cared, she just had a funny way of showing it, especially with ambrosia still coursing through her veins. But Dom, thank goodness for Mama Dom. She smiled, sensing my trepidation, and silently mouthed that it would be okay. I moved forward to the vehicle as the window rolled down again. Over my shoulder I heard Dom telling the others to give us a little space. Hey. Clayton said, a sad smile playing across his handsome face. I twisted my lips to the side, biting down on the sharp retort I wanted to send his way. He tried to kill me an hour ago, and I hadn't forgotten. Sorry about earlier. I'm not even sure I can give you a good excuse or explanation, but I'm sorry. Really? You tried to kill me, and you have no explanation for it? You just expect me to accept your apology? I do have an explanation. He ran a hand through his hair. It had fully dried in all kinds of odd angles, and he looked more down to earth with the messy locks of a normal dude rather than the finely styled hair of a star. I just can't share it with you. Because Tate told you not to? He gawked at me. Yeah, I heard you guys. Did he really ask you to try and kill me? I swallowed the lump in my throat, unsure if I really wanted to know the answer. It was no secret that Tate was after my soul, but to think that he would ask his friends to help bring me down just, well, it kind of hurt my feelings, which was ridiculous, I know. 
Not exactly. It's complicated. But no, I wasn't trying to kill you. And neither is he. We just... Never mind. Nope. You can't just never mind the end of that thought. If you are genuinely asking for my forgiveness, you're going to have to explain. I can't. But you know that sometimes a big emotional event can trigger your powers to kick into play, right? I do now. He smiled. Well, I'll leave it at that. But I wanted to make sure you know that I'm done. I have nothing to do with whatever happens in the future. And I'm sorry for toying with you over the last week. But you did look good in that bikini. He winked. So, truce? I shook my head. I don't think so. Not yet. But I appreciate your apology. Well, I'm headed back to L.A. this weekend. The movie was cancelled. If we run into each other again, I hope we can be on good terms, or at least start fresh. But if not, well, I appreciate you letting me get that off my chest anyway. Take care of yourself, Everly. Thanks. You do the same. He offered another genuine smile then rolled the window back up and drove away. Once his red tail lights had rounded the corner ahead, I turned around to find myself alone on the sidewalk. Dom really knew nothing was going to happen to me. She must have coaxed Sean and Gala back inside. I took a moment to breathe in the cool night air as Clayton's words swirled through my mind. Tate couldn't take my soul until he had proof that it was fractured— and he wouldn't get that proof until my powers appeared. And what if I beat him to the punch? What if I could somehow induce my own emotional event that could bring them forth? I thought through different scenarios as I made my way back up to the apartment. My friends were all gathered in the living room, anxiously awaiting my return. They'd probably been staring out the window at me if I knew Sean. Everything okay? Dom asked though she already knew exactly what Clayton's intentions were. It will be, I sighed. I'm going to go get showered up and hit the hay. It's been a long week. I disappeared into my room, draping Tate's jacket over my desk chair. My mom getting kidnapped was pretty traumatic, and that didn't trigger my powers. Tate caused an explosion in the gallery and almost drowned me on Gala's boat, Then Clayton almost ran me over and drowned me again for good measure. Nothing had caused my powers to appear. Was there really anything I could do that would? I picked up my vitamin bottle, shaking the very last pill into my palm. I looked at it, thinking of my mom. Don't worry, I'll get my powers somehow and find you if it's the last thing I ever do. I swallowed the vitamin and turned toward my bathroom, stopping for just a moment to eye the books still stacked on my desk. If I couldn't trigger my own powers or practice dark magic on my own, I wondered if there was someone else who could lend a hand in that department. Osborne said there was another fractured soul on campus. What if I found them first? What if they could somehow lead me to this Rasputin guy and he could help me dream waltz to my mom? Or better yet, What if he could help me trigger my own powers? Meanwhile, Russell glanced at the clock hanging on his dingy white wall. The office space he rented in West Harlem left much to be desired, but it was only temporary. He'd had to find a new meeting location after his quick exit from the gallery, and his warehouse in Hunts Point wasn't suitable for polite conversation. Then again, This meeting he was currently awaiting may not end in polite conversation either. Russell suspected he knew what the professor would say. He'd suspected Everly took the tablet ever since he first discovered it missing the night after the explosion. But if the professor dared to suggest any truth to the rumors surrounding the relic, things could get ugly. Russell would have no choice but to take action against him. A knock on the door sounded the man's arrival. You may enter, Russell called out. Professor Brossard walked into the office and gave a timid bow. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. May I speak candidly here? He scanned the corners of the room, likely searching for cameras or other recording devices. The professor was naive, 
But he wasn't a fool. Rossell appreciated that about him. You may. Rossell gestured toward the empty seat across the desk from him. This is not the most luxurious building in New York, but it is quite secure. We will not be overheard. Very good, sir. You see, I've come to you about something rather important. It's the prophecy of deliverance. He lowered his voice when he mentioned the tablet, despite Russell's earlier reassurances. A student approached me recently. She appeared to have a piece of the original relic, and she was inquiring about its text. Have you noticed it missing from your collection? Of course I have. Oh. The professor's face went slack. He hadn't been expecting that. Should I, uh, should I have retrieved it for you? No, it's quite all right, Professor. You know the tablet has no true meaning. The prophecy isn't real, so this student... I'm sorry, I didn't catch a name. Everly Gordon, sir. A frown tugged at Russell's mouth. Right. This Everly will find it useless. You know I only keep it tucked away to keep the rumors at bay. We don't want another incident with one becoming obsessed over it again, now do we? No, sir. The professor's Adam apple bobbed with a large swallow. What did you tell her? About the prophecy? Not a thing. Professor Brossard shook his head rapidly. Well, of course you told her nothing about the prophecy. As we discussed, it's all just folklore. But what did you tell her about the tablet? I told her it was unreadable. I couldn't make out the symbols, and I told her no one else would be able to either. Did you mention Driscoll? No, of course not. Good. Russell drummed his fingers on the desk. Was there anything else? No, sir. The professor paused. Well, actually... I touched the relic. As I was inspecting it, you don't think... His face crinkled, a sheen of sweat reflecting the fluorescent lighting overhead. That you have been cursed? Russell raised a brow. It's folklore, Brossard. What happened with Driscoll is purely coincidental. He allowed his obsession with the object to get the best of him. Nothing more. Right. Thank you. The professor stood, hesitating, as though there was more he wanted to say. Well, I guess I'll be on my way then. Goodbye, professor. As soon as the man disappeared through the doorway, Russell extracted a notepad and pen from his desk drawer. He hastily scribbled a message and folded the paper, tucking it into an enchanted envelope that could only be opened by the intended recipient. On the outside he wrote one word. Barius. Two long strides had him at the window, which he struggled with momentarily before the glass finally lifted. He snapped his fingers, but he didn't have time to wait for the messenger. Instead, he clipped the note to a fastener placed just outside the sill and slammed the window closed. He'd just gotten resituated at his desk again when another knock sounded at the door. Gayla's voice called out. "'Russell, it's me. Sorry I'm late.' He wasn't sorry she was late. He'd been counting on it. Enter. He pinned the girl with a disapproving glare as she dropped her designer bag on the floor beside her chair and plopped down with an annoyed huff of air. Punctuality is a virtue. She rolled her eyes. I actually was on time today for once, but I ran into Professor Brossard at the elevator. Was he here to see you? Russell's lip pulled up in disgust. Why would I need to speak with a linguistics professor? She shrugged. I don't know. I was just surprised to see him here. Anyway, let's get this thing rolling. I have a date tonight, and I don't want to be late. A scuffling sound came from the window. Rosso glanced through the corner of his eye in time to see a large brown owl retrieve the note and take off into flight. Satisfied that he'd done all he could for the time being, he turned his attention back to the disrespectful seer before him. Have you managed any other visions since our last meeting? 
Gayla paused. No. She was lying, and she wasn't particularly good at it. But what was she afraid of revealing to him? He'd wager it was about Everly. Are you quite sure? Another pause. Yes. He'd have to speak with Berius about putting a stop to her fledgling visions for the time being, at least until they were able to remove Everly from the equation. That girl was dangerous, and they couldn't risk Gala seeing something incriminating. Very well, then. Let's begin with today's practice. Part 2. The Unraveling Chapter 13 My mother taught me a trick to falling asleep when I was younger. She said to lay perfectly still and concentrate only on my toes. I would stop my wiggles and concentrate on holding them perfectly still. When the muscles had fully relaxed, I would move up my feet to my ankles, calves, knees, thighs, and so on, until every inch of my body had fully succumbed to peaceful rest. I made it to my elbows once. Otherwise, I would always doze off long before reaching my mind. Not tonight, though. Tonight I'd gone from toes to head twenty times over. I counted sheep, whispered lullabies, and flipped my pillow over to the cold side countless times. My belly was a bundle of nerves, and there was just no use trying to sleep. I checked my phone again. It was 2.22 a.m. With only eight minutes until my alarm would go off, I decided to quit pretending to rest and just to get up. My socked feet hit the floor without a sound, and I tiptoed to my dresser, where a bundle of rosemary, water hyssop, and Pennyworth awaited me. I slipped a robe over my shoulders, dropped my phone into my pocket, and eased open my door. Gayla's room was on the opposite side of our apartment. I'd waited until I knew she would be tucked into bed, fast asleep, before sneaking out of my room. I'd grown worried earlier in the evening. Gayla had a date with some Agarthian sophomore, and she didn't get in until well after midnight. But that was nearly two hours ago. I knew she would be sleeping by now. It was time to act. I'd pored over the words in the dream-waltzing pamphlet earlier that evening, though I already knew them by heart, and despite my best efforts, I hadn't located many other works on the topic, aside from a senior thesis written about 25 years ago. Evidently, the technique wasn't commonly practiced anymore. The modern telephone had eliminated the need to communicate through dreams in a sleeping state. Now it was only used for nefarious purposes— and therefore no longer encouraged or taught in the keeper curriculum. But my reason for attempting it was good. My mother was still locked away in some unknown keeper prison, being held captive by some anonymous villain for who knows what. I couldn't just call her up, so I tried to reach her by going directly to the source instead. I would visit her in her dreams. The only problem was that I still didn't have any powers of my own, I relied instead on the hopes that something magical stirred deep down inside, even if it was just a fracture of a powerful soul. When combined with the herbs and the spell I'd memorized from my pamphlet, I hoped it would be enough to accomplish a successful dream waltz. And call it what they may, dream waltzing with my mother was in no way dark magic, even if it was technically classified as such. Practicing on Gala without her expressed permission, on the other hand? I would worry about that another day. Surely Gala would understand. Between my two roommates, she was definitely my best option. Mama Dom would certainly disapprove, and I suspected her mind would be harder to crack. Plus, if she caught me, there would be no hiding my thoughts from my telepathic friend. Nope, it had to be Gala. I twisted the knob to her bedroom door and silently padded across her lush, fuzzy area rug toward her bed. She lay there, deep in what appeared to be a peaceful slumber. That was good. The deeper into sleep she was, the better my odds were of successfully entering her mind. I'd already planned how it would go. I would make it appear to her like a dream. I had the conversation already memorized. Nothing special, just your standard... Oh my goodness, we're going to be late for our finals kind of dream. Every student had them. 
with the bundle of dried herbs in hand, I raised my arms over my friend and rubbed the leaves back and forth between my palms, grinding them together. Small flakes of the dried plants fell upon her sleeping form, gently dusting her over like a witchy confetti. I silently mouthed the spell from the pamphlet, Amacansia, Descansen, Nitadariel, and I imagined myself entering her mind, searching through the darkness for some semblance of life. Nothing happened. I repeated the spell, a little louder this time, but still not more than a whisper, and I rested the herbs on her chest. With my eyes closed, I focused on the earthy green scent that had filled her room, matching my breathing to hers, and tried once again to find Gala's thoughts swirling around somewhere within my own mind. Silence. Either Gala's brain was completely empty, or I was doing this wrong. But my pronunciation was accurate. I'd done the research. My herbs were of high quality, taken directly from Millie's storeroom at the apothecary, and Gala was definitely deep in sleep, as evidenced by her soft snores. I frowned and decided to try one more time. This time I leaned in close, rested my hands softly upon her shoulders, and spoke the words of the spell aloud, my voice a soft hum. Almacansia, descan, beep, beep, beep. My hand flew to the pocket of my robe to silence the alarm that obnoxiously rang out through the room. Shoot, I thought I'd turned that off. Gala snapped up into a sitting position, eyes as wide as saucers. I froze, then slowly backed up toward her dresser and squatted down, hoping to blend in with her furniture like a chameleon. Everly? Her brows twisted, then glancing down at the pile of broken, crunchy leaves on her pajamas, her nose crinkled. What is going on? You're dreaming, I nodded and gestured around the room. And it's a pretty bizarre dream. You should go back to sleep. I'm sure everything will be back to normal when you wake up. She just stared at me for the longest time. I moved into a thinking position, resting my chin on my fist, as though pretending to be a statue might help me convince her that this was all a dream. Gala burst into a fit of giggles. I see what you're doing here. She brushed the debris off of her shirt and onto the floor. You're paying me back for the Dylan thing, aren't you? Look, he was begging me to give him your number. He said you were the prettiest mortal he ever laid eyes on. How was I supposed to say no to that? She shrugged innocently. Dylan, I nodded. Yup, this is payback. I had no idea what she was talking about. Maybe you'll think twice before doing something like that again. I stood and wagged my finger at her, then moved to the door, my heart still racing from the adrenaline coursing through my veins. Gala laughed. Touché! Then she shook her head and flicked a dried rosemary leaf off of her sheet. But this was a strange prank. Every time I think I've got you figured out, you do something to keep me guessing again. She pulled the covers back up to her chin and rested on her pillow. Good night, weirdo. Night, Gala. I closed her bedroom door behind me and leaned against the wall. Clearly, this dark magic business wasn't going to work for me until I manifested some semblance of keeper powers on my own. My options were dwindling. I'd have to find some other fractured soul to help me, or possibly meet with this Rasputin guy myself. If anyone could help me discover my powers outside of the Keeper's laws, it would be the man responsible for training all the other fractured souls in dark magic for the last hundred years. It was time to locate Rasputin. Chapter 14 Sean met me outside of my apartment the next morning. I focused entirely on my schoolwork during the week, well, that and reading up on dark magic, but I agreed to continue helping my Aunt Millie at her apothecary on the weekends, and thankfully, my relationship with Sean had gotten back to normal since the whole Clayton catastrophe. It made the long walk to her shop much easier. I'd accepted that I probably needed some kind of guardian to watch my back, 
and he'd accepted that I may be a little harder than average to keep track of. But I helped him with his girl problems, and he helped me with my Agarthian problems, so we were both fine with it. It was a symbiotic relationship. You coming inside? I asked as we reached the door. The last time we'd walked over to the apothecary together, Sean sprinted off into the sunset the moment he saw Abby. He took a deep breath. Yeah, he said through the air rushing out of his mouth. I called Abby the other night, and I think we're good. I'm good. You're good. She's good. I'm good. Sound like it's all good, then. Let's go. I patted my friend on the back and pulled open the glass door, gesturing for him to go first. How chivalrous of you, he teased. I try. Abby and my Aunt Millie both looked up from a catalog they'd been browsing together on the counter. Hey, guys, Millie called out. Abby's cheeks flushed at the sight of Sean. He ducked his chin and gave her a stiff smile, which resulted in her withering in place. I nudged a covert elbow into his side, and he perked back up, joining them at the counter. I can't stay long, Sean said. I'm meeting a friend for some basketball here in a bit, but I wanted to come and tell you ladies good morning. He held Abby's gaze for a few lingering moments, and her smile returned. Good morning to you, too, Abby said. Sean tapped the countertop and then turned back to me. You still want me to swing back by around four? I glanced to my aunt for confirmation. Yep, four should be great. Go slam some goals or whatever. Sean laughed and headed for the exit. Abby's eyes remained glued to his back until he disappeared past the front window. You look like you need a cold drink, Millie said to her. Or a cold shower. I wiggled my brows at her, but Abby just sighed. I'll get him one of these days. Just you wait and see. Millie and I exchanged a brief glance but said nothing. Poor Abby. If only she knew the truth. The door chimed and a tall man with russet-colored, casually must hair and faded, slim-fitting jeans swaggered into the shop. His face was scruffy with the five o'clock shadow that framed his strong jawline. He owned that rugged cowboy kind of look, and if he didn't appear to be twice my age, I might have even been into it. He reminded me of those laid-back ranchers from back home who loved to crack dry jokes with a straight face and slip in compliments when you least expected it. Only this rancher was kind of hot. He pinned my Aunt Millie with deep blue eyes that whispered of mischief, and his mouth pulled into a crooked half-grin as he slid onto a bar stool in front of the old soda fountain. That's Wyatt, Abby told me quietly. He comes in here at least once a week. Are he and Millie friends? I asked, taking in their easy banter with one another as Abby and I whispered back and forth. He wishes, Abby said with a snort. He's like a loyal little puppy, totally adorable, but he has no idea when to back off and leave your poor aunt alone. I turned back toward the pair, admiring their casual, playful conversation. Millie didn't look like she particularly minded the attention the cowboy gave her. In fact, she seemed to be enjoying herself almost as much as he was. Abby disappeared through the curtain into the back room, drawing Millie's attention back to where I now stood alone. Oh, Wyatt, I want to introduce you to my niece. This is Everly. Nice to meet you, I said, extending a hand. We shook, and Wyatt nodded. That's quite the handshake you got there, girl. A firm handshake is a trademark of a strong woman. It must run in the family. He winked. All right, Millie said with a smirk. Knock it off. What can I get you today, Wyatt? Besides a date? He kept a completely straight face, but his twinkling eyes gave him away. I don't know. You got any specials? Not for you, Millie teased back. I busied myself with organizing bags and rolls of receipt paper under the counter while they flirted back and forth. It was nice to see Millie with a man. She'd never been involved in a serious relationship that I was aware of. Was Wyatt her soulmate? He was certainly good-looking enough to be a keeper. Perhaps that was a reason he kept coming back into the shop. But if that were the case, 
Wouldn't she know it? If I had a soulmate, I'd probably just run away with him, leave this messy world behind and live for a thousand years in blissful amour. Everly hasn't gotten her powers yet, but yes, she's Atlantean too. Millie's tone had changed, her words clipped now. I hadn't been paying close enough attention to know how the conversation swung back around to me, and I was kicking myself for it. What did Wyatt care about me? I'm sure they'll kick in soon, and then we'll celebrate. The first glass of ambrosia is on me. Speaking of, you got any of them ambrosia berries around here? He offered a smooth transition away from what was obviously a touchy subject, and I was grateful for it. You know that I don't. The sound of a smile had returned to Millie's voice. Nah, you're right. I know you like to play by the rules. Wyatt sounded a little dejected. But that won't stop me from coming back next week. I know that it won't. See you later, Mills. Bye, Wyatt. I waited until the front door chimed to stand back up again. Phew, I said, reaching for my head. I think I stood up too fast. The room spun for a second, and then a dull throb started at the base of my skull. Go on into the back and have a seat. I'm about to start counting inventory anyway, so I'll join you. Abby stepped back through the curtain. I'll take over out here, she said with a smile. It was no secret that Abby hated counting inventory. Millie pushed open the curtain for me, and we stepped into the back room of her shop. I slid into a spot at the table, resting my forehead on my hand, and Millie lit some kind of herbal incense on a shelf in the corner. Is Wyatt a keeper, too? He is, she said, busying herself with a new shipment packaged up on the floor. Atlantean. Are you guys, uh, close? She looked up with a raised brow. We are friends, yes. Just friends? He's not my soulmate, if that's what you're asking. Oh, it was, but I felt it would be rude to pry. Millie's shoulders stiffened as she returned to her work, so I didn't think she was too interested in carrying the conversation any further. It surprised me when she spoke again. My soulmate died a hundred and fifty years ago. I was a young woman, and thinking we had eternity together, I didn't cherish the time as I should have. We'd only known each other a few short years. He was taken from this earth too early. Her hands stopped moving, and her chest rose and fell with a deep breath as she stared off into memories I couldn't see. How? I stopped myself, realizing the question was probably insensitive. But Millie answered anyway. He was murdered. What? I thought you were immortal. Not exactly. We live for about a thousand years. We heal quickly and are difficult to kill. But it's not impossible with the right amount of power and malice in one's soul. But who would do such a thing? Millie sighed. There are certain factions of keepers who have different goals than the rest of us. They don't believe in protecting humans and keeping the earth safe. They're more interested in taking control of it themselves, even if that means eliminating other keepers who stand in their way. I'm sorry, Millie. Me, too. But I can't lose hope. His soul may still return to this earth. We may be reunited yet. We sat quietly for a few minutes. She sorted through the package, and I rested my head until the throbbing in my skull dulled to a slight nuisance rather than a major distraction. Then I remembered something Wyatt said, and it got my wheels turning. Are ambrosia berries a real thing? I thought it was just a liquid. Millie laughed. Yes. How do you think the drink is made? I suppose that made sense. I'd read stories from the ancient Greek myths that suggested Olympians ate the ambrosia rather than just drinking it, and I learned more and more how true many of those stories had been. Where does it grow? Only in Olympus, and it's illegal to possess the berries on Earth. They really don't even like us bringing the beverage down here, 
but they turn a blind eye in most cases. You know, it's very dangerous if it falls into the hands of mortals, and you, she looked pointedly in my direction, you definitely need to stay away from the stuff. So Wyatt was joking then when he asked about them? Yes, she smiled. He loves to tease me about being a rule-breaker because he knows how absurd the idea is to me. He's always playfully asking for black market herbs and berries. Hmm, there was a black market for these kinds of things? I'd have to file that little tidbit away for later. Why does he want you to break the rules? Because then I'll go on a date with him. I swore to my soulmate that I would never betray him for another man. But Wyatt lost his soulmate as well, long before I did. She's never returned to this earth as far as he knows, and he says it would be better to bide our time together rather than pine for lost lovers alone. But I can't. I can't lose hope that he'll one day return. I sighed. It turned out Millie was quite the romantic, but her story was so tragic it broke my heart to hear the truth. I'm sure he will, Millie. I'm sure he will. Chapter 15 Our apartment was quiet when I returned after work. I thanked Sean for walking me home and quickly retreated into my room, closing the door behind me so I wouldn't be disturbed. The stack of books about keeper history I'd accumulated loomed over my desk. One of these days, I would sit down and read each one cover to cover, but for now, I would just continue to skim only the areas that interested me. Today, that meant looking for any mention of ambrosia berries. It's not that I wanted to taste the illicit berries for myself, even if I was a little curious about them. I was more interested in how one might obtain such a thing. If there was truly a black market for keepers, then I suspected there would be a good chance I might find a link to Rasputin through it. After all, how else would a discriminating fractured soul find the ingredients necessary to practice dark magic? None of the information in my books was particularly relevant to today's modern society, though. There was an old Greek story about Tantalus, a man who decided to steal ambrosia berries from some unsuspecting Olympians and deliver them back to mortals on Earth. Things didn't end well for him. So it was no wonder the berries and other black market items would be carefully guarded these days. No one in his right mind would want to pay the consequences Tantalus had to pay. I was still flipping through the musty pages of old books when a savory smell wafted by, pulling my attention back to the present. I perked up, glancing out the window at the empty sidewalk below, before determining it must have been coming from our own kitchen. I'd been cooped up in my room for a couple of hours, so it was about time for me to take a break anyway. I eased open my bedroom door to find Dom humming in the kitchen, rinsing brown rice under the faucet. Gayla sat curled up on the corner of the couch watching some reality TV show. She's alive, she said with a chuckle. I think I was brought back to life by this divine scent that crept under my door. What are you making out here, Dom? It smells amazing. Ah, uh, just a simple sheet pan dinner. I've got some chopped broccoli, sweet potato, peppers, and chicken, drizzled with olive oil and seasonings, roasting in the oven. My mouth was watering. I had no idea you could cook. Mama Dom is good at everything, Gayla said. I'll get this rice going, and we can eat shortly. Dom turned back to her work, and I sidled in next to Gayla on the couch. Dom really was good at everything, it seemed. She was a star student, a caretaker, and above all else, a rule follower, like Millie. Gayla, on the other hand, liked to play in the gray areas. Hey, Gayla, I whispered so Dom couldn't hear. You know what would go great with dinner tonight? A glass of ambrosia. She flashed a grin. You little rebel. You know you can't have any of that. I know, I sighed. But out of curiosity, where do you get it? It's only made in Olympus. There's just one approved manufacturer of it, since it's so potent and dangerous in the wrong hands. 
they have it tightly monitored. Unfortunately, that means they can also charge whatever they want for it, and it's not cheap. She wrinkled her nose. If it was expensive for Gala, then it was definitely out of my league. If it's so expensive, how are all these college kids getting a hold of it? There was a ton of it at that St. A's party. Rich parents? She shrugged. She wasn't biting. I would have to be a little more direct to get the information I was really after. But theoretically, they could make their own, right? If they got their hands on some of the berries? She narrowed her eyes, and for a moment I thought I'd crossed a line. But thankfully, she relaxed again and continued talking. Theoretically, yeah. I guess you're right. But it's hard to come across those berries on Earth. Smuggling them out of Olympus is no easy task. Where would they be, though? I mean, surely there's not just some ambrosia store sitting on a corner in Manhattan. No, you'd probably have to go through the black market. And how would one access that black market? She raised her brows. You're asking lots of questions. If I didn't know any better, I might think you were trying to break some laws. I don't know of any mortal laws against ambrosia, and I am just a mortal after all, I said, with what I hoped looked like an innocent grin. Her eyes twinkled. That's true. You're crafty. I like it. So do you know how someone might hypothetically get some of those berries? If I did, would I be able to get a couple as payment? Sure, yeah, if that someone could actually find some. Her lip twitched as she considered it. Well, if I knew, I wouldn't legally be able to tell you. But think about it. You said you saw lots of ambrosia at the St. A's party. That might lead you to believe they had access to that sort of thing. You know, if there were any dealers on campus, you might find them at St. A's. But obviously I didn't tell you that. Right, of course. She grinned and turned back to the TV. It wasn't long before Dom called us over to eat, and the food was as good as it smelled. We kept our conversation light, discussing school and Gala's lame date with the Agarthian boy. I mean, I know they can't all be charming, but this guy seriously had zero personality. It was like talking to a wall. Gayla scraped up her remaining rice into a neat little pile that she scooped into her mouth. So I take it he wasn't a siren then? Unfortunately, I'd had a few too many close interactions with the Agarthian sirens who could make you fall in love with them, or do anything else they commanded, just with a gleam in their eyes and a strange harmony in their words. This is how the hunters were so successful, like Tate and Osborne, but the mean girl, Camille, and the hot actor, Clayton, also had the ability to glamour. Ha! I wish he was! What was his power, then? I knew of the other Agarthian mean girls, one with the power to shift into a cat, and one with some kind of weird wind power or something. But other than some of the Greek myths, which I couldn't be certain were even true, I wasn't entirely sure what other powers existed among the different keeper races. Just a basic shifter, and not even a cool one. I think he said he's like a parakeet or something. You went out with Adam Pulaski, right? I think he shifts into a peregrine falcon, Dom said. Big difference, Gala shrugged. A bird's a bird. You're a mess. Dom laughed and stood to gather our dishes. I followed her into the kitchen to help her clean up. Hey, she said quietly once we were alone. Whatever you're considering, don't. Huh? I set down the dish brush. You and Gayla were talking about something while I was cooking. Whatever it was, it's a bad idea. Were you eavesdropping on us? No, but I can't help it when your thoughts are screaming from across a room, and I'm glad I couldn't hear exactly what you were saying, because a little bit I picked up in your mind when you joined us at the table was enough for me to know that it's bad news. Well, maybe that's a sign that you shouldn't get involved then. Believe me, I won't. 
and I hope you won't get involved with whatever scheme you're cooking up either. Chapter 16 I've always been a bad listener, and despite Dom's best attempts to keep me safe, I lived up to my reputation as I snuck out of our apartment a few days later. Gayla would sleep in, as she usually did, and Dom had an early class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so it was my first real chance to get out of there unnoticed. But even if I wasn't the world's greatest rule follower, I was no thief. That's why when I stepped out into the hall, I immediately turned back to retrieve the bikini I'd unintentionally taken from the St. A's house the night I ran from Clayton. One day I might return Tate's jacket, too. Or maybe not. It still smelled like him, and as much as I hated to admit it even to myself, I liked having it around. Besides, he knew I had it. But not the bikini. Those teeny pieces of fabric had to go home. Thankfully, Gala slept like the dead, so I was back out in the hall in no time, dashing toward the stairs just in case someone I knew might be in the elevators. By the time I made it out onto the road, I was feeling really good. My plan was coming together beautifully. I'd go to the St. A's house and see about getting some ambrosia berries. I wouldn't keep them for myself, of course. I didn't need them. But I wanted to establish a good relationship with whatever kind of black market dealer may reside there. Then, once we were on good enough terms, I'd ask him about Rasputin. It should be easy enough. I'd seen enough crime dramas on TV to know that drug dealers were usually pretty friendly, as long as you kept them paid and didn't snitch. And I'd been saving up cash from helping out at Millie's shop, so paying him wouldn't be an issue. Plus, I didn't expect rich keepers to be quite as scary as the drug dealers on TV. It would be fine. Just fine. But as I neared the house, memories of the party with Clayton came tumbling back into my mind. I remembered how he'd glamoured the other students out of the way so he could get me alone in the basement. The pool was entrancing with its blue and purple glow until I went under. I truly thought I would die that day, and maybe I would have if Tate hadn't arrived when he did. It was pretty ironic, actually. Tate, the guy who asked Clayton to nearly kill me so that he could extract my soul and finish a job himself, he was the one who'd rescued me. Maybe he wasn't such a great hunter after all. Not that I was complaining. I turned the corner onto Riverside and stopped dead in my tracks. My luck couldn't have been any worse. Standing on the sidewalk, looking directly at me, was Sean. He casually dribbled a basketball, chatting with a friend. Maybe, just maybe, I could still get out of there before he registered that I was walking alone without a keeper guardian. I spun on my heel and took off in the opposite direction. Everly! Darn my bad luck. What are you doing out here? I stopped, filling my lungs with air, before I turned to face him with a sweet smile. Oh, hey, Sean. Didn't see you there. He narrowed his brows at me. I was so totally busted. Okay, I did. But I got nervous that you would be upset I was out here without you. So you were just gonna run away? Yeah, basically. I turned to his friend. You look really familiar. Have we met? This is Devon, Sean said. I think you guys met briefly at the keep. Oh, yeah, in the Hamptons. Well, it's good to see you again. Guess I'll catch you guys later. I tried to spin off and head back to the apartment again, but I didn't even make it one step. Uh-uh. Sean reached out and grabbed my arm. Not so fast. You forgot to answer my question. What are you doing out here, Ev? His friend, Devon, looked away, trying his best to hide a grin. What exactly had Sean told him about me? The thought of getting chewed out by my babysitter in the middle of New York was not only embarrassing, it was infuriating. I yanked my arm loose. I was running an errand. Alone? Yes, it's kind of a personal matter. Personal or not, you shouldn't be running around out here alone. You know that can be dangerous. Trust me, no one remembers better than me. I pulled the stringy little black swimsuit from my purse and dangled it in front of the boys by one tiny strap. Sean's eyes widened. 
Is that a swimsuit? Devon asked. Yep. Want to tell him how I got it, Sean? Go ahead. It was childish for me to bring up the night Sean let his guard down, and I almost died as a result. But I was mad, and I needed to get myself out of this without Sean discovering the true nature of my visit to the St. A's house. Sean shook his head. I could have returned that for you if you'd asked. You didn't have to come back here alone. It's embarrassing enough as it is. I hate reliving that night, and I would especially hate for anyone else to have to remember me shivering on the city streets wearing nothing but an itty-bitty wet bikini and a hunter's suit jacket. Devon's brows raised. I don't want to know. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to return this like I had planned before you interrupted me. I huffed and tried to move past the boys, but Sean stepped into my path. I'll go with you. Devon nodded. Yep, I don't know what happened, but I'm getting the feeling you might need a little extra backup. I'm fine. Those words had been ringing on repeat through my brain all morning. It had become like a mantra, but even after saying it a million times, I wasn't so sure I believed it. The boys didn't care if I thought I was fine anyway. They moved to the sides of me like sentinels as I stepped up to the door and gave a quick knock. No one answered. It was nine in the morning. Surely someone in that house was awake, right? I knocked again, and finally a messy-haired guy in gray joggers answered the door. He was barefoot and shirtless, and it took me a minute to find my words. I, uh... I held out the swimsuit, still dangling by a string. I think this is yours. He yawned and took the bathing suit without saying another word. He looked bored and surprisingly unsurprised to be receiving a bikini delivery first thing in the morning. I suspected he'd seen much stranger things in that house. I tried to get a glimpse of the room behind him, though I don't know what I expected to see. A group of guys huddled around a coffee table, separating illicit berries with a razor blade? That was silly. There were just a bunch of sleepy college kids. All right, well, bye. The door slammed in my face. I turned to Sean with my hands on my hips. See? Fine. The boys escorted me back to our apartment, but I had no interest in entertaining them. Gayla was awake when we got there, and she poured them each a cup of coffee while I sulked in my room. Dom came home shortly after that, and I overheard her whispering with Sean after Gayla hopped in the shower. And by overheard, I mean I had my ear pressed against the door, straining to make out any syllable I possibly could. It was obvious that they were talking about me. Yep, Sean said. She was there all right, but I don't think anything suspicious was going on. She was just returning that swimsuit. Hmm, Dom said. I could have sworn there was more to it than that. What did you hear her say, exactly? Nothing, but I got some seriously dark vibes from her the other night. I know she's up to something. Well, it's not at the St. A's house. All right, Dom sighed. Thanks for following up on it anyway. Anytime. Let me know if you hear anything else. I'm happy to check it out. Will do. And thank you too, Devon. It takes a village. No prob, Dom. The front door opened and closed, and a few minutes later, I heard Dom retreat to her room. Speaking of snitches, the drug dealers would hate Dom. I couldn't believe she tattled to Sean about some suspicion that I might be up to something bad. I mean, yeah, she was right, but that was beside the point. And then to say, it takes a village, like I was some toddler they all had to scramble around after? I was livid, and I wasn't going to give up so easily. I was going back to the St. A's house the first chance I had, and I would do it again and again until I found out where this Rasputin guy hung out. Childish or not, I would do whatever it took to get to the bottom of this mess. If none of my so-called friends were willing to help me find my mom, I would have to find someone who would, even if that meant mingling with black market drug dealers or fractured souls. I was going to find my mom or die trying. Chapter 17 
The next afternoon, I found myself back on the streets, headed toward Riverside Drive. The girls thought I was studying with Sean, and Sean thought I was spending the afternoon at home. It wasn't exactly an airtight alibi, but it was enough to allot me some freedom for a couple of hours. I knew morning visits wouldn't pay off with this crowd, so I had to go later in the day, and just to make sure I didn't run into Sean or anyone else who might rat me out, I took the long way to the St. A's house, going several blocks out of my way just to be safe. I slowed as I neared the corner, peeking around the building like a child playing hide-and-seek. If Sean was sent to intercept me again, I was going to lose my mind. But the sidewalk was clear of anyone I recognized. Lucky for him. With a deep breath, I mustered up all the courage I had and stepped up to the door, giving it two quick knocks. Once again, there was no answer, but it was after lunchtime. Surely these guys weren't still asleep. I reached up to knock again, but before my knuckles made contact with the door, it swung open. Everly? Tingly chills immediately covered my body. It reminded me of the feeling I got when the hairdresser massaged my scalp during a wash and cut. It was delightful, but in this case it came with a warning. Tate! Oh, my goodness, what are you doing here? I live here. What are you doing here? I, uh, shoot. Where was another bikini when I needed one? It wasn't all that surprising that Tate was a member of the St. A's. He was ridiculously good-looking and had that carefree, can't-hold-me-down attitude that came with extreme wealth. But I felt foolish for not considering the fact that I might run into him here. Now, I just had to come up with a reasonable excuse for knocking on his door. I was just wondering if you were recruiting. Seriously? I bit my lip. Why did he look so unconvinced? Was that a strange request? I really should have studied up more on how this not-so-secret society worked. Yeah, I might be interested in joining. He narrowed his eyes, drawing my attention back to the golden flecks that sparkled in the afternoon light. You don't get to ask to be recruited, and we don't let fractured souls join. A breath escaped me. I'd already come this far, twice. There was no telling if I'd be able to escape my apartment without a guardian again any time soon, and I didn't want to put off my secret little mission any longer. Tate wouldn't stop me. Not today. Okay, do you want to know the truth? This was probably a huge mistake, but I was getting desperate. I always want the truth. I heard this was the place to go for certain remedies that aren't available at the apothecary. He crossed his arms over his chest and leaned against the doorframe. The movement stirred up a familiar smell, the comforting scent of Tate that I'd grown accustomed to on his jacket. It must have been some predatory advantage for the hunters. He could lure his victims in with his attractive features and a smell that destroyed our defenses and actually made us feel safe with the man who wanted our poor little fractured souls. I shook it off. Please tell me you're not another ambrosia junkie. He quirked an eyebrow. I certainly wouldn't have pegged you for one. Ambrosia? No, I don't care about that stuff. It was true but it was also my excuse for wanting to meet the dealer. I needed a plan B, stat. I actually need something else. It's kind of an unconventional remedy. Do you have access to, uh, that kind of stuff? What kind of stuff? A pretty little blonde girl stepped into the doorway beside Tate, sliding in close to his side. She wiggled her way under his arm so that it draped casually around her with his hand settling on her waist. A jolt of jealousy shot through me, and I instantly rejected it. Why would I be jealous of some girl with Tate? He wanted me dead. I couldn't forget that. She leaned her head gently against his side. Her hair was slightly darker than Gala's and Dom's, with more golden yellow tones. But her eyes shared the same deep brown, and she was undoubtedly Olympian. She wore a flimsy white tank top and short, loose-fitting pajama bottoms that exposed more of her toned legs than I cared to see. But as an Olympian, I knew she wasn't Tate's soulmate, 
no bonding there. Not that I would care. Nothing, Viv. She's just a mortal. The girl studied me closely, then stood on her tiptoes to whisper into Tate's ear. I ignored the way it made my stomach lurch to watch their casual exchange. Even my skin tingled harder, as if in protest. The sight literally stung. Tate locked eyes with her and nodded. Then he pulled his arm free and crossed it back over his chest again. What is it that you're after, sweetheart? The girl put her hands on her hips. Sweetheart? How does a girl like that get off calling me sweetheart? No, I needed to control myself. This was a real shot at getting to find the dealer. I needed to keep my very mortal reactions in check. I also needed to think of something to ask for. It's for my friend, actually. She's sick. Keepers don't get sick, Tate said. Sick of school, I mean. She knows what her future holds, and school is just a waste of time preventing her from her true calling. Her true calling, huh? The girl smirked. And what is that? She's a seer. I held my breath, waiting to see what their reactions would be. Tate would undoubtedly know I was talking about Gala, but did this other girl, Viv, know Gala too? I really should have thought up a better story before spouting off lies that might get me and my friend into trouble. When neither of them spoke, I continued. The schoolwork is becoming a grind, and it's distracting her from her visions. She's struggling, so I was hoping to find something to help her focus. Do you know anyone who has access to anything like that? Viv's mouth twisted to one side. I wished I had the power to read her mind, like Dom. Was she about to throw me back out on the street and call up the council to warn them of mortals creeping around and keep her business? I can do you one better, she said. She closed her eyes and held out a hand. Tate let out a sigh of exasperation and focused on something across the street. I wasn't sure what was happening, so I waited, barely breathing. After a minute of silence, I lifted my hand, wondering if she was motioning for me to take hers and follow her somewhere. But before I touched her, a brown paper envelope, square-shaped and slightly larger than her palm, came flying out of nowhere from inside the house and landed softly upon her skin. She opened her eyes with a grin and extended the envelope toward me. Did you just... I couldn't even find a word for what I'd just witnessed. Did you just conjure that up out of thin air? She rolled her eyes. Mortals. No, I didn't conjure it up. I'm not a witch. I'm telekinetic. I just pulled it out of my drawer upstairs and brought it down here. With her mind. I tried to look less amazed, but that was really incredible. Thanks, I said. What should I tell my friend? Does she need to take it twice a day with meals or something like that? Viv groaned. No, these will help induce the visions. She should only take them when she's ready for a major mind trip. They're powerful, and they might knock her off her feet for a couple of hours afterward. So tell her not to take one unless she's somewhere safe for a while. Got it. I fumbled around in my purse looking for some cash. Do you know how much I owe? Then it dawned on me that this petite little blonde girl was the one who'd given me the illicit substances. She was nothing like I'd expected. Wait, are you... are you the dealer? She laughed, the sound like a thousand tinkling bells. This one's on me, and never call me a dealer again. Then she turned to Tate. Keep your mortal friends out of here. She smacked him on the rear end and turned back into the house, leaving us alone once again. She's right, Everly. You need to stay away from here. This isn't the crowd you want to get involved with. Concern tugged at his brows, but he didn't say anything more. I looked down at the small envelope in my hand, feeling the pills tucked inside. I will. Especially now that I knew Tate was involved with the St. A's, I'd have to keep my distance. One false move, and I might just get my soul extracted.
He moved to close the door, and I stepped back down onto the sidewalk before calling out to him one more time. I still have your suit jacket, by the way. The corner of his mouth pulled up. I know. He closed the door. The tingling sensation immediately vanished, and somehow I felt lonelier without it. Chapter 18 The brown envelope sat propped up against the stack of books on my desk. I'd been staring at it for hours, days, really. I wasn't sure what to do with it. There was a part of me that wondered what would happen if I took one. Would it be strong enough for a mortal to have a vision? Would it be possible to see my mom? Or would it be so powerful that it would knock me dead the moment it touched my tongue? The concern Tate held in his eyes the day I got the pills told me it would likely be the latter. That, combined with the sudden reappearance of my little owl friend, was enough to prevent me from trying. So far, anyway. I glanced to the window where the bird sat. There was no denying that he was here for me. He stared into my bedroom, not even pretending to act like a normal owl. He'd also been hanging around on campus any time I walked to class or the honeypot. If I thought Sean was bad, this owl was relentless. I would never be able to go anywhere without some kind of guardian again. And it felt wrong to do something illegal, like take a powerful vision-inducing drug while he watched. Plus, I wasn't a drug kind of girl. I didn't even like taking Tylenol. But would my mom want me to do it if it meant locating her and bringing her safely home again? That was the burning question. I just had to do my research before making any decisions. On Saturday morning, I found myself back at Millie's shop. Abby didn't argue when I offered to take the inventory duties for the day, and thankfully Millie was busy with customers most of the morning, which meant I had the back room to myself. I worked a little, but mostly I scoured Millie's old textbooks for information on what the pills might do. It was too bad I didn't know the name for them. That would have made my job much easier. After a couple of hours of flipping through the dusty old tombs, I was overcome by the same throbbing headache I'd experienced the week before. It had appeared a few times since that first day, but never as strong. Today it came on hard and fast, like I'd been hit with a baseball bat. I rubbed gingerly at the base of my skull, then stamped out into the front of the apothecary to call for my aunt. "'What's the matter, Ev?' "'My head,' I mumbled. "'It's throbbing again.' Millie frowned. "'Come on, let's see if we can get it fixed.' I slid back into the spot in her back room, resting my cheek on the cool tabletop, while Millie once again lit the herbal incense that seemed to relieve my symptoms last time. She then set to work on mixing up some kind of medicinal drought. I watched her work, trying to concentrate on her movements instead of the pain that refused to abate. She had her back to me, busying herself with measuring out a powder I couldn't identify, when suddenly another figure appeared in the storeroom. It was as if he materialized before my eyes. It happened in an instant, faster than a blink. I sat up and rubbed my eyes with the heels of my hands, squeezing them shut hard before opening them again. The figure was still there. He turned, and I recognized him instantly. Devon, Sean's friend, grinning at me. Millie, I think I'm hallucinating. My aunt turned around then and dropped the glass jar containing the powder. It hit the floor and shattered, sending up a cloud of white dust and spraying shards of glass across the floor into a broken mosaic around our feet. Devon turned to the source of commotion and froze as they locked eyes. So it wasn't a hallucination then. Millie could see him too. Her eyes glistened with unshed tears, and a smile slowly found its way to her lips. Do... do you recognize me? she asked. Devon shook his head. I don't think we've met, but... yeah, it's weird. I feel like I do recognize you. He stepped forward and lifted a hand toward my aunt, then dropped it again. In his other hand, he held a red envelope. This is Sean's friend, Devon. Devon, this is my Aunt Millie. 
how on earth did you just appear here? Neither of them paid me or my words any attention. They continued to stare at one another like a child might watch the flames flicker on her birthday candles. There was awe and wonder and a longing, and it creeped me out. Guys? Millie finally pulled her gaze away from the boy and focused on me as a single tear broke free from her lid and rolled slowly down her cheek. I think I should be the one doing the introductions here. Everly, this is my soulmate. My jaw dropped. I turned to Devon. What? Is that true? He still had his eyes glued to my aunt. I... I don't know, maybe. I'm only 18. I've never met my soulmate before, but I, yeah, yeah, I think it's true. It feels like your name is written on my bones. I know that sounds crazy, but I don't know how else to say it. I can't describe this feeling. I just, I just want to hold you in my arms. Another tear fell from Millie's eye. She nodded and extended her arms. Devon rushed forward, and they wrapped each other in an intimate embrace, the way lovers would do. I had to look away. She's like four hundred years older than you. Maybe you shouldn't rush into things, I said, staring into the opposite corner. They ignored me. After a moment, I laid my head back on the table and closed my eyes, tuning them out and breathing in the smell of the incense that finally began to fill the room. I wasn't sure how much time had passed before Millie finally spoke again. Everly's right. You're so young. We don't have to rush back into a relationship. But when you're ready, I'm here. I've been waiting for you to return, just like I promised. I'm sorry. I don't remember. I know. Millie wiped her eyes. The mind is weak, but the soul knows. I'll catch you up on everything when you're ready. But your past life shouldn't diminish your current life. We'll be together, but only when you're ready. I'm ready now, Devon said. Now that I've met you, I can't imagine not being with you. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen, and I'd seen plenty of crazy things over the last several weeks. As if he just remembered I was in the room— Devon turned to me then with a goofy grin. Mind if I marry your aunt? You just met. Maybe you should date her first. His 18-year-old body had just begun to fill out into that of a man. His muscles were lean, and his curly brown hair was a mess. Next to my aunt's perfectly put-together figure, he looked like a joke. She was hundreds of years old, and even to the average mortal eye, she appeared to be about 40. They would certainly draw negative attention, and yet I suspected neither of them could care any less. Oh, Devon held out the red envelope. I almost forgot why I came. This is for you. Millie took the envelope with a frown. Urgent? What could it be? She slid a thumb under the seal and pulled out a small note. While she read silently to herself, I turned back to Devon. So, are you a messenger? He nodded. Yeah, normally I'd be busy with school, but since the Order of the Keepers Convention is coming up, they've called upon all of us to help with the increase in correspondence. So, you just squeeze in teleporting between classes? Devon laughed. Yeah, pretty much. It was amazing to see it happen. I knew it was possible— after all, my own mother was supposedly a messenger just like this, but to actually witness it in person was beyond incredible. Millie clutched the note she'd received and looked up to the ceiling. With a heavy sigh, she refocused her attention back to me and took the chair across from me at the small table. Everly, dear, I've just found the source of your headaches. Great! What is it? I was ready for some relief. She slid the note across the table for me to examine. The paper was just a lab report. I picked it up and scanned the words, my pulse picking up in speed with each line of text. This wasn't an ordinary lab report. 
This was a keeper lab, specializing in elements outside of human comprehension. And my last vitamin, the one I'd given to Millie to research, brought up some very interesting results. How sure are you that this is accurate? Her face split into a full smile. One hundred percent. But why? She wanted to keep you safe. Millie's smile vanished, and she grew serious again. Everly, darling, this changes everything. Those vitamins were designed to bind your powers. Keeper powers. There's no way your mother would have utilized something with such a high strength if you were fractured. So, I'm a keeper. She nodded and reached for my hand, giving it a gentle squeeze. Welcome to life as an Atlantean. Chapter 19 When will they kick in? My heart was thundering against my chest. I was Atlantean, full-blooded, a keeper, with powers. Holy cow! How long has it been since your last dose? About a week, I said. Maybe eight days? I expect it will be soon, but it's hard to say. Most binding substances are designed to be stored in the body long term, so that if you were to miss a dose, you would never know it. But with these specific pills coming from an unaccredited supplier, is that the nice way of saying black market? Millie frowned and ignored my question. It's hard to say. It could be any minute, or it could be a few more weeks. For many young keepers, their powers aren't ignited until some kind of outside stimulus forces them into action. Right. I've heard about that. That's why Tate and Clayton had brought me to the edge of my life so many times. They were trying to terrify the powers out of me, which gave me an idea. Thank you, Millie. I wrapped her in a hug, nearly squeezing the life out of her. When I released her, I noticed Devon still standing awkwardly off to the side. I'll, uh, let you two get back to catching up. I dashed through the curtain back into the front of the shop. Atlantean. I still couldn't wrap my mind around it. I had to test it out, and I knew just the thing. I would just have to get alone first. Hey, Abby, I'm going to go grab some lunch. If Millie asks where I am, let her know I'm with Sean. The lie slipped out too easily. I would probably get caught, but hopefully it wouldn't matter by then. I planned to have my powers kicked into high gear in no time. I wouldn't need a guardian anymore. I practically skipped down the sidewalk back to my apartment. Nothing could keep me down today. I was a powerful, immortal being. About three blocks away from our building, just on the outskirts of campus, I spotted Viv, the Olympian dealer from the St. A's, chatting with some scrawny human-looking boy. A smug smile pulled at my lips. Sorry, Tate. Your girl is cheating on you with a mortal. Except she wasn't. She pulled an envelope from her pocket and covertly handed it off to the boy. I took another look, just to be sure I knew what I was seeing. That kid was definitely mortal. There was no way such a sickly-looking boy could be a keeper. But his smile wasn't sickly at all. No, it was strong and menacing. Viv gave the boy a stern look and then disappeared around a corner. His grin widened, and then he looked up and locked eyes with me from across the street. The smile faded into a scowl, and he scurried off in the opposite direction. That was strange. I should have probably just let it be, but a nagging curiosity urged me to follow him. I couldn't resist a good mystery. Why would a black market dealer be conspiring with a mortal? Unless he wasn't a mortal. Not a keeper, not a mortal. That only left one other option. This kid was a fractured soul. I picked up my pace, fully convinced now that I was going to catch him doing some dark magic in an alleyway somewhere. I shouldn't have cared. I knew now that I didn't need the fractured souls or Rasputin anymore. 
All I had to do was take one of the vision-inducing pills to locate my mother, and with keeper powers, I could search their territories until I rescued her myself. But then again, the visions might not work, not for an Atlantean. Wouldn't it still be easier to dream waltz right into her mind and ask where she was being held? There weren't any Atlantean powers that would give me such an advantage. Even when mine did emerge, it didn't mean I'd be able to locate her. So maybe meeting up with Rasputin wouldn't be such a bad idea after all. I would just have to do it before my powers emerged, or he would refuse to see me. I was certain he wouldn't agree to meet with a full keeper, but if I could convince him that I was fractured... I'd been so wrapped up in my thoughts that I lost track of the fractured boy. Shoot. I stopped on the sidewalk, looking down the road to my left and right, before deciding to stick to my original plan. All this fractured soul and black market dealer nonsense was going to get me in trouble if I wasn't careful. I turned back in the direction of my apartment and nearly ran right into the last person I wanted to see. Osborne sneered at me. Looking for someone? No. I shrugged him off and tried to pass him. Oh, I think you were. I saw you spying. Spying on who? The fractured boy. Is he one of your friends? I don't know what you're talking about. I tried to push past him again, but he reached out and grabbed my arm. Ow! Get off of me! I know you're involved, and I'll put the pieces together soon. Mark my words. I yanked my arm again, hard, but Osborne's dirty fingers gripped me even tighter. I would probably be bruised. She said, get off. A wave of electricity danced across my skin. Tate, my dark night was saving me yet again. Osborne's grip loosened, but he didn't let go. You need to do a better job of keeping your pet on her leash. She's stepping dangerously close to my territory and I won't hesitate to do your job for you if the occasion presents itself. I'll gladly take the credit, too, especially if it gets me into that shiny seat they supposedly have reserved for you. Enough. I'd never seen Tate so angry, except for maybe when Clayton tried to drown me. Get your hands off of her, now. Osborne's lip curled into a seriously frightening snarl. He did as Tate asked, but not before giving my arm one final squeeze as hard as he could. I bit down on a whimper. He wouldn't get the satisfaction of knowing he'd hurt me. I waited until he turned away before trying to rub the feeling back into my bicep. Tate reached out to see the damage, and a soothing warmth spread from his fingers the moment his hand made contact with my arm. Oh, wow. I closed my eyes briefly and inhaled, appreciating the comfort of his touch. Is that some kind of healing power? What? Tate's head tilted to one side, but he left his hand lingering gently on my arm. The feeling of his touch spread through me like hot cocoa on a cold day, warming me from the inside out and completely distracting me from the pain. That warm feeling... You can feel that? He yanked his hand quickly away. I wished he would put it back, but at least the soreness had disappeared before he removed it. No, I can't share any healing powers. So what is it then? He shrugged. Probably your imagination. That wasn't true. He'd admitted to feeling it too. I wondered if he also got the tingling sensation when we were near each other. Maybe that's how the hunters knew when they were close to their prey. Tate turned back toward Riverside Drive, but I wasn't going to let him get away so easily. This wasn't a frequently traversed area outside of the campus, so he better have had a good explanation for how he suddenly appeared when I was in danger again. It's strange how we keep running into each other in a city this big. I pursed my lips and shot him an accusing look, scurrying to keep up with his long strides. Nah, it's not strange. I've been following you. What? You knew that. I told you as much the first time we met in Central Park. But I haven't seen you around much lately. 
It kind of seems like you only show up when I'm in danger. Well, that's when your powers are most likely to appear. I need to be there to catch you when it happens. So you can lure me back to your lair and extract my soul? Half of his mouth pulled into a crooked grin, somehow looking more charming than calculating. I was such a fool for being attracted to a guy who just admitted to stalking me so he could eventually kill me. I like the word lair. It makes me sound like a mastermind. It struck me that Tate and I actually had similar goals now. He wanted my powers to appear just as badly as I did, and I didn't have any reason to fear him anymore. Now that I knew I was a full-blooded Atlantean, he wouldn't be able to extract my soul. I wasn't fractured, but I didn't have to tell him that. You know, if you're going to follow me around the city, you may as well walk beside me instead of lurking in the shadows. He stopped and looked me dead in the eye. Side by side, it was much more evident how tall he was. He stood a good foot higher than my five-foot-six frame. I had to lift my chin to maintain eye contact. You're not afraid of me anymore, he said. Why? You don't look very scary to me. Besides, if you were truly evil, you would have let me die when I fell off the yacht, or when the gallery exploded. That's an over-exaggeration. The gallery didn't explode. Or when Clayton tried to drown me. Or when Osborne tried to break my arm. Should I go on? You do have a habit of getting yourself into trouble. If you're so determined to take my soul, assuming I'm even fractured, why don't you try to get my powers jump-started yourself? Tate paused, and I could practically see the wheels turning in his mind. Do you know something I don't? Guess you'll have to wait and see. I touched my fingertip to his chest on the last word and turned to walk ahead without him, ignoring the jolt of electricity that still had my hand tingling from where we touched. I risked a quick glance over my shoulder and spotted Tate standing motionless on the sidewalk, his hand over the spot where I touched him. Chapter 20 I chickened out. I couldn't bring myself to take the vision-inducing pills. Maybe it was my conscience, or intuition, or maybe it was the glowing yellow glare of my owl's eyes through the window. But every time I picked up the envelope, I heard a voice in my brain that told me to set it back down again. Technically, I was still immortal until my powers kicked in, and taking an unknown substance like that now could be deadly. I would reconsider taking the pills once I was officially Atlantean. Until then, I would just dream of what having powers might feel like. I tried to play it cool the next day. I didn't want to reveal the news about my powers to my friends until I had proof. It almost seemed too good to be true, even to me, but it must have been written all over my face. I don't mean any offense by this, but are you feeling okay? Sean studied me a little too closely on our walk to campus the next morning. I feel great. Why? My voice came out in an overly enthusiastic high pitch, destroying any plausibility that I was telling the truth. His eyes narrowed further. Something's up. Nope, you're wrong. We stopped outside of my classroom building. Normally, Sean would have waved goodbye here and continued toward his own class, but he seemed dead set on getting to the bottom of my mood. He crossed his arms over his chest and opened his mouth to speak, but I cut him off. I knew just the thing to keep him moving. How's Abby doing? She mentioned you guys might hang out this weekend. His jaw snapped shut and he shook his head. See you after class, Ev. Ha, sucker. I was about to turn for the building when I spotted a familiar face across the lawn. He was too far away for me to be certain, but he looked a lot like the sick little mortal boy I saw the day before. He checked his watch and glanced around like he was waiting for someone. Was he doing another deal with Viv, maybe? This seemed like a bad place to go unnoticed. I knew I should have ignored him and gone to class. It was the right thing to do. It's what Dom would have done. But who knew how long it would be before my powers came in? Millie mentioned it could be weeks. 
and here was his fractured soul right in front of me. I could talk to him now and possibly find my mom today if he was willing to lead me to Rasputin. Why would I wait for my powers to come in when I could get my mom back today? Ignoring the faulty logic behind my scheme, I moved for the boy. He glanced up and locked eyes with me again. As soon as he realized I was heading for him, he turned and jogged off toward the opposite side of campus. I picked up my pace as well. That same voice in my head that urged me to set down the pills at home was screaming at me now to stop and turn back for class. And there was adrenaline pumping through my veins now. I was high on the thrill of a good mystery, and common sense went right out the window. He disappeared between some cars in a parking lot up ahead. I ran harder to see where he went when my owl flapped down and landed on a curb. I frowned at the creature. I already know this guy is probably bad news. You don't have to tell me, but I need to talk to him. The owl tilted its head at me, and I swore I could hear my conscience yelling at me to go to class again. But I was so close. I just needed to see where the boy went. I took just a second to catch my breath and rub at the spot on the back of my head. A headache was ramping up again, throbbing with my heavy breathing. Ignoring it the best I could, I stepped over the curb and looked both ways in the parking lot. An engine started in the next aisle over, so I hurried toward the noise. A blue sedan backed out of a narrow spot, and the mousy brown hair of the mortal boy was visible through the back window. Hey! I called out though I knew he wouldn't be able to hear me. Even if he did hear me, he had no reason to stop. I certainly wouldn't have stopped for some panting girl who chased me across campus and yelled at me in a parking lot. I knew what I was doing didn't make any sense, and yet I couldn't stop. I moved forward with the intention of tapping on his trunk, but a pair of sturdy arms caught me before I could get near the car. I froze, knowing who it was before he even spoke. A buzz shot through my limbs, and my heartbeat quickened. What in the world are you doing? I turned to face Tate, and the sensation strengthened. He quickly released me, and I suspected he'd felt it too. I'm trying to catch that guy. I turned to follow the car, which was headed toward the exit of the parking lot. Why? Tate jogged up to my side. Because he... He has some information that I need. It's important. You're not making any sense. That guy doesn't know anything. He's a mortal. I don't think so. I think he's fractured. Tate's eyes widened just a fraction. Are you sure? Yes. I mean, no. I strongly suspect it. Then we've got to follow him. Yes. Wait. Tate was already gone. He ran ahead to a young woman who just set her water bottle on top of a car as she loaded the back seat with her books. He leaned in and spoke quietly to her. Next thing I knew, she grinned widely and handed him the keys. Tate glanced over his shoulder and hollered at me to get in. This wasn't how I pictured my morning going, not at all. But I wouldn't object to Tate chasing after the fractured boy as long as I could tag along. I would just have to find some way to speak to the boy privately before Tate stole his soul. Okay, so maybe it wasn't such a great idea after all. I pulled the car door closed behind me as a vehicle was already rolling forward after the fractured boy. Do you steal cars from unsuspecting mortals often? He cut me a sideways glance. About as often as you chase people across campus. Well played, I mumbled with a grin. So why do you think this guy is fractured? I chewed on the inside of my lip. Should I tell him the truth? On one hand, I wouldn't mind throwing that pretty little Olympian girl under the bus, but I didn't want to upset him. Never mind. He was a hunter. I didn't care about his feelings. Your girlfriend gave him some drugs. Who? Viv. I saw them doing a deal yesterday. He's definitely not a keeper, so I assume he must be fractured. Tate made a choking sound. First of all, Viv is not my girlfriend. He shuddered. Second of all, if you're sure you spotted her giving him something, then he's most definitely up to no good. 
he cut his eyes over to me again. I'm glad you didn't take the stuff she gave you, by the way. Would it have killed me? Definitely, and your fractured soul would have been permanently lost. We'd caught up to the blue sedan, and we drove quietly for several minutes. My head was really pounding now, and I could see my pulse inching in around the edges of my eyesight with every heartbeat. Thankfully, Tate was driving, not me. He did a good job of trailing the car without drawing the driver's attention. I wondered if he'd trailed many fractured souls like this before. After a bit, I dug a little deeper into the pills, asking the question that had been dancing on the tip of my tongue. Would those pills kill a keeper, too? No, we're immortal. Nothing short of a millennium can kill a keeper. That's not true. Tate's brows wrinkled, and he shot me a quick glance again. Who told you that? Does it matter? He sighed and continued driving, ignoring my question. His face remained tense, though, like there was more he wanted to say, but he didn't. We drove on for quite some time until we reached an industrial part of the city. Worn buildings lined the road with broken glass windows and boarded-up doors. The car turned down an empty road of warehouses toward the Long Island Sound and stopped at an abandoned-looking building at the end of the road. Tate moved past the street and parked around the corner. You stay here. Okay. There was no use arguing. If I refused, he'd glamour me and force me to stay put. But if I played along, there was still a chance I could act on my own accord. Tate climbed out of the car, but he paused before closing the door. Leaning back in to face me, his expression grew serious. I mean it, mortal. Don't leave this car. If there are other hunters here, they'll assume the worst about you. They won't wait for proof. Got it, I swallowed, waiting for his eyes to glow or his voice to change. But after a long pause, he closed the door and jogged around the corner toward the fractured boy. I released a pent-up breath the moment he disappeared from my view. If Tate thought there would be other hunters here, this was a much bigger deal than I thought. Could that sick mortal boy be meeting with Rasputin himself? I wouldn't wait to find out. Chapter 21 I counted to thirty before slowly easing open my car door. The sun shone brightly, and two slow clouds lazily crawled across the blue sky. The calm, quiet atmosphere definitely did not match the excitement surging through my bones. In fact, it seemed a little too quiet. There were millions of people in the city. Why wasn't anyone around mid-morning on a Monday? We were in an industrial zone. It should have been bustling with trucks and deliveries and hard-working men and women carrying out their daily tasks. Shaking off the uneasy feeling trying to settle into my gut, I snuck up to the corner and peeked around, staring at the empty road where Tate and the fractured boy had disappeared. There was just nothing. Where had they gone? Aside from a few other cars parked at the very end of the road, there was no evidence of life anywhere. I crept forward, trying my best to stick to the shadows cast by the dilapidated building to my left. There was a doorway about halfway down the block. My guess was that they'd gone inside. A moment later I reached the door, large and rusty, where the old blue paint had chipped off. There was no handle, no knob, no knocker and no peephole. It must have been an exit only. Even so, I wedged my fingers into the edge and tried to pry it open. It wouldn't budge. I exhaled and looked around again. Nothing had changed. The street was empty, and the area was quiet, aside from the waves and a cool breeze I could just barely make out coming from the Long Island Sound at the end of the road. I took just a moment to enjoy the quiet, grateful that my already pounding head didn't have to endure honking horns and sirens and shouts. My eye settled on the boy's blue sedan. Unsure of what else to do, I dashed over to the vehicle and crouched down low. The passenger's door was locked. Keeping myself near the ground, I inched around to the other side. The driver's door was locked, too. What now? 
I rose just enough to peek inside the windows. I didn't know what I expected to find. Ambrosia? Keeper paraphernalia? A book of spells? This was silly. With no other clear options, there was nothing else to do but go back to the car and wait for Tate. I stood to move in that direction when a flapping sound drew my attention overhead. A flash of white feathers flew low and landed on the chain-link fence at the end of the road. "'What are you doing here?' I asked my owl. The bird swiveled its head on its small, fluffy body, turning to look at rows of giant metal shipping containers stacked up on the other side of the fence. The water of the sound glimmered in the sunlight just beyond them. "'It's locked,' I said, noting the heavy metal chain wrapped around the gate." The owl tilted its head hard to the right and blinked at me. I shrugged. I don't know what you want me to do. The bird turned its head again, taking its time to deliberately look toward the shipping containers and then back at me. I can't just climb over. Its sentient yellow eyes narrowed. You seriously want me to jump a fence in broad daylight? As if that won't draw any negative attention. The owl looked back and forth down the empty road before settling back on me. He had a point. There was no one around. Fine. I marched up to the fence, cast one final glance warily over my shoulder to be sure no one was around, then scrambled up as quickly as I could. Swinging one leg over the top, I became instantly grateful for two things. One, there was no barbed wire, and two... I wore jeans today. I wasn't a child anymore, and climbing fences was a lot rougher than I remembered it being when I was younger. Finally, my feet touched concrete on the other side. I glared at the bird. Now what? It launched into flight and landed in between a couple of the shipping containers a few yards away. Hesitantly, I followed it. There was no kind of rail or anything around the edge of the cargo dock the containers were stacked upon, and the water made me nervous. It shouldn't have been too deep, but I didn't like being so close to it anyway. I just stick to the center of the slab. As I neared the first row of containers, I heard the soft hum of voices, but I had no idea where they were coming from. The stacks of metal boxes made a labyrinth of dirt and grime, and the noise bounced off the sides of the containers in strange ways, leaving me thoroughly confused. All I knew was that I didn't want to get close to the water. I didn't want to accidentally stumble upon those voices either. And to make matters worse, my owl had essentially disappeared. I could have sworn I saw him land right where I stood, but he was nowhere to be seen. I didn't dare call out to him. Perhaps he'd landed in the next aisle over. Carefully, and oh so slowly, I eased around the corner of a container, keeping my back flush against the metal, and tried to get a glimpse of the other side. I needed to make sure the coast was clear, but I never expected to find the pair of golden eyes waiting on the other side. Osborne was inches from my face, waiting for me, and before I could even think about moving— he spoke in the entrancing tone of a hundred different melodies. Freeze. I had no choice but to obey. I knew it, he said, moving around the edge to get a better look at me. I was still motionless, held in the same awkward position I'd been in when he commanded me to freeze. My back was flat against the shipping container, and my head was crooked in an unnatural position around the corner. The pose, combined with a racing pulse, did little to help my headache. It had grown into an all-encompassing pain now, my vision blinking in and out with every beat of my heart, like a strobe light. Knew what? I asked, swallowing down my panic. Tate said other hunters wouldn't wait for proof, and no other hunter wanted me dead as much as Osborne did. Knew I'd find you here, with the rest of your kind. You're wrong. I'm not fractured, and you can't hurt me. I beg to differ. Osborne sneered and began pacing before me. All I have to do is prove that I put forth my best effort. 
Mortals don't stumble around fractured meeting sites, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but the meeting is a farce anyway. Rasputin isn't even here. I put out the lie myself to draw out the other evil souls like yours. That's how a real hunter gets a job done. I never expected such a large turnout, though. I told you, I'm not fractured. Prove it. I have no powers. Isn't that proof enough? Fractured souls, by definition, have partial powers. I have none. I'll coax them out of you. He grinned and pulled something metal out of his pocket, then slipped it onto his hand. Brass knuckles. They say all it takes is a little trauma. Too bad your prince isn't here to save you now. He reared back his fist, and I squeezed my eyes shut, preparing for impact. Chapter 22 The hit never came. My eyes opened again to find the world as utterly frozen as I was. Osborne's hateful face was locked in a perpetual sneer, just a foot from mine, his fist pulled back above his shoulder. This couldn't be real. There was no way something like this was possible. But there he was, unblinking, unbreathing. It was as if the whole world had stopped. No, not the whole world. I gasped as I watched my owl flutter down and land on the shipping container behind Osborne. It blinked at me and suddenly I knew the freeze was about to break. It was like I heard that voice in my head again, giving me a, ready, set, go, and we were back to normal. The sunlight glinted off of the metal knuckles adorning Osborne's hand as his fist reached prime position. But just as he prepared to swing it forward, a flash of white appeared from the sky, flying a hundred miles an hour and dive-bombing straight into Osborne's head. The owl connected with Osborne's before he could hit me, and a flutter of white feathers went flying as he cursed loudly. The glamour broke, along with Osborne's concentration, and I ran, hard. His footsteps were hot on my heels as I rounded the corner, no longer fearing who else I might run into— no one would be as terrifying as Osborne. I ran the length of two more shipping containers and turned the corner again, finding myself in a small open area with a crowd of about ten or twelve men and women, mortals by the look of them, squished together in the center. They were silent, frozen, just as I had been moments earlier, and their clothes flapped in a wind that only seemed to affect their small group. Stop! Tate's voice yelled out from somewhere overhead. I looked up to find him standing on a stack of containers beside a tall, dark-skinned man who appeared to be carved from stone. The man was inhumanly handsome, and the lines of his muscles were sharp as the sun cast shadows over his shirtless torso. A Garthian. Another hunter? This was bad. Electricity danced over my skin as I drew nearer to Tate, but he wasn't watching me. His eyes were on Osborne as he called his command again, this time with a thousand layers of intricate harmonies. Stop right there, he said, his words laced with glamour. But it didn't work. I could still move. I risked a quick glance over my shoulder as I reached the shipping container Tate and the other Agarthian stood upon and saw Osborne motionless before the group of terrified humans. Give me your hand. Tate was flat on his stomach, reaching down to me over the edge of the container. I didn't hesitate. My skin came alive where his hand wrapped around mine, and the ground fell away beneath my feet as he pulled me effortlessly to the top of the stack. What did you do to Daniel? Osborne's wicked voice drew my attention back to the ground. He was struggling to move, fighting against Tate's glamour and looking like his feet were stuck in wet cement. I turned to the other Agarthian man beside us, Daniel, and noticed that he too was frozen. A small sweat glistened off of Tate's forehead as he worked to maintain his concentration and rescue me at the same time. I told you to stay in the car, he said. I'm not a very good listener. 
understatement of the year. Daniel! Osborne's voice took on a tone of glamour now, too. Magic rolled off of his tongue. The man beside us turned slowly to face him. You are released from Thaddeus's control. Do not let the girl escape. No, Tate cried out, but he was too late. He and the Agarthian man shrank away as I was swept up high into the air, arms pinned to my sides by an invisible and powerful wind. Below me, I could see the small group of humans staring up with mouths agape. Daniel stood on the roof of the shipping container, arms extended above his head, holding me in the air with wind that came from his fingertips. Tate could do nothing to Daniel without also injuring me in the process. One major hit would drop me from the sky, and there was no way my frail mortal body could sustain that kind of impact. I would splat like a bug on the front of an eighteen-wheeler. Rather than risk the danger associated with Daniel, Tate focused his efforts on Osborne, who was freely moving again now that Tate was too distracted to hold the glamour. He leaped down from the roof and dove for Osborne. There were shouts, but nothing I could make out from as high as I was in the air. There was absolutely nothing I could do. I was trapped. Glancing over my shoulder, I remembered that I was also surrounded by water on three sides— and I didn't know which would be a worse way to die. Hitting the ground would be messy, but there was a chance it would be over before I realized it even hurt. But the water? I wouldn't die from impact if I dropped into the sound. No, I'd sink slowly to the filthy bottom, holding my breath until my lungs burned and cried out for oxygen. Choking and drowning would be the worse option, no question. The world spun around me, my head throbbing forcefully. Millie had said the headaches were a symptom of my powers coming in. This was a traumatic event, right? Surely being flung up into the air by an invisible wind held by your arch enemy's equally powerful crony qualified. But was it enough to bring my true nature to light? I closed my eyes, tuning out everything except the way the wind whipped strands of hair across my cheeks. My mother was a messenger, like Devon. Maybe I inherited her powers. I thought about how Devon appeared in the storeroom at Millie's apothecary. He'd arrived out of nowhere, as though he cut right through the fabric of this world and stepped into it from another. I could do that, too. I had to. My pulse quickened, along with the throbbing in my head, and right as it seemed to reach a fever pitch, I did it. Well... I thought about doing it. Technically, my hands were still pinned to my sides, but mentally, I cut right through that invisible wind that bound me. I imagined stepping straight through it, right out of this world and into... nothing. I stepped nowhere. My eyes opened to see the same terrifying sight as before. All I got for my efforts was a worsened headache. Tate and Osborne rolled over one another in a good old-fashioned fistfight down below. I supposed when two sirens squared off against each other, their glamour became ineffective, and Daniel couldn't help his friend, not without dropping me. After a particularly solid hit to Osborne's jaw, Tate broke away. He reached for the top of the shipping containers and gracefully pulled himself up like a panther leaping into a tree. He landed with ease and turned his focus back to Daniel. Osborne wasn't far behind, reaching for the container right behind Tate. Hurry, I thought. If Osborne gets to Daniel before you, I'm toast. Tate looked up to me, and even from my height, I could see the gold of his eyes glittering with determination in the sunshine. He moved away from the edge, dashing around to the other side of Daniel, right as Osborne reached the rooftop. Daniel turned, and I went flying with him. His hands barely moved, but I probably flew thirty feet across the sky. Hurry up, Tate. Do something. He and Osborne circled around Daniel, who must have been getting shaky. My steady, invisible wind prison in the sky grew more turbulent with every passing second. I heard shouting again, but still couldn't make out what the guys were saying over the whipping of the wind and the distance between us. Then I saw it, a flash of white from the corner of my eye. 
I turned in time to see my friend, my true hero, the owl, right as he swooped down from across the way. A grin spread across my face. I was going to be saved. I watched with bated breath as the owl dove straight for Daniel. Wait, I whispered to myself as I understood what was happening. Wait, no! The owl collided with Daniel's outstretched arms, and all three men turned to me with similar looks of shock as Daniel's control over me was severed. The owl's impact sent me flying fast, moving almost horizontally through the air before I began my descent. And as I began my fall, I swore I heard a familiar voice in my mind. It said everything was going to be okay. I looked at the rapidly approaching water and prayed that the voice was right. Chapter 23 The water came at me like a wall, the murkiness of its depths contrasted by the light reflecting off of its choppy surface. Other details came to me as well, like a water bug paddling lazily across the top of a wave and the bubbles that popped up to the surface near the cement wall of the cargo dock. And then it dawned on me. I wasn't falling anymore. Or rather, I wasn't speeding toward the water. I reached out and touched the surface, the tips of my fingers barely breaking through to the wetness below. Had Daniel stopped me? No. The wind was gone. I scanned back over the water's surface to confirm my suspicions. The bug was still. The bubbles ceased. Time had stopped again. Maybe it was the owl. He was the only piece of the world still alive the last time this happened. What am I supposed to do? I yelled. But the owl didn't respond. Of course it didn't respond. It was an animal, and it was still up on the dock with the Agarthians. I reached out to slap the water out of frustration. A small splash was followed by concentric rings of waves. I watched them in awe as they moved unnaturally through the otherwise motionless, dark surface. I could still interact with the world. The world just couldn't interact with me. How very interesting. Everything is going to be okay. It wasn't a voice I heard, not exactly. There weren't physical words or sounds in my brain, but there was a reassurance. Maybe it was just me talking to myself, but at this point, anything was possible. I believed the words, no matter where they came from. And just as quickly as everything had stopped, time snapped back into motion, and I plunged headfirst into the cold and dirty water of the Long Island Sound. Air escaping my lungs bubbled up from my mouth as I dropped through the water. I wasn't ready for this. I wasn't prepared. I hadn't even gotten a final lungful of air to last me a couple of short, final minutes. I opened my eyes, looking for something I could possibly grab a hold of to stop me from sinking to the bottom. If I had any breath left, the sight before me would have taken it all away. I could see everything, every particle of dust, every piece of trash lining the bottom of the sound, every bug and fish that surrounded me. It was like I watched the water through a lens. I paused for a moment, staring in wonder at the way the sun's rays bent through the waves to glitter off the silvery scales of a tiny school of fish wiggling their bodies past me. I reached for one, momentarily distracted by their beauty. The fish swam away too fast for me to touch. But me? I wasn't moving much at all. My feet swayed back and forth, casually treading water like I'd seen so many people do before. It was a skill I'd never mastered. And now, I didn't even have to think about it. The skill had become ingrained within me. It was part of me now. I kicked harder, propelling myself up to the water's surface as easily as I might kick a playground ball. My cheeks broke free, feeling the breeze and the sunshine kiss my face, but I wasn't done yet. I wanted more. With a grin, I dove back under the water, faster and freer than I'd ever felt on land. I sped through the water, delighting in the feel of its ripples across my skin. My lungs didn't burn. 
I didn't feel the need to come up for air at all. It was like I didn't have to breathe. Or maybe I was breathing. All I knew was that this was what life was supposed to feel like. With a kick and a twirl, I circled back through the waves to the area where I'd first fallen in. As much as I would have loved to swim and play in the water all day, there were some major issues taking place on the cargo dock. Tate was fighting against two of his own kind, and he needed help. An hour before, I was a worthless companion for him. Just dead weight he had to fight to keep alive. But now, now I felt power surging through my muscles. My blood pumped energy and vitality to every stretch of my body. I was strong. I was Atlantean. And there was nothing Osborne could do to stop me. I reached the edge of the concrete and came up to the air just in time to see my hunter dive into the sound above me. His entire body seemed to glow with a warm, earthy golden hue, almost tangerine in color, like a sunset or the light of dawn. I stilled, entranced by the sight of him. He'd had a running start and flew out across a water surface, breaking through like a swan, elegant but strong. I waited a moment longer to see if Osborne or Daniel would follow, but no one came. Tate was alone. With a grin, I dove back in and spotted the back of his head as he scanned the water below, looking for me. I reached him in half a second, and he spun around to face me at the exact moment I reached him. Something went taut in my chest as his eyes met mine, and I felt drawn to reach out and touch him, like there was an invisible thread tying us together. I reached for his hand, the electric sensation that bloomed between us feeling stronger than ever beneath the water, and motioned upward. His eyes grew to half dollars, and with one kick I propelled us both back up to the surface. We emerged through the surface of the sound, and Tate shook water free from his hair and his eyes, then pulled his hand from mine. His jaw dropped, and his breathing was heavy. You're swimming. I grinned. I'm pretty good at it, too. He reached slowly toward my face and paused, pulling his hand back again and examining it. I still felt it, too. A humming sensation, pleasant and warm where we touched. You're not fractured. His voice was barely a whisper, and confusion contorted his handsome features. Nope, I'm Atlantean. His face remained twisted as his eyes darted back and forth over me. He shook his head. No, you're not Atlantean. What are you talking about? I looked around, my senses sharper than humanly possible. I could hear birds chirping a few blocks over in the small park near a pier, I smelled the exhaust of a delivery vehicle somewhere in the distance and noted the logo of a passenger plane soaring through the clouds overhead. I was strong. I was full of life. I was definitely a keeper now. Your aura. It's not like anything I've ever seen. I don't understand. The sound of footsteps over my shoulder clattered loudly through my ears. Osborne and Daniel were on their way. Tate put a hand on my shoulder and shoved me back under the water, pushing hard until I floated beneath his feet. And there I stayed, certain that he must have had a good reason to keep me hidden from them. What had he meant about my aura? I'd seen his, a gorgeous golden color, like the sunlight of an autumn morning. But looking down at my own arms and legs, I saw nothing. What did Tate see? And what was it supposed to look like? Whatever it was, he didn't trust it to keep me safe from Osborne. Though the water was plenty murky enough to conceal me at my current depth, I swam lower, nearing the bottom of the sound, just to be safe. I didn't know how much time had passed, and I realized it didn't matter. I could stay under the water forever if I wanted to. Being an Atlantean was amazing. When Tate's face reappeared below the water's surface, searching for me, I was almost reluctant to leave. Almost. But the feeling in my chest drew me upward, closer to him. He took my hand, and together we swam back up to the water's surface. 
Back up top, Tate scanned me again. His beautiful eyes moved quickly over every inch of me, as though he couldn't believe what he was seeing. I can't take your soul, he said. Because it's whole? I said hopefully. I'm not fractured. No, you're not fractured. I don't know what you are. Chapter 24 I feel awful about soaking this poor girl's upholstery in salt water. I looked at Tate in the driver's seat to see if my efforts to lighten the mood had any effect on him at all, but he remained lost in thought. I sighed. Are you going to explain to me what is going on or not? You said my aura wasn't Atlantean. What is it then? He glanced warily at me from the corners of his eyes, then turned back to the road without answering. I groaned and leaned my head against the window. I'll leave her some money, he said. Huh? To have the car detailed. That water is rancid. The water didn't seem all that bad to me, but maybe it was due to my new affinity for it. The car rolled to a stop in front of my apartment building. Thanks for bringing me home, I said. Tate killed the engine and pushed his door open. Oh, I'm not dropping you off. I'm not going anywhere until we figure this out. I ignored the thrill of excitement I felt at the thought of hanging out with Tate a little while longer. I simply nodded. No one wants to understand what you're talking about more than I do. He pulled open the door to my building and allowed me to step in before him. He was such a gentlemanly assassin. We walked to the elevator, and I couldn't help but notice how Tate shifted nervously on his feet as the doors closed us in together. The elevator had never felt so small. The feeling in my chest emerged again, and I resisted the pull to him. We were like opposite ends of a magnet, fighting to prevent ourselves from snapping right together. I looked away, determining the buzzy tingle that washed over me was still a warning. If I wasn't a true Atlantean, as Tate indicated, could he still hunt me? Was my soul still in danger? It was the only explanation I had for this strange sensation I continued to feel when I was near him. The doors opened on my floor, and we raced each other to exit the elevator, each of us eager to put some space between ourselves. But the plan backfired. We ran into each other and stumbled clumsily out into the hallway. His hands settled on my hips to steady me when I tripped, and he didn't immediately pull them away. His heart raced as fast as mine. I could hear it now with my heightened senses. His eyes dropped down to my lips, and I lifted my chin without even thinking. But he didn't kiss me. He lifted a hand and brushed his thumb across my chin and up onto my lower lip. Your scar is gone. His thumb lingered there, warm and soft, and I didn't want him to pull it away. His touch was everything. It was like I was under his spell, but there was no glamour there. And based on the look in his eyes, he was just as enchanted. The sound of a door slamming open down the hall startled us quickly apart. I turned to find Dom's wide eye staring back at me. Everly, you... Never mind. I'm glad you're here. I need your help. Her face was pale and twisted into a terror I couldn't imagine. Tate and I rushed over to the apartment and followed Dom inside. Gayla lay prone in the middle of our living room floor, convulsing. I immediately dropped by her side, Dom taking position across from me. Reaching for her hand, I pleaded with her softly. Gayla, can you hear me? Please, please, you've got to be all right. I looked up at Dom, noting the panic flashing in her eyes. What happened? I don't know. I just got back from class and found her like this. I walked in just before you did. I, I don't know, she said again, her voice cracking. Tate crossed the room and picked up a small brown envelope from the arm of our couch, cursing under his breath. He crushed the empty paper in his fist. It's the pills from Viv. Pills? Dom asked. What's going to happen to her? Is she dying? I gently moved a piece of white blonde hair from her face. He knelt beside us and felt her forehead. Then, with careful fingers, 
he lifted her lids. Dom and I gasped in unison. Her beautiful brown eyes were deep black pools, swirling in a way that reminded me of an ominous thunderhead before a storm. Foam leaked from the corners of her mouth as her body continued to be racked with violent tremors. I don't think so, Tate said. Just stay here with her until this passes. We held her hands, and I whispered silent prayers until all of a sudden it stopped. Her body went rigid as a board, then her eyes popped open, and she sat up tall, ramrod straight. Scoot back, Tate said. We did as we were told. Gala said nothing at first. She didn't move. She barely looked to be breathing. When her lips finally parted, it wasn't her voice we heard at all. It was a sound of another creature, a thousand otherworldly voices speaking as one. He sees you coming, Deliverer. He knows your story. They've hidden him in the cleft of the rock, but the beacon still stands. He watches the waves. He waits for you. It won't be long now. It won't be long. He sees you coming. Go. Go now. You must go. Gala stilled again. Her lids grew heavy and closed over the storms in her eyes. She swayed, and Dom dove forward with a pillow to catch her fall just before she hit the floor. I reached out and released a breath of relief as I felt her pulse, strong and regular. I think she's going to be all right, I said. But what was that? A vision, Tate said. It's never happened like that before, Dom shook her head. Where did the drugs come from? She glared first at Tate, then turned her hard eyes on me. Oh, Everly. I'm sorry, I whispered. I didn't know. She's going to be okay, though, right, Tate? He nodded. Yeah, I think she just needs to rest. But those words... He turned to Dom. What do you know about the Deliverer? Nothing. I've never heard anything like that in my life. Tate frowned. What do you know about it, Tate? I asked. Is this something we should be concerned about? I don't know. I remember a story about it. I only heard the full tale once, as a child. He scratched the back of his head. Technically, I overheard it during one of my brother's lessons. Dom made an O shape with her mouth, and I suspected there were a few more layers to that simple statement but I'd have to save my questions for another time. There were rumors once of a prophecy. It spoke of a deliverer who would one day come to the earth and reunite the people, every race, every creed, every color. But the change would destroy the keepers. It's folklore, of course, just something parents used to tell their children when they fought with their siblings. They'd warn the children to settle down or they might bring on the deliverer. He laughed humorlessly. But several years ago, a man became obsessed with the so-called prophecy. He lost his mind while trying to piece it together. The lesson I heard given to my brother was more of a reminder. We are to erase evidence of this story from our history. It's damaging when taken seriously, and my brother was instructed to report any indication that the rumors may be spreading through Agartha. Chill bumps dotted my arms. So what does that vision mean, then? I don't know. There are lots of things I can't explain today. Like Everly's new aura? Dom shot a knowing look in Tate's direction. That's one thing. It was then that I noticed a faint lavender glow emanating from Dom and Gala. Their auras. They were subtle, easily overlooked, unless one was searching for them. It was almost like I had to shift my eyes into a different line of sight to see them. Agarthians were gold, and Olympians were purple. What color are Atlantean auras? Dom and Tate exchanged worried looks. A deep blue-green, Dom said. Like the ocean, Tate added. And what color is mine? I looked back down at my arms, seeing nothing. White.
Part Three, The Lighthouse. Chapter Twenty Five. The oven beeped a signal for my mouth to begin to water. I could practically taste the fudgy, nutty goodness of Dom's brownies through the air. It was a refreshing distraction from the conversation at hand. Dom and Tate had been grilling me since Gala quieted down after her vision. They acted like I should maybe have some clue as to what she was talking about, but I couldn't even stop to dwell on it. My mind was still reeling from the afternoon's events. I had powers now, which meant I would be able to survive a trip into Keeper territories. I could find my mom. Dom slid a paper plate in front of me, the brownie looking more like a pile of mud than a neat little square. But I didn't dare criticize her for pulling them out of the oven early or cutting into them too soon. Melty, gooey piles of fudge were exactly how I preferred to eat my brownies. I scooped the pile into my mouth, then opened it wide and breathed in and out quickly while fanning with my hand to cool my scalded tongue. Hot? Tate asked with a smirk. I stole his glass of milk and chugged it down with my brownie in three swallows. Better now. Dawn smirked and slid into her seat at the table. Okay, so back to what we were discussing. About the deliverer? Tate asked. No, about Everly's aura. I think that's where we need to begin. We can worry about finding this so-called deliverer later. A groan echoed from the living room. Do I smell brownies? Gala croaked. Dom winked. Told you it would work. Three chairs scooted across a tile in unison as we all went to check on our friend. Gala still lay on the floor, mouth half open and eyes squinting in the light from overhead. She looked like she was going to be sick. How are you feeling? I asked. I'm feeling like I will never swallow another pill in my life. That's probably a good thing. Dom extended a hand, and Gayla's arm still shook as she accepted the help back onto her feet. Do you want a brownie? Not yet. Gayla's nose scrunched. Maybe some water? They were already seated around our small breakfast table when I set the glass of water down in front of Gayla. So you mentioned a deliverer. Tate steepled his fingers, as though he were the CEO of an important meeting in some sky-rise downtown. Who let the hunter in? Everly did. Dom shot me a knowing look. We've got a lot to catch you up on. Like Everly's new white aura? Gayla tilted her head in my direction. See, Dom said to Tate, the aura takes priority. I really think there's something important in the vision, though he argued. Guys, I shouted, through a handful of half-chewed brownie number two. Yes, I am a freak with a white aura, but I've always been a misfit. There's nothing new there, and Gayla's vision was strange, but I don't know that it necessarily matters right now. I swallowed my food, hoping Dom wouldn't be able to read the lie I just told. I think you're all forgetting the most important thing of all. I'm a keeper now, that means we can get out of town and go find where they've got my mom locked up in the territories. All three of my friends began shooting that idea down at once, and I couldn't make out what any of them said as they all spoke over one another. The truth was, I suspected all of this was important and interconnected somehow. I hadn't forgotten my first full day in New York, the day my mom went missing. We were in Russell's gallery, looking at a four-foot-tall picture of me— not the old scarred-up me, the new me, the keeper me, and the plaque under the portrait clearly showed the title, Deliverance. It couldn't have been a coincidence, but trying to piece that mystery all together felt overwhelming. We needed to start with the most basic piece. We had to find my mom. It didn't matter what color my aura was or what Gayla thought she saw. Rescuing my mother was all I could think about. No, I repeated. I've got to find my mom. She could be in danger. Tate looked like he wanted to say something, but he stood instead, moving to refill his milk glass. Dom must have noticed, too. She stared hard in his direction, eyes slightly narrowed. 
I wondered what she was discovering in that mind of his. Finally, Dom turned back to Gala and said, Maybe Tate's right. We should focus on the vision. If there truly is some prophecy that the royalty is trying to erase from history, it might be connected. I clenched my teeth, but Dom continued before I could object. Your aura is different. What if it relates to the prophecy somehow? Maybe that's why your mother was kidnapped. Maybe she knew. There's just too much revolving around you for this to all be a coincidence. She had a point. My mother obviously knew something was different about me. Otherwise, she wouldn't have needed to hide my powers. I wasn't fractured. I was just not like anyone else. Gayla nodded. Yeah, I definitely think the vision was for you, Ev. Why would you think that? She shrugged. Just a strong hunch. This wasn't like the others. This was more visceral. I felt things. I knew things that I couldn't see. It's hard to explain. Try, Tate said, sliding back into his seat. So bossy, Gala grumbled, but she tried anyway. With her eyes closed, she began rubbing her temples, wrinkling her forehead as she lost herself in the memory of the vision. So there was this old man with white hair, or part of it was white anyway. Olympian, then, Dom said. No, I don't think he was. He was definitely crazy, though. How so? I asked. She paused, and her eyelids twitched with movement from underneath. He just sits by the window, mumbling to himself and watching the water. Ocean water or river water or what? Definitely the ocean. And I'm certain he's waiting for you. I thought you said he was waiting for the deliverer. Her eyes flicked open and settled on me. She swallowed and nodded slowly. The others were staring at me as well. Seriously? You think I'm the deliverer? She cocked her head to the side. Yeah, I think maybe you are. Dom's eyes darted back and forth across my face, attempting to gauge my reaction. What does that even mean? I can't change the world. I barely understand how keepers relate to the mortal world at all. And when it comes to powers, I don't even know what exactly I can do. That's why we need to get to the bottom of this prophecy. Tate reached across the table and rested his hand on my arm, effectively lighting me up from wrist to shoulder. I pulled away, risking just a quick glance in his direction to see if he felt it too, but he gave no indication one way or the other. I agree, Dom said. We should definitely look more into the prophecy if we want to have any idea of what you're supposed to do. That's assuming it's more than folklore and that I'm the deliverer it speaks of. I shook my head, still unable to believe anything like that could be true. Right, but I think you've got a point, too. You just got your powers like an hour or two ago, right? Let's allow things to settle and see what you can do. You won't be able to change the world until you at least have a grasp of your own powers. What have you noticed so far? Well... My senses are definitely sharper. I can see further and hear better, and I can see your auras now. I can't see mine, though. I can't see mine either, Gala shrugged. Yeah, I don't think anyone can see their own, so nothing strange there, Dom said. What else? I can swim now, and maybe breathe underwater, or maybe I don't have to breathe underwater anymore. Either way, I'm definitely comfortable staying down there for however long I need to. Yeah, that's Atlantean, all right. But those are just the basics. All descendants of Atlantis could do that. What about teleporting? Your mom was a messenger, right? Right, but I'm not. I tried, and it didn't work. Can you heal, like Millie? Dom stood and walked to the kitchen. I don't know. I haven't tried to... Dom! What are you doing? She'd sliced open her palm with the brownie knife and cupped it to prevent blood from dripping to the floor. I leaped to my feet, but Tate and Gala looked as relaxed as ever, propped lazily on the table. Gala swirled the water with her glass, and Tate just watched me expectantly. Dom extended her hand toward me. 
See if you can heal me. How? I don't know. Just take my hand and think about the wound closing up. I did, trying my best to keep my own hand steady. Her skin was cold, except for the sticky warmth of her blood leaking between her fingers as she settled her hand between my palms. I took a good look at the wound, then closed my eyes and inhaled deeply, thinking of nothing but the sides of her cut coming back together and stitching her wound closed. When I opened them, everyone was staring at me. I slowly lifted my hand from where it covered Dom's, and with a shaky breath, I peered down to find that nothing had changed. It didn't work. That's okay. Dom raised her shoulder. It'll heal in a couple of hours anyway. That's another perk of being a keeper. Healers just make it happen a little faster. So you're not a messenger, and you're not a healer. Can you run fast like Sean? Gala asked. I don't know. I haven't tried. There's energy manipulation, too, Tate said. It's not as common as the others, but it's pretty cool in action. That's an Atlantean thing, too. I don't even know what that would look like. I plopped back down into my chair with a huff and rested my forehead on my arms atop the table. Okay, Dom said. We will definitely get this all figured out, but it doesn't have to be right now. Gala looks like she's going to pass out at any second, and Everly looks like she could use a nap, too. She smells like she could use a shower first, Gala added with a laugh. I shot her a sarcastic look, but then glanced down at my damp, dirty clothes. I probably smelled just like the Long Island Sound and all of its filthy glory. She was right. I needed to get cleaned up. Let's put a pin in this for now. I think I've got an idea brewing so we can discover what Everly is capable of really soon. But in the meantime, nothing that happened here today can leave this room. Got it? Dom looked pointedly at Tate. Got it. Dom nodded, satisfied that he was telling the truth. And Ev, unfortunately, I think we need to keep you hidden until we know what exactly this white aura is all about. Can you promise me not to sneak out or anything until we figure some things out? I promise, I said, and at the time, I meant it. Chapter 26 My heart thumped harder as we stepped through the double glass doors that led into the gym. The air stung with the scent of chlorine, and my thoughts immediately raced back to Clayton, nearly drowning me in the St. A's basement. Logically, I knew that wasn't possible anymore. As an Atlantean, I was an amazing swimmer now. But evidently, my adrenaline hadn't gotten the memo. Can I help you? A man with deep brown skin and muscles that could have easily graced the cover of any men's fitness magazine looked at us with a grin. Gala noticed him as well. She sauntered over to the front desk, tucking a thumb under one of her bikini straps that peeked out of the loose neckline of her tank top. Actually, you can. The man's grin widened, and Dom rolled her eyes as Gala cranked up the charm. We're looking for the pool. I'm sorry, the pool is booked for the next hour and a half, but you're welcome to hang out here until it's available. There's a juice bar around the corner. Dom pushed her way past Gala and set a box of cupcakes on the counter. Muscle Man's eyes widened at the sight of them. We're the ones who booked the pool. You're the birthday party? he asked. Yep. Dom did not look amused. Oh, my apologies. Right this way. He led us down a hall into a large room with walls of glass windows. The real star of the room, however, was an Olympic-sized swimming pool glittering in the middle. Would it be possible to close those blinds? Gala asked sweetly. Afraid not. Corporate doesn't allow that for parties. It's a liability. Close the blinds, Tate said. I felt the harmonies of his words in my bones, and it gave me a little shiver. Yes, of course. The glamoured muscle man responded with a nod and scurried over to the windows, closing the blinds window by window. Dom utilised the time he spent working to set up the cupcakes on a small table off to the side. 
Three colorful helium-filled balloons rose from each corner of the table, wishing some imaginary child a happy birthday. It was genius for her to book this pool for us. There wasn't anywhere else that I'd be able to swim and experiment in the water so freely without the burden of watchful eyes. And there were cupcakes in the deal, which was always a bonus. Muscle Man finished up with the blinds and turned back to Dom, sensing that she was the one in charge. I'll direct the rest of your guests this way as they arrive. There are no more guests, just us. The man glanced nervously between me, Tate, Dom, and Gala, but he knew better than to object. Instead, he nodded and dashed over to the doors, pulling them quickly closed behind him as he exited. You guys didn't have to run him off so quickly, Gala pouted. We don't need him. Dom placed her hands on her hips. All right, Everly, let's see what you can do. With a deep breath, I shimmied out of the shorts and t-shirt that covered my modest one-piece. It covered so much more than the bikini from the St. A's house had, but I still felt exposed. My cheeks heated, and I couldn't bring myself to make eye contact with Tate. The tightening of my chest was enough for me to know he was still there. But as soon as I broke through the surface of the water... All my insecurities just disappeared. The water in the pool was so much clearer than the water of the sound, and my muscles came alive with the freedom to speed and swirl and spin through the water. I raced back and forth down the length of the pool, then decided to skirt around the outer perimeter. Everything about the water felt natural, like this was where I was meant to be. After some time, another body splashed down into the water across the pool. I was by Dom's side in three seconds, emerging from the water with a grin. Holy cow, you weren't kidding. It feels so good, Dom. I can't even begin to describe this feeling. Something drew my attention to Tate, who sat in a chair on the outside of the pool. He watched me closely, amusement glimmering in his golden eyes. Well, you're definitely Atlantean, Gala said with a laugh. She had stripped down to her swimsuit as well and sat on the edge of the pool with her long legs dangling in the water, kicking softly back and forth. Okay, Dom said as she hoisted herself back out of the water on the edge of the pool. Let's see what else you can do. I climbed out as well, no longer embarrassed about my lack of clothing. I felt strong and powerful, and frankly, I didn't care who noticed, though I still didn't look at Tate for too long. He was distracting enough as it was. Dom called me over to the corner of the room and pulled out a stopwatch. All right, I want to see if you've got finesse. I want you to run around the edge of the room as fast as you can. I'll time you to see how your speed compares to the other Atlanteans with finesse. On your mark. Get set. Go. I jolted into action, my bare feet slapping against the wet concrete as I sprinted around the perimeter of the room, ignoring all the signs that said, Please walk, in giant red letters. I took the first corner, definitely moving more quickly than I'd ever run before, and I wasn't feeling very winded either. This was incredible. If I had finesse, I would likely end up as a guardian, like Sean, though I supposed I could still be a messenger under the right circumstances. What else could these powerful muscles do? I remembered Sean mentioning once that he could run faster and jump higher. I decided to try that as well, just as I was coming around the third corner of the room. With one final surge of power through my legs, I jumped into the air, jumping as high and far as I could. I landed gracefully on my feet, feeling especially feline, as I came to a stop inches away from the hard chest that stood like a wall in front of me. Time, Dom yelled. I refilled my lungs with air and gave Tate a quick smirk before turning my attention back to Dom. So, how did I do? I swaggered over to where she and Gala stood, feeling exhilarated and ready to bite into my gold medal. Well, you're definitely faster than you used to be. You'd blow mortals out of the water. I gave Tate a quick wink over my shoulder. But for an Atlantean, you were exceptionally... Slow, Tate winked back, 
and I felt my ego go tumbling down. Okay, then, so I can't teleport, I'm not a healer, and I clearly have no finesse. What does that leave? Energy manipulation, Tate said, rubbing his hands together. Definitely the coolest Atlantean power. But also the rarest. Dom didn't sound convinced. Well, tell me what to do. How does one manipulate energy? I knew a guy once who could make the lights turn on and off with his mind. Try that, Tate suggested. Ooh, and I had a friend back in Connecticut whose mom could alter kinetic energy. Any moving object was under her control. It was amazing, except for when we tried to sneak out to go to Dion Miller's house party and she stopped our car at the bottom of the driveway, Gayla chuckled. Okay, you're right, it sounds awesome, but I still have no idea how to make any of that happen. Do I just blink my eyes or wriggle my nose and poof? Dom frowned. I think you probably would have noticed something like that happening before now. It's kind of beyond your control. We don't learn how to create our powers. We learn to control them. The powers manifest on their own. So you're saying I probably can't do anything like that? Yeah, unfortunately. So what Atlantean powers are left then? Our small group shifted gazes back and forth, each of us waiting for someone else to answer. Finally, it was Gala who spoke. I think we need to call Sean. No, Tate and I spoke in unison. Wait, I said, why don't you want Sean getting involved? I just think we need to keep everything surrounding you and your powers under wraps until we know more about that aura. He's right, Dom said. But why are you against calling Sean? He's assigned to be my guardian right now. The only way I've kept him out of our apartment for the last couple of days is by telling him I had the flu. Once he knows I've got my powers, he'll need to report back to the council. Plus, I looked down at my feet. I'm afraid he'll try to talk me out of searching for my mom. He's not the only one, Tate said. Cutting you loose in keeper territories is about the worst idea I can think of. Well, standing around here isn't getting us anywhere. I marched over to the table and snatched a chocolate cupcake from the box. Gala joined me a moment later. It's going to be okay, Ev. I promise we haven't forgotten about your mom. We'll find her. You say that, but so far we haven't done a single thing to get her back. It's like everyone else has just moved on. It's not true. If it's important to you, it's important to me. I will... Her voice trailed off and her hands froze in place, the cupcake wrapper in her fingers only half pulled away from the cake. Gala? I waved my hand in front of her face. Guys! Dom and Tate jerked their attention to me, pulling themselves out of whatever kind of private discussion they'd been engaged in. Something's going on with Gala. Her eyes darkened, the whites disappearing as she stared off into a distant nothing. She was having a vision. Dom rushed over to my side, and together we lowered her to the ground. We'd seen enough now to know that Gala's visions typically ended in tremors. Tate slid a folded-up towel under her head, and we waited. Then we waited some more. About five minutes passed, with none of us making a sound, when finally Gala's features softened and her eyes returned to their normal warm brown. She sat up, rubbing her head. That was weird. Was it a vision? You didn't say anything. Yeah, sort of. She turned toward me. Your crazy old man is getting impatient. Well, did he tell you where I could find him? Because I'm still pretty clueless about the whole thing. He's in a lighthouse. A lighthouse where? Tate asked. Gala raised a shoulder. In the cleft of a rock? Not helpful, Dom said. It's more than we knew before, Gala said. And Everly... This mess is definitely tied in with your mom somehow. I don't know how I know, but I do. 
I can feel it. I squeezed my friend's hand. Thank you, I mouthed the words, but no noise came out. Now, where did my cupcake go? Gala stood and eyed me suspiciously before grinning and grabbing the half-open dessert from where we'd laid it on the table. I need to hurry and eat it before my training. You're supposed to meet with Russell today? Dom asked her. Yeah, I was anyway. But if there's some reason I shouldn't, I'm all ears. I hate these meetings. Given your last couple of visions, I'm thinking maybe it would be a good time to catch Everly's imaginary flu, Tate said. You don't want him hearing anything you might mutter in a vision right now. My flu is very contagious, I added. You know, I am feeling a little under the weather. Gala fake coughed into the crook of her elbow and then shoved half the cupcake into her mouth. I'll send him a text. And I guess I'll go back to Millie's and see if I can learn anything additional about my mom's powers. Maybe there was more to them than most people knew. I don't think that's a good idea, Dom said. Millie likes to play by the books. If she realizes your powers have come in, she'll report you to the council even faster than Sean would. Not if my aura might put me in danger. Millie wouldn't want me to get hurt. Dom frowned. I wouldn't risk it. Well, I don't have any other options, unless you know where some old man is hiding in a lighthouse in the cleft of a rock. Look, I'll be careful to avoid her. I just need to find some old journals or something. There's got to be information about my heritage somewhere in that library of hers. Just be careful. Chapter 27 Tate volunteered to drive me over to Millie's place, but we didn't talk much. I was unable to think of anything other than the way the air seemed to sizzle along that invisible string between us, and he... Well, I don't know for sure what he was thinking, but he was definitely lost in thought. He slowed the car to a stop in front of Millie's townhouse and finally turned to me. I might know a way to keep your aura disguised, but I'm going to have to practice it first. It's not a technique I've had to use before. Until then, please try to stay out of sight of any keepers, especially your aunt. I'll do my best. I'm going to stay close by, so send me a text as soon as you're ready to go. We definitely don't want you walking around on the streets. I will. And Everly? My heart fluttered at the sound of my name coming from his lips. I hoped he didn't notice. Be careful. His mouth twitched like he wanted to say more, but nothing else came out. I nodded and tugged on the door handle, quickly rushing from his car to my Aunt Millie's front door. I didn't notice any other keepers out on the street, but there was no telling who might be lurking in the shadows or watching from windows. You'd think that being practically immortal would give me courage, but instead it only made me more paranoid. Once inside, I leaned my head back against the door and took a moment to just breathe. The past couple of days had been a whirlwind and somehow my guardian had become a guy I was now trying to avoid, and my hunter had become my new guardian. The thought of it almost made me laugh. Tate had once wanted my soul so badly that he enlisted the help of friends from across the country to help bring me near the brink of death. But now I truly believed he only wanted to help me get to the bottom of my mysteries. There was no way Dom would have allowed him to hang around if he still wanted me dead. Not that he could kill me now, anyway. In fact, if the feeling that buzzed between the two of us was mutual at all, I would guess he wanted quite the opposite of getting me dead. Oh, I know that face. Jeeves appeared from around the corner with a grin. His Alabama twang came out even stronger when he was teasing me. Where have you been lately? I shrugged, trying to play it cool. Uh, you know, school, work, my new apartment, nothing too interesting. Other than discovering I'm an immortal with strange and unidentifiable powers. Oh, and also maybe the subject of a prophecy that could irrevocably change the world as we know it. Uh-huh. And does nothing interesting include tall, dark, and handsome out there who still hasn't pulled away from the curb? 
I peeked through the four-year window, and sure enough, Tate still sat in the car, tapping his thumb on the steering wheel and staring off into space. A flush crept its way up my neck, and Jeeves looked pleased as punch. He laughed. Come on, heartbreaker. Let's see if Pierre has anything good to eat in there. He gestured for me to follow him into the kitchen. Oh, thanks, but I'm not staying here long. I just need to run upstairs and grab something from Millie's library. Jeeves pouted. Okay, but try to stop by more often. We never get to see you anymore. I will, I promise, just as soon as things settle down. The sound of claws clicking across the hard floor announced the arrival of my other two giant hairy friends who resided at Millie's place. Tiny Tim and Lemon Drop, her English mastiffs, gave me slobbery greetings of their own. I patted their heads, scratching Tiny Tim for a moment in the spot behind his ear that he loved so much. And I will see more of you guys, too, I said in a high tone with my lips pushed out. Then I dashed up the stairs toward Millie's library. The room was quiet, and the sunshine filtering in through the window gave me a sense of calm. I stood in the center of the room, amazed by how well I could make out the titles of the books that lined her shelves without having to step any nearer. There were some real perks to these Atlantean senses, but I didn't expect to find any old personal journals on her bookshelves. No, those would likely be hidden away in a more secure location, but where? Millie's desk was a most likely location. I made for it, but stopped halfway across the room when I heard a fluttering noise from outside the window. My owl! I hadn't seen him since he stopped time for me back at the cargo dock, right before my powers emerged. I needed to thank him for that. And yes, I knew how crazy the thought was, but something told me he'd understand. The window was sealed shut, and there was no way I'd be able to get it open. Coming to the same conclusion, I watched my feathery friend fly down and around to the small courtyard on the back side of Millie's townhouse. He would no doubt wait for me there. The dogs were sitting with their chins on their paws outside of the library door, not satisfied with the small number of snuggles they'd received from me. They joined me on the stairs, stepping in front of me on my way down, trying to block my movement so I would stop and pay them more attention. Hang on, guys. I'll be right back. But of course they didn't listen. They lacked the intelligence of my owl. I sneaked past the kitchen, where Jeeves was reading something at the counter, and made my way to the French doors leading out to the courtyard. Just as my fingers wrapped around the handle, I heard the front door of the townhouse open as well. I slipped out the doors as quickly and quietly as I could, gluing myself to the outer wall of the building and straining with all my might to hear who just entered the house but it didn't take much straining to make out the sing-songy cadence of Millie's chipper words. Hey, Jeeves, we just thought we'd grab some lunch and take the afternoon off. You guys have enough to feed a couple more? Shoot. I prayed Jeeves wouldn't say anything about me being here. You bet we do. Everly is here, too. Well, that was just perfect. Thanks a lot, Jeeves. She's upstairs in the library he added. Wonderful. I'll go change clothes and see if she wants to join us. I'll wait here with Jeeves, a third voice said. I knew that voice, but I couldn't place it right away. What are you doing? The voice sounded as clear as the horns blaring on the road in front of the townhouse. I startled and spun back around to face the courtyard. My owl perched calmly on the fence between the patio and the small green area beyond it. No one else was around. Did you? No, that was impossible. Did I ask you a question? Yes. Now don't be rude. Answer me. I know you can hear me now, and it's about time, too. You've got to be kidding me. The owl blinked. Twice. You're not kidding? Nope and I've been waiting 2,700 years to be heard again. Do you know how hard it is to shout into a void for multiple millennia? 
I glanced around the courtyard, searching for a camera and half expecting Gala to jump out and laugh about another successful prank. But it was just me and the owl. I think I'm losing my mind. You and me both, honey. Now are you going to tell me who you're hiding from? My Aunt Millie. I'm not ready to reveal my new, the, situation to her just yet. Am I really talking to an owl right now? It's so frustrating that you don't remember. Remember what? Never mind. More importantly, if you're wanting to hide, I suggest you do something about those monsters. Tiny Tim and Lemon Drop let out loud whines on the other side of the glass doors. The bird was right. They were going to draw attention. I released a sigh and pulled open the doors, hoping they might quiet down out here with us. Nope, that was a bad idea. Ew, call these smelly beasts down. The owl flapped a few feet into the air as the pair of canines rushed over and lifted their front paws onto the fence. Tiny started barking when the owl moved, which worked Lemon Drop up into a tizzy as well. Shh, it's okay. Come here, sweet pups. Sweet. Those mangy creatures are about as sweet as... The door opened again behind me, cutting the owl's words, or thoughts, maybe, short. There you are. I turned to face the familiar voice I'd heard earlier and found Devon grinning at me. A quick look over my shoulder revealed that my owl had flown away upon Devon's arrival. Millie went upstairs to look for you. We're about to eat lunch if you want to join us. He paused, and his eyes narrowed a fraction of an inch. Hey, something seems different about you. He tilted his head to examine me further. Nope, everything is fine. Can't stay for lunch, though. Gotta run. I tried to squeeze past him and back into the house, but he stepped in front of me before I could make it very far. Wait, your aura. Did you get your powers? No, that's not right. It's... I slapped my hand over his mouth before he could finish. Shh! I yanked him out of the clear glass doorway and pushed him up against the wall. Devon, I need you to promise me you will keep your mouth shut if I drop my hand. Do you understand? He nodded, eyes wide. Good. I slowly dropped my hand, but he began to speak as soon as his lips were free. I quickly covered him up again. Get off, he mumbled against the inside of my hand. You promised you wouldn't speak. Okay, okay, he mumbled again. But when I dropped my hand a second time, he let out a quiet, Sheesh. Listen, this is really important. I know you're in love with my aunt or whatever, but I need you to keep this aura thing a secret for now. From her and everyone else, too, including Sean. Why? It's a lot to explain, but... Wait, you can teleport, right? Yeah, so? So how far are you able to go? As far as I want, as long as I'm familiar with the location. Would a picture and a map be enough? Maybe. Excellent. I nodded, a grin slowly working its way across my face. All right, as your future niece, I have an enormous request. I will tell you all about the aura, but first, I need you to help me find a lighthouse. Chapter 28 Are you sure we can trust him? Dom crossed her arms over her chest and leaned back against the kitchen counter. Tate had been scowling since he picked me up from Millie's house. Gayla was the only person who wasn't furious with me for getting caught by Devon. No, I'm not sure. I barely know the guy. But my aunt sure seems to think highly of him, and despite being her soulmate, he didn't reveal my secret to her, at least not before I left the house. I hope you're right. Millie is best friends with Claudia, and if Claudia finds out about some new white aura, you're screwed. She won't hesitate to report it to the council. Her husband has been on thin ice with them lately, and she'll do anything to get him back into their good graces. Sean's dad is on thin ice? Why? I hadn't seen Claudia in a few weeks, not since Sean and I first met Gayla and Dom in the Hamptons. But the little I knew of her seemed right in line with what Dom described. 
She didn't seem too happy to have Sean involved with a potentially fractured soul, even before I started getting myself into trouble. If it weren't for Millie, Claudia would have reported me long ago. I'm not sure. I just heard they were keeping a closer eye on him, Dom said. You heard as in someone told you that, or did you read it in someone's mind? The means by which I acquire my information are unimportant. Dom waved her hand in the air as if shooing the question away. Dom gets all the juicy gossip straight from the source, Gayla said, tapping her temple with one finger. A knock sounded from the door. I bet that's him. I jumped up from my seat to let Devon in. He'd agreed to meet us here after lunch, and I told him we'd fill him in on the details if he would help us out. Another impatient knock pounded on the door just before I pulled it open, and the moment I turned the knob, Sean came barreling through. Looks like your flu is gone, Everly. It was difficult not to wither under his stern glare. Devon slinked in behind him, casting me an apologetic look. Apology not accepted. You had one job, I growled at Devon. Come to my apartment without telling anyone. Why was that so difficult? A better question, Sean pointed at me, is why you've been lying to me for the past several days. Why didn't you just tell me you got your pa? He paused, only just noticing my aura. Your powers, he finished softly. I'm sorry, Devon said, but I knew Sean would kill me if he found out I was getting involved with you guys behind his back. Plus, if this is as important as you seem to think it is, having a little finesse on our side will be helpful. But you didn't tell Millie? I chewed the inside of my lip, hoping with everything I had that he at least kept our bargain there. No. Devon's mouth pulled into a frown. I wanted to, and I probably will at some point, but I can't bear to see her hurting or stressed over this until we know for sure what's going on. Now, tell me about this aura and why you're searching for a lighthouse. The guys followed me into the living room, and Sean stopped in front of the couch where Tate sat, not even attempting to hide his glare. What is he doing here? Tate was with me when my powers emerged. He saved me from Osborne and rushed me back to the apartment. Plus, he's the only one who seems to know anything about the prophecy. Prophecy? Devon settled cross-legged on the floor in front of our coffee table. Ooh, this is getting good. Dom filled them in on Gala's vision and how we thought it could be related to the prophecy Tate overheard when he was younger. Then Gala let them know she thought it might all tie back in with my mother's disappearance somehow as well. I allowed them to answer the questions and fill in all the blanks. I'd gone over all the details enough, and I was already busy with the next step of our puzzle anyway. As soon as Sean and Devon seemed to have a good grasp on the whole situation, I spun my laptop around and pointed at a list I'd made in a spreadsheet. What's that? Sean asked. This is a list of lighthouses near here, I said with a triumphant grin. I've linked to maps and images, so Devon can pop in and out easily. It's not a comprehensive list by any means, but I figured it would be enough to get us started. You want me to just pop in and out of lighthouses all along the coast? Yeah, I shrugged. You can do that, right? Well, I can do a few at a time, but teleporting takes a lot out of a person. I only have so much energy to use. Besides, I don't even know what I'm looking for. How will I know if I found the right one? There will be an old man there, hiding in the cleft of a rock, Gala said. Right. Devon rubbed at the back of his neck. I heard, but I'm not sure that's enough to go on. It's going to have to be, for now anyway. I gave my best attempt at big round puppy dog eyes to soften him up. Okay, but can we start tomorrow? Millie is probably already wondering where I am. I don't think... Yes. Dom interrupted, shooting me a sideways glance. Tomorrow will be great. Can everyone meet here after lunch? Mumbles of agreement echoed out through the living room, and all the guys stood to leave. Tate hung back for another second, though, pulling me off to the side. I think I figured out the whole disguising your aura trick, 
I'm going to head down to the library tomorrow morning to see if I can find out anything else about the prophecy. Do you want to come? I can practice hiding you. Yes, I said too quickly. I mean, if you're sure you'll be able to keep me hidden. Great. I'll do a practice run before we leave, just to be sure. Meet you here at nine? It's a date. My cheeks warmed. I mean, not a date, but... Tate grinned. See you in the morning. I watched him leave, my stomach rolling with an anxious excitement. By this time tomorrow, there was a good chance we might be visiting with some supposedly crazy old man in a lighthouse, learning about my true destiny as a deliverer or whatever. More importantly, I might finally be able to see my mom again soon. Dom nudged me, shaking me out of my stupor. I'd keep my distance with him if I were you. From who, Tate? He's harmless now that he can't kill me and extract my soul. I certainly wouldn't call him harmless. Why? Do you know something I don't? Dom pursed her lips, and I suspected she knew plenty that she wasn't telling me. I can't be certain, but I think he knows something about your mom. What? I grabbed her arm. Tell me everything you heard. She pulled her arm away, gently. That's just it. I didn't exactly hear anything. But Tate is good. He knows how to hide his thoughts, or at least beguile to the point where I can't perceive them clearly. But I can't shake the sense that he isn't telling you everything he knows. And are you telling me everything you know? I paused, realizing the question came out a lot like an accusation. But it seemed like everyone was better informed than me. And once again, they weren't exactly racing in to lift me out of my ignorance. Not even Dom. I would tell you if I knew more about your mom, I promise. I don't know any more about where she might be than you do. That wasn't exactly what I asked, but it was all the answer I needed. Dom wasn't giving me the whole story. But why? And who was she protecting? Chapter 29 Gayla stumbled out of her room the next morning with a messy top knot balancing high on her head and a sleepy grin. Do you prefer Taterly or Evate? I'm having a hard time settling on your new couple name. You are ridiculous. I pulled a light jacket off the hook near our door. The mornings were already beginning to cool off here in New York, though it would probably still hit a hundred degrees back in Oklahoma. That was one thing I didn't miss about home. And those are both awful. Lucky for you, we're not in a relationship, so you don't have to come up with anything better. Uh-huh. Keep telling yourself that. But I don't think Tate's done hunting you at all. She winked and leaned against her bedroom door frame. You better get downstairs or you're going to be ever late. I snorted out a laugh. All right, that one's pretty good. I thought so too, she grinned. You two kids have fun. Don't do anything I would do. Ha, trust me, I won't. I'll see you guys after lunch. I pushed open the door and let out a little squeak of surprise to find Tate standing there in the hallway. My face warmed, realizing he'd probably heard us talking about him. Perfect timing. His crooked grin warmed me even more. He was almost unbearably good-looking. I just walked up. Gayla's soft giggle trickled out as I shut the door behind me. All right, I said, turning back to Tate. So, let's hear this plan you have to disguise my aura. We will definitely talk about that, but first, coffee. He extended his arm and handed me a hot drink from the honey pot. Our fingers brushed as I accepted the cup, sending a familiar tingle down my arm. I inhaled the aroma of warm vanilla and espresso with just a touch of something that reminded me of home. What is this? It's a cinnamon vanilla latte. I heard it was your favorite. It is. Thank you. I closed my eyes and breathed it in again, and when I opened them, I caught Tate smiling down at me. Maybe Gala was right. Could this be the beginning of something? Or was I being manipulated, like Dom suggested? 
Wiping the grin from my face, I decided to push away any tender feelings that may be brewing between us and get down to business. All right, so how are we going to hide me? Well, we're not going to hide you exactly. We're just going to hide your aura. I've been looking into it, and I should be able to cover you in a glamour that would hide the aura from everyone else. He pushed the elevator button, and we stepped inside, each of us gluing ourselves to opposite walls. Yep, he definitely felt that same strange connection I did. But you'll still have to be careful. You'll have to stay close to me, because the glamour will weaken with too much distance. And if another skilled siren comes along, they may be able to see through it. Got it. I extended my arms to the sides. Well, cover me up. Let's see if it works. Tate mumbled some incoherent whisper of words, and his eyes flared into a warm golden light. I felt nothing, aside from the usual buzz of energy I got from him. But there was no glamour worm in my head or any strange compulsion pushing me forward. Everything felt normal. I released a breath. Did it work? He inclined his head toward me and a muscle twitched at the corner of his mouth. Of course it worked. The elevator dinged open and I hesitantly followed him into the lobby. It was mostly empty, with a couple of mortals standing off to one side. But there was no way for me to verify if my aura was actually hidden from other keepers. I couldn't see it myself. Just to confirm, no one is going to notice anything strange, right? Tate held the front door open for me. Right. Just act normal. That was easier said than done. I found myself scanning the streets like a guilty criminal, just waiting to be caught by the first keeper who passed us by. It didn't take long before we strolled past a group of Columbia students, a mix of Atlanteans and an Olympian. Two of them cast casual glances in our direction, but there was no indication that they noticed anything off. You can relax. Tate gently touched the small of my back, and his whisper sent a thrill down my spine. I shivered a bit, and he pulled his hand away. I've got you covered. I would just have to trust him. Finally, we reached the Butler Library and quietly made our way through the gorgeous stacks of books. The library was one of my favorite places on campus. It held an old-world charm with towering windows and columns and giant ringed chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, and there were more books than I could ever dream of reading. We took the stairs, hoping to avoid any other Agarthian sirens who may be studying in the building. Once we were alone in the stairwell, I finally felt comfortable enough to probe a bit into Tate's motives. Why are you so interested in this prophecy anyway? He didn't seem bothered by the question at all, as he spun around the fourth floor landing and continued upward through the building. Because I never believed it could be real. I've been told it's just folklore my entire life. If it's real, the whole world could change. It seemed like an honest answer. Is that why you're being so nice to me lately, buying me my favorite coffee and whatnot? You think I'm the deliverer? He paused, and I nearly ran into the back of him. Slowly looking over his shoulder, he set his jaw before finally speaking. I was only hunting you before because it was my job. There's no need for me to distance myself now that I can't have your soul. And are you disappointed that you can't have my soul? He quirked a brow and started to say something, but stopped. Then he was moving up the stairs again. I'm interested to see what it means for my position moving forward. I wouldn't say I'm disappointed, just curious. I wasn't sure how not retrieving my soul could possibly affect his position, but the thought was secondary to what I really wanted to know. You were there the day my mom went missing at the gallery. Yeah. He pulled open a door to the sixth floor, and I followed him through, dropping my voice now that we were in the midst of other keepers again. Do you know anything more about where she might be? Hello. An Atlantean girl with a pretty almost turquoise aura unknowingly interrupted me as she glanced up from a desk outside of the rare book and manuscript library. 
She nodded at Tate, then pinned me with a hard stare. I'm afraid the reading room is open by appointment only. She's with me, Tate said. The girl shook her head. Appointment only, she repeated. Tate dropped his voice to a whisper, though no one else was around. She's Atlantean. She just hasn't gotten her powers yet. The girl's eyes narrowed, and my heart thudded against my chest under her scrutinous gaze. I don't... It's fine, Tate said, the melodies of his voice dancing together in a song I didn't want to end. The girl nodded and allowed us to enter the reading room. Did you glamour her? I had to. You Atlanteans can be really uptight with the rules sometimes. She's not supposed to allow mortals into the room, and I didn't think she would budge without a little encouragement. Why aren't mortals allowed in here? The room wasn't terribly impressive, though it was obvious we were surrounded by some incredibly valuable pieces of history. Because of this? Tate stepped between two stacks of books and placed his hands on either side of a glass case holding an old oil painting. No one outside of the reading room could see us between the stacks, and we were the only people within the room. He slid his hands down the edges of the case until he found whatever it was he was looking for. With a small creak, the entire wall panel lurched forward like a hidden doorway, and Tate gestured for me to go ahead. Stepping through to the other side was like entering a whole new world. The dusty-smelling reading room behind us couldn't compare to the life that buzzed on the other side of the wall. It was an enormous room, hidden in the center of the building, with massively high-arched ceilings and exquisite details carved into the rich woodwork of the moldings. Two-story shelves created short aisles down the sides of the large room, and cozy nooks with armchairs, desks, or tables occupied the spaces between the rows. The whole room felt alive, and there wasn't another mortal in sight. Clusters of keeper students gathered in many of the nooks, working together on projects and quietly quizzing one another in their studies. None of them looked up at us as we made our way through the room. The only person who seemed to notice us at all was an Olympian girl sitting behind the massive desk in the center of the space. She appeared to be a point of contact for anyone who had questions, and she stumbled over her response to an Agarthian boy as her eyes settled on me and Tate. He quickly shoved me into an empty nook, out of the girl's sight. Sit here, he said, pointing to an empty table. Pretend you're studying. Don't speak to anyone or look up from this book until I get back. I'm going to explain ourselves to Lydia. She definitely saw you come in. Did she see my aura? No, that's not the problem. I could get into major trouble if she reports me for bringing a mortal into the keeper's library. I'll let her know you're Atlantean. You just stay here. I slid into my seat, eyeing the book Tate had randomly pulled off of one of the shelves for me to pretend to study. Arbitration, settling disputes across keeper races. My eyes crossed before I even got to the end of the title. Surely there had to be something a little more interesting for me to read until Tate got back. Since no one else was around my little hiding nook, I decided to take just a quick moment to scan the shelves for a different book. I wouldn't go far, just the shelves immediately bordering my table. That was my plan, anyway, until I heard Osborne on the other side of the stacks. Chapter 30 I froze, unsure if I should stay put or run. She wasn't in the sound. We searched the bottom for hours, and there's only one other way she could have gotten out. Where'd you put her? Osborne's harsh tone sent a chill down my spine. I didn't put her anywhere, Tate said. His voice was closer to a whisper, and I had to lean in to hear him. Well, I know her soul wasn't taken back to the hall. I let the others know about it, too. I told them you had the chance to take it, and you let her get away. If I'd had the chance to take it, I would have. I don't want her alive any more than you do. A nearly silent gasp slipped through my lips. I couldn't be sure if Tate was telling him the truth or just trying to get Osborne off of his back, but the words stung. 
and though I tried not to make a sound, Tate must have heard me, or at least sensed my presence. I've got to go. The last word was laced with that ethereal sound that only a siren could make. Are you trying to glamour me, you fool? Osborne growled. No, he glamoured me. I had no choice but to walk away from the stacks. Tate's voice still sang out in the back of my mind. I knew I was under his control, and I couldn't resist. I left their quiet exchange behind and strolled to the end of the aisle, unsure of where to go next. Keepers flitted to and fro across my vision. This part of the library was busy, full of these beautiful god-like creatures immersed in their own individual studies. Lydia, the girl at the desk, looked briefly in my direction. Her mouth was a hard-set line, but she said nothing. I could feel the tingle of Tate's presence dancing across my skin, so I knew he was still near. I also knew better than to be seen by Osborne, which left me in quite a predicament. I couldn't stay close to Tate, but I couldn't drift too far from him either, or everyone else would notice my aura. What did that leave? I figured my safest bet would be to stay hidden back between the shelves of the aisles. As long as I kept note of where Osborne stood, I could avoid him with rows of books between us and still hopefully maintain the glamour over my aura. Pulling the hood of my jacket over my head, I dipped down and around the corner nearest the wall. The first aisle was full of law books, something I should probably study up on at some point now that I was officially a keeper. But the next aisle was far more interesting. It was a history section, the largest I'd ever seen. There were books covering every time period throughout every nation. Titles before me read of Agarthian families of Australia in the 1400s, hundreds of years before it would be established as a country by mortals. My fingers twitched, eager to discover the secrets kept within those pages, but now was not the time for history lessons. I continued down the aisle, moving until I felt the tingle in my blood begin to fade. Tate had commanded me to go away from where he and Osborne spoke, but this was as far as I could go without losing the disguising glamour for my aura. There was no one else around. I leaned in, straining my ears, but I could no longer hear Tate or Osborne. I appeared to be alone, and yet I couldn't shake the sense that I wasn't. Almost beyond any perception I had the words to describe, I knew someone was close— and it felt as though they were watching me. No, you're being paranoid. Tate's glamour held strong. As long as he was near, no one would be able to discern that I was different. Physically shaking the feeling off, I browsed the books lining the shelves before me. Most on this shelf bore titles from the colonial period of United States history. One stood out from the others, however. It was called The Fractured Souls of Salem. Without a second thought, I yanked the book from the shelf, quickly flipping it open to discover my suspicion was true. According to this book, the Salem witch trials were held against real fractured souls. Excitement fluttered in my chest. I wasn't fractured, I knew that now. But the thought of these individuals roaming the earth still fascinated me. After all, Tate's entire life revolved around locating them and extracting their souls— I wanted to know more. With the book held tightly to my chest, I spun around to find some dark corner where I could read until Tate reappeared or broke the glamour keeping me away from him. I couldn't drop my guard completely, but I may as well take the time to learn more about Keeper history while I waited, right? It sounded like a good plan anyway. But as I stepped toward the nook at the back of the aisle, I noticed something move in the shadows— I halted, straining my ears and eyes, extending every improved sense I had to see who or what may have been lurking in the back of my aisle. But there was nothing there. Nothing but the sense of danger that tickled at my nerve endings. It was probably wise to go with that unnamed sense. I moved away from the shadows, back toward the center of the library. I could barely feel Tate at all when I stepped out from between the shelves and I quickly dashed back into the first aisle I'd hidden in, surrounded by the law books. The tingle was weak, 
but it was definitely stronger here than it was in the middle. Everly Gordon? A soft female voice called out from behind me. I turned to see Lydia standing at the edge of her desk in the center of the room. She held an old textbook and watched me expectantly. Yes? I didn't want to meet her in the center. It was too far from Tate, and standing in the middle of an enormous room packed full of keepers was the last place I wanted to reveal my new aura. I glanced nervously over my shoulder, hoping to see him coming around the corner to help me out, but I was still alone. I have your book ready here. The textbook she held was turned away from me, obscuring its title. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. I didn't reserve any books. She extended her arms. I was told this was for you. That's all I know. We stared one another down for a moment. I didn't want to go to her, away from the protection of Tate's glamour, but she was clearly not going to bring the book to me. Swallowing down my fear, I dashed forward, nabbed the book from her outstretched hands, and dashed back into my little nook, barely grunting a thanks as I left her standing alone near her desk. Hopefully the movement was too fast for anyone to notice my aura. Pulling the hood of my jacket securely back up over my head, I settled into my seat at the table where Tate had first left me and examined my new book, pushing the one about Salem to the side. The textbook was old, and I rubbed a thin layer of grime from the cover with the heel of my hand. Its title read, The Rise and Fall of the Manticoreans. I'd never heard of them. Glancing up to ensure that I was still alone, I felt the tingle of Tate grow stronger. He was coming back. That was good. I flipped open the textbook, content to learn more until Tate was back. Scanning quickly through the introduction, I learned that the Manticoreans were a group established in the Middle Ages with one goal, to relieve the keepers of their power. What? Why would the librarian girl give me this? I flipped through the pages, allowing them to quickly fall until a natural break opened the book wider about halfway through. A note was tucked into the pages, with my name written on it. The handwriting was small and otherworldly, slanted with odd-shaped but smooth lettering. I unfolded the note and read the brief message inside. I have the answers you seek. Meet me at St. John the Divine tonight at midnight to learn more. R. I flipped the note over, looking to see if there was something I may have missed, but there was nothing else. My skin was alive now. Tate would be coming around the corner any second, so this little mystery would have to wait until later. Slipping the note back into the crack of the book, I noticed which chapter it had bookmarked. Rasputin, the fallen keeper's attempted revival. My chest ached with the intense pounding of my heart. Was this from him? Everly, thank goodness you're still here. I slammed the book closed and tucked it into my bag at the sound of Tate's voice. We've got to get you out of here, now. We'll have to look into the prophecy another day when Osborne's not sniffing around for you. Chapter 31 Devon visited exactly six lighthouses before his body was trembling with weakness. Are you sure you can't try one more? I asked, scrolling through the list in my spreadsheet. I've got a good feeling about this next one. Everly, Dom scolded. Give him a break. She turned to Devon. Thank you again for searching for us. You have no idea how much we appreciate it. No problem. It's definitely flexing my teleportation muscles. He cracked his knuckles. I'm sorry I can't do more, but it seems to drain my energy faster when I'm going to a place I've never actually been to in person before. We understand, she smiled warmly. When do you think you'll be up for another round? Tate asked. He was almost as anxious about finding the old man from Gala's vision as I was, though for different reasons. Tate was becoming slightly obsessed about the prophecy. I just wanted to find my mom. I can try again tonight, maybe? Devon looked doubtful. Tomorrow will be fine. Dom stood, bringing the discussion to a quick end. 
No need to force too much on the first day. But there are 700 lighthouses on this list. I turned my screen back to face the others. And you won't be able to discover what is in any of them if you deplete our messenger of every ounce of energy in his body. Dom put her hands on her hips and then turned back to Devon. Get some rest tonight, and we'll meet back here tomorrow afternoon. Tate's eyes found mine, his expression thoughtful, as though he was checking to see if I was okay with Dom's call. The process was painstakingly slow for me, but I would be all right. There was another secret burning a hole in the bag on my bedroom desk. I would occupy myself with the Rasputin mystery until Devon could try for the lighthouses again. Do you guys want to go to the honey pot with us? Sean asked, trying to smooth over the tension in the air. They've got half-priced baklava until four o'clock. No, thanks. I was already halfway to my bedroom door. But you guys have fun. I'll see you tomorrow. I shut the door behind me and dashed over to my desk, carefully pulling out the book I'd been given at the library and re-examining the note inside. I hadn't mentioned it to Tate. He had been so wound up after his encounter with Osborne that he was mostly silent on our way back to the apartment. And my pulse didn't slow down until we'd gotten safely back inside. I'd practically sprinted away from the library once I knew the coast was clear. I still couldn't believe Tate's glamour had held and Osborne never found me. It almost seemed too good to be true. At first I thought maybe Osborne had given Lydia the book for me. It seemed just like him to set up a trap like that and lure me away from my friends. But if he'd known I was in the library, I don't think he would have had the willpower to keep himself from taking me captive right then and there. So it couldn't have been him. But if it wasn't Osborne, that meant it had to have been Rasputin himself, which left me with so many questions my head was spinning. How would he know who I was, and why would he care? I wasn't fractured. I wasn't anyone of importance. It should have been easy to dismiss the whole thing as a prank, but the note said he had the answers I sought, and if there was any chance that he knew something about where my mom was held, I had to give it a shot. I pored over the pages of the old textbook for the next several hours, stopping only to grab a sandwich from the kitchen for dinner. I told the girls I was busy studying, which wasn't exactly a lie. It was close enough to the truth to get past Dom's radar anyway. And in my reading, I learned that the Manticoreans were established thousands of years ago in the Middle East. They were comprised of humans, keepers who had betrayed their races, and fractured souls who all shared a single goal, removing the keepers from power. According to the book, back in the days when magical creatures still roamed the Earth's surface, the Manticoreans had used dark magic to cobble together a beast whose sole purpose was to kill any keeper who crossed its path. The beast, a manticore, thrived on the magic of the keepers it consumed. It was named a man-eater, though it didn't eat mortals. Only the most powerful Olympians, Atlanteans, and Agarthians it encountered. Each keeper it consumed strengthened it just enough to obliterate its next meal. The beast lived for hundreds of years, but it never even made a dent in the power structure of the keepers. They fought back. At one point, there were armies on both sides. All of the keeper races fought against the Manticoreans, and even with a few fallen keepers in their ranks, they were never a strong enough match. Eventually, the beast was killed and the Manticoreans dissolved. That's where Rasputin came into play. Rasputin was an Agarthian who left the Keepers to live in the mortal world. He never hid his powers from the mortals, instead using them to rise in the ranks of the Russian Empire. And all the while, he used his notoriety to re-establish a secret branch of new Manticoreans. After several attempts on his life, Rasputin finally allowed the mortals to believe they'd successfully murdered him, and he disappeared along with any knowledge of the Manticoreans. Some believed he really did pass, but others suspected he still roamed the earth to this day through the shadows, building an army of fractured souls and rebels, just waiting for his opportunity to destroy the Keeper empires once and for all. But did this information deter me from meeting with him? 
Not a chance. With any luck, I'd be able to meet with the man, discover what he knew about my mother, and politely decline any recruitment speeches he tried to give before returning home. It sounded simple enough. I repeated positive thoughts to myself the whole walk down Amsterdam Avenue to the enormous and elaborate Cathedral of St. John the Divine. The church was massive, taking up an entire city block, and I had no idea where exactly I was supposed to meet this mysterious R. This is a bad idea. The voice of the owl broke through my concentration. Of course only I could hear it. I paused on the sidewalk, searching the fence lines and signposts for my feathery friend. Where are you? Your eyesight is even worse than I remember. I'm in the tree. I squinted toward the branches on the opposite side of the street. Empty. Other tree. A groan echoed through my brain. Oh! I startled at the sight of him, high in a branch just off to my right, on the other side of the cathedral gates. There you are. How long have you been following me? Four weeks, he chuckled. But this might be your dumbest move yet. Walking around out here at night without any protection is going to get you killed. You're glowing like a Christmas tree. I looked down at my arm, though I knew I wouldn't be able to see my aura. It was strange that the owl could, though. You can see my aura? Of course I can. I'm not blind. Do you know what it means? Not a clue. But it's different, and that's enough to get you killed. That's a pessimistic way to look at it. I am not a pessimist. I'm a realist. Well, either way, you'll be glad to know I'm getting off the streets as soon as I can find the person I'm meeting. And who is that? The note felt like it was burning a hole in my pocket. For reasons I couldn't explain, I felt like I needed to keep my theories a secret. Even though this was just an owl, I suspected he may try to stop me if he knew who I thought I was meeting. I am not entirely sure. Who are you, anyway, and why are you following me? Could my owl be the mysterious R? It hadn't crossed my mind that the bird might have a name, but if it could talk, and it had been following me for weeks, the possibility of it bringing me a book didn't sound so delusional anymore. My name is Alpheus Chanzira, and I've sworn an oath to protect you. Sworn it to who? You. A door creaked open somewhere within the gates. Sounds like that might be my person. I want to know more about this sworn oath business, but right now I have to go. It was nice to meet you, Al. Can I assume I will see you again soon? It's Alpheus, and you'll only see me again if you can manage to stay alive. I turned away from the owl and made my way to the entrance of the cathedral grounds. The bird hopped along the branches of the tree, moving deeper into the grounds with me to get a better look. A hooded figure stood in the shadows of the building, a cloak hanging to the ground. Chill bumps instantly covered me from head to toe. Perhaps I should have given this more thought. Everly Gordon? The man's voice was like ice on the back of my neck. My feet froze to the spot where I stood. Come on inside, darling. I won't bite. I took three shaky steps forward before turning over my shoulder for one last look at Al. I told you this was a bad idea. The man stepped forward as well, crossing the lawn and slowly lowering his hood. Streetlights cast eerie shadows on the sharp features of his face, and his long beard seemed to collect darkness from all across the grounds. The owl cursed loudly in my mind. Everly, run, that's Rasputin, the man said, extending his arm to shake my hand. I am so pleased to finally make your acquaintance. Chapter 32 Rasputin's hand was cold as ice, and it chilled me to my core. His eyes cut briefly to the flutter of wings erupting overhead as Al flew away, but they quickly returned to me, hungrily drinking in my appearance. Your aura is magnificent. 
His accent was foreign to me. It wasn't quite Russian, but more like it was from another world. He lifted a hand as though he wanted to stroke my cheek, but quickly regained control of his features and gestured for me to follow him inside. What do you know about it? I paused in the doorway. My aura, that is. I would have much rather held the conversation outside than follow him to who knows where in the giant building before me. I know that it's the sign we've all been waiting for. He paused to examine me once more before turning back toward the dark hallway ahead. Come, child, follow me and I will tell you everything I know. I didn't get the greatest of vibes from him, but I didn't get the sense that he wanted to harm me either. In fact, he seemed quite delighted to see me. With one more wary glance over my shoulder, I decided to follow him. The halls of the cathedral were mostly dark. The only illumination was moonlight that trickled in through stained glass windows, creating a blurred mosaic of eerie colors across the hard floor. What part of the cathedral are we in right now? The part that leads to my office. Rasputin pulled open a door and gestured for me to go ahead of him. You first. I tried to keep my voice steady. He gave a soft smile and a nod, then disappeared through the doorway. It was a stairwell leading down through a musty darkness. A faint yellow glow emanated from the bottom of the stairs. Do you work here, in the cathedral? I work wherever I'm needed, he responded cryptically. I examined his aura as we crept lower into the building. It had a warmer glow than Tate's or Osborne's. It was almost reddish in hue, like a molten lava. I wondered briefly what the variations in color might mean. Were they indicative of the keeper's individual abilities, or maybe their intentions? Surely they wouldn't allow evil to be on display like that. And if that was the case, Osborne's aura wouldn't be an icy golden glow compared to Rasputin's red-hot hue. Finally, we reached what I assumed was a basement, only it didn't open up wide. It was yet another drab hallway, more sinister than those above ground, because it lacked windows. As though he heard my thoughts, Rasputin explained where we were while leading me through the nondescript maze of dimly lit walls. These are escape tunnels. They are rarely used anymore, but they haven't been closed off in case of an emergency that could require the clergy to leave the cathedral unnoticed. My office is just around the corner here. He stopped and pulled a tarnished golden key from the pocket of his cloak. The click of the lock seemed to ignite my common sense, and my stomach twisted with the urge to run. We were so far below ground, so deep in the winding halls of unmonitored tunnels, that I wasn't sure if I could get away before Rasputin used whatever powers he possessed to stop me in my tracks. What was I thinking following him down here? No one would even be able to hear me scream. Al was right. This was a really, really bad idea. Just before my panic could finally drag me under, Rasputin's door swung open wide to reveal the cave-like room on the other side. Calling it an office was generous. The only thing that gave any indication that it was used was a piece of artwork hanging on the stone wall opposite the door. The room was dark, but the yellow light from the hall revealed just enough of an outline to get my heart pounding. Is that... Yes, Deliverer. That is a painting of you. Against my better judgment, I entered the small space to get a better look. It was the painting from the gallery, the one of me on a throne, scarless and fierce. My fingers brushed the area below my lip, where my scar used to protrude from my skin. It was smooth now, gone once my powers were activated, and the title below the painting still bore the words I'd seen upon my arrival in the city. Deliverance. Where did you get this? Are you working with Rossell? 
I could barely hear my own whispered words against the thunderous pounding of my heart. Rasputin scoffed. Never. But I do appreciate his artistic abilities. He captured you perfectly. What does it mean? It means the prophecy is true. Russell must have seen it in a vision. And now, seeing you here with that luminous aura, it's simply divine. But why? Why would he have it on display? It reeked of a luring enchantment. He displayed it to attract you, and it worked. But he failed to kill you. Russell wants me dead? Indeed. He tilted his head, looking almost reptilian in the process. That's why I created the explosion. I gave you a chance to escape. No. I took a step back and shook my head. That couldn't be true. Yes. I thought Tate created the explosion. Rasputin laughed, a raspy, choking sound, like he was gargling mothballs. You thought wrong. The prince was only there to destroy you, to capture your beautiful soul. But he couldn't. Your powers didn't emerge as Russell hoped they would. And by the time you turned, the prince had already realized you were more than another fractured soul. He couldn't do it. You keep saying prince. I don't know a prince. Ah, but you do. Thaddeus is a Garthian royalty. Rasputin stroked his wiry beard. Interesting that he hasn't revealed that to you. All the more reason you should leave him behind and stick with me, I suppose. Tate was a prince? How could that be? And why had no one told me? I'm sorry. I shook my head again and moved back to the door. I can't work with you. Even if what he said was true, Rasputin's goals didn't align with mine. He'd spent the last century trying to destroy the Keepers. Keepers like my friends, my Aunt Millie, my mom. I couldn't allow that to happen. Whether or not you choose to work with me, it will not change your fate. You are the deliverer. You are destined to change this world. I only offer my services to help you do it sooner. I don't need your help. I turned to leave, but something in his tone when he spoke again stopped me on the spot. I don't expect you to trust me, but I've never tried to hide who I am. In fact, I offered full information about my history to you on a silver platter. The same cannot be said for those who call themselves your friends. I turned to face him again, and a slow grin pulled his scraggly beard wide. Just be careful with what you say in front of Thaddeus. He does not care about you. He only cares about power, and he's using you to get it. Once he inherits the throne, he'll do what all the royalty before him has done. He'll squash any rumors of the prophecy flat and use his forces to destroy you. You see, your life means the end of the Keeper's power forever. Pressure stung at the back of my eyes. I wanted to deny it, to call Rasputin a liar. But he almost seemed to echo what Dom had implied the day before. If Tate wants me dead, why hasn't he done it already? He's had no shortage of opportunities to kill me. He can't kill you until he gets the throne, or his bargaining chip will be gone. I don't believe that. I didn't want to believe it anyway. I moved back to the door. Oh, it's true. The royalty has great interest in ending you. In fact, I'd be willing to bet your mother is hidden away inside one of the royal prisons as we speak. He was toying with me. I knew it. But I couldn't just walk away if he really knew something about my mother. You know where she is? If I knew, I would have found a way to release her myself. We're on the same side. I know you find that hard to believe. 
but I want you to succeed. And what's in it for you? He grinned again. The expression looked unnatural on his face. It's not about what's in it for me. It's about the betterment of all humanity. I snorted. I doubt that. He shrugged. You saw the other hunter, Osborne, take the lives of my people at the cargo dock? A gasp caught in my throat. I didn't. I escaped before it happened. But I should have known they wouldn't have been as lucky as I was that day. Well, he did. And hundreds of other lives as well. They say they're doing it to save the souls. Collecting the fractured pieces in the hopes that they will one day piece them back into whole souls again. But ask Thaddeus how successful the operation has been so far. They've been extracting souls for thousands of years, and do you know how many they've actually pieced back together? The dry lump in my throat grew larger. I couldn't swallow it down, so my voice was gravelly as I answered, Zero? Zero. Rasputin's smile morphed into a scowl. So how do we stop them? I don't have the details. All I know is that you are the one who will bring about the change we seek. You will deliver us from the overreaching power of greedy keepers who use the world and mortals for their own wicked gain. How? Find Driscoll. Who is Driscoll? He's the only one who can help you. He knows about the prophecy. I believed him. He was a liar and a criminal and a murderer. But on this, I believed he was sincere. Where can I find him? They've banished him. Rasputin's eyes flashed faintly gold for just a moment, but his powers weren't directed at me. He's trapped forevermore, and Eileen Moore. On what? The Flannan Isles. I repeated the location silently to myself. Will he know who I am? He's been waiting for you for over a century. Then I guess I should get going. Rasputin nodded. You know where to find me if you need my assistance. His eyes flared once more as he whispered a string of words I couldn't understand. Then I left him in the shadows. Chapter 33 There was no sleeping that night. I tossed and turned, tangling myself in the covers until the sky lightened into a pale gray through my window. Resigned to the fact that I would go without rest, I tucked my laptop under my arm and slid into position on the living room couch. Three minutes later, I flipped back and forth between my fourteen open tabs, learning as much as I could about the Flannan Isles Rasputin had mentioned. There was a lighthouse on one of the islands there, Eileen Moore, and unsurprisingly, the lighthouse was shrouded in mystery after an unexplained disappearance of its keepers over a hundred years ago. If I had to guess, that would have been right about the time this Driscoll fellow was banished there. Was Driscoll the old man from Gala's vision? A quick glance at my phone revealed that it was 6.57 a.m. That was close enough to lunchtime for me. I sent out a quick group text telling the guys to get here as soon as possible, then went and banged on Dom's and Gala's bedroom doors. Gala slept through the racket. Dom peeked out just long enough to let me know she was headed to an early morning class. But this is really important. I busted into her room to chat as she finished getting ready for the day. I know where the old man is. I found the right lighthouse. I'm sure of it. He'll still be there at lunchtime when we agree to meet. No, Dom, you don't understand. She flashed me a sympathetic smile. Even if you're right, and this is the one, waiting a few more hours won't change a thing. The guys said they'd meet us here after lunch today. We'll all be ready to check out your lighthouse then. By the time she left for class, Tate was standing in the hall, holding two cups of coffee. Sorry, 
he said. I would have been here a few minutes earlier, but there was some kind of issue with the espresso machine at the honeypot, and... Hey, Dom, where are you going? She glanced at me with a look of warning, then told Tate she was going to class. But you can meet us here after lunch, like we all agreed. It's fine. Come on, Tate. Maybe we can get this started a little earlier. We just need Devon. I waved goodbye to Dom and gestured for Tate to come inside, gladly accepting the cinnamon vanilla latte he brought for me. But Devon wasn't coming. Both he and Sean sent messages through in the next few minutes, saying they wouldn't be able to make it until the afternoon. That meant Tate and I were all alone, at least until Gala crawled out of bed. I went back to the library last night. He pulled a dining chair into the living room, and I was grateful to not be thigh to thigh with him on the couch. Tate had always made my stomach flip, and I didn't need his gorgeous face and the flutter in my chest distracting me, not when he could very well still be an enemy. Of course, I couldn't find anything about the prophecy, so I searched for information about different auras instead. Did you find anything about mine? I sipped the drink and recoiled as it scalded my tongue, still too hot. No. Unfortunately, we're not any closer to figuring this out than when we started. Unless you found something. Why'd you text us all to come over here so early? About that. I bit the inside of my lip, wondering how much I should tell him. Neither Dom nor Rasputin seemed to fully trust Tate. But I wanted to. Even through all of their suspicions, I just didn't get the feeling that he was here to cause me harm. Actually, I have a question for you. He lifted his brows and took a sip of his own steaming beverage. Are you a prince? His eyes bulged as he fought to keep the drink in his mouth. Swallowing it down, he wiped his lips. Where did you hear that? Just answer me. Tate's brows pulled together. My father is the king, yes, but I can hardly be considered a prince. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the definition of a prince. It's not that simple. Tate set his drink on the coffee table. My older brother, Titus, is the crown prince. I have nothing to do with them. That much has been made very clear. He mumbled the last part, his irritation evident. Why haven't you ever told me? It hasn't been relevant. Okay, I have another question. Tate inhaled deeply. Hit me with it. Tell me about your work. You extract fractured souls, and then what? We take them to the Hall of Souls in Agartha. Why? Aside from their evil tendencies? He shot me a suspicious look. We want to piece them back together. We figure if a soul is split, then the other half or pieces of it must exist somewhere within someone else. The fractured pieces can reunite in the hall, and whole keepers can be born again in future generations with the repaired souls. It's the only way to save our kind from extinction. How many fractured souls have you extracted? Personally, six. But there have been thousands over the ages. He looked pleased. And how many have been successfully pieced back together? Tate's jaw clenched. It's difficult to know, for sure. How many are you certain of? He didn't respond, and that was answer enough for me. They'd killed thousands of people by pulling their souls straight out of their bodies, and there was no proof that they were helping anyone. They were just murdering them. Rasputin was right. I stood and slammed my laptop shut with a bit too much force. Well, since no one else is coming until lunchtime, maybe you should go too. But what was it you discovered? Maybe I can help you figure it out while we wade on the others. Maybe not. We'll talk later. He would have to wait, because I certainly wasn't going to reveal what I'd learned to Tate alone. If Rasputin was right about the fractured souls... He could have been right about Tate using me for power, too, as much as I hated to think about it. Everly, is there something wrong? Nope. I ignored the way I felt drawn to him when he said my name, 
The invisible thread pulling us together seemed to tighten, and it took much effort to move away from him. Tate was a manipulator, and I wouldn't allow these false feelings to deceive me. I stepped to the door and motioned for him to go out. Just no use hanging out until the others arrive. Go home, take a nap. I'll see you later. He slowly stepped to the door and paused, a strange expression twisting the corner of his mouth as he examined me once more. He looked as though there was more he wanted to say, but after a few moments he turned into the hall. I immediately shut the door and turned both locks into place. Then I dumped the steaming contents of my coffee down the drain and retreated into my room. An emotional storm was trying to work itself up inside me, and I was having a hard time shaking it off. I shouldn't be so upset about Tate. He'd never really been on my side. But I couldn't help but feel betrayed anyway. Why, oh why, couldn't he just be good? Chapter 34 My limbs burned with adrenaline by the time Sean and Devon finally arrived that afternoon. I'd been thinking about it all morning, and I decided that I was going to ask Devon to take me with him to the lighthouse. I'd learned through my studies that Atlantean messengers could teleport others with enough energy, and I wasn't going to let Devon use it all up before taking me. I was going to meet Driscoll. I nearly tackled him with excitement when he entered our apartment. Whoa! He took a step back. I know where he is. Who? Sean asked. We joined Dom, Gala, and Tate, who were already seated in the living room. The old man, from Gala's vision. What? Tate asked. Why didn't you say something earlier? Because she didn't know for sure, Dom interjected. She thinks she knows where he is. I do know, without a doubt, and I want to go with you, I said to Devon. Hang on, where did all this confidence come from? Gala asked. I turned back to the girls to find Dom watching me closely, her head tilted to one side. She was looking for the answer in my mind, and try as I might, there was no hiding it. In fact, I was surprised she hadn't already asked me about Rasputin. It was all I could think about all morning. After a bit, Dom shook her head, keeping her eyes on me as she spoke. She's not really confident, and Devon, I think you should go alone at first. We don't want to use up all your energy on the first lighthouse, in case it's wrong. It's not wrong! Why was Dom denying this? I knew she could see into my mind. I couldn't understand why she was hiding my meeting with Rasputin from the others. I figured she'd rat me out right away, being the rule follower she was. Unless she was trying to keep me out of trouble. Dom's eyes narrowed. What is going on in there, Ev? Come on, Dom, I know you know. Everyone else remained silent as they took in the tense interaction between us. She stood and reached her hands out toward my cheeks. May I? I nodded. There was no use trying to hide anything from her now anyway. Her cool palms cupped my cheeks, and her brown eyes darkened slightly as she stared deeply into mine. Then she gasped and dropped my hands. Everly, I think you've been cursed. What? She nodded. Tell the others how you know about the lighthouse. I took a deep breath, steadying myself for the influx of objections I was probably about to receive. I met... My throat closed in on itself, restricting my airflow and leaving me choking on Rasputin's name. My hand clenched around my neck, willing it to open and provide me the oxygen I needed. Very slowly, after lots of coughing, the sudden chokehold eased up. A whole minute had passed before I was able to breathe properly again. Wiping the wetness from my eyes and shrugging off Dom's concerned arm over my shoulder, I tried again. I... No. Dom clamped her hand over my mouth. You'll choke and die if you try too hard to reveal your source. You've been cursed to secrecy. A curse? Suddenly, memories of my mother choking until she vomited in the basement of the gallery flooded my mind. 
she'd been cursed as well. It's why she couldn't reveal my heritage. It's why she couldn't tell me where she was going. If only I could have read her thoughts like Dom could read mine. You can see it in my mind, though, right? No. Her eyes were sad. It's like a dark blanket has swallowed up anything that might reveal what you saw. But what about the lighthouse? I can mention it without dying. Or I thought I could, anyway. I had to try. The Flannan Isles were on the opposite side of the world. I would never be able to reach them without help from the others. You can try, she said. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply, listening to the thunderous beat of my heart. Here goes nothing. The old man is in the lighthouse on Eileen Moore. I blurted the words as fast as I could before I would keel over, but they came out in a jumbled mess of syllables. What? Devon scrunched his eyebrows. I grinned, happy to still be breathing normally. Apparently, information about the lighthouse wasn't cursed, only Rasputin's name. Eileen Moore. It's an island in Scotland. I opened up my laptop and showed them pictures and the maps I'd saved during my research that morning. And you're certain this is where he is? Devon asked. Yes. Can you take me with you? Wait, wait, wait. Sean stood with both hands in the air before him. If you're sure this is where the old man is, then we all need to go. You're going to need some backup. I can't take everyone at once, Devon said. I'm not strong enough. How many can you take at a time? Tate asked. I've never gotten more than two. All right, Tate said. I'll go with her on this first run. No. I spoke a little too loudly, and Tate turned to me like he'd been burned by the word. If we meet the man, I'll need to know if I can trust him. I'll glamour him. I shook my head. I want Dom with me. She'll be able to hear the truth in what he tells us and see what he doesn't tell us. She stepped forward and grabbed my hand. Of course I'll go with you. And no offense, Tate, but I think Sean and Gala should be next. We'll need Sean's finesse in case things go sour, and only Gala will be able to verify if the scene matches her vision. He looked offended, but he didn't object. Fine, but don't do anything until we're all together again. Just stay put. Devon, are you ready? I turned away without agreeing to Tate's request. I am if you are. The first time is a little jolting, but I promise you'll be fine. Will it hurt? Nah, it's just a little chilly. I picked up a bag I'd prepared for the trip. Inside sat the stone tablet I'd taken from Russell, the note from Rasputin, a flashlight, two water bottles, and a granola bar. I added my phone to a zip-up pocket and secured it over my shoulders. Then Devon, Dom, and I took each other's hands and made a small circle. On the count of three, one, two... It felt like I was yanked out of New York and dragged across the icy Arctic tundra, but only for a fraction of a second... Then I stood wide-eyed and trembling in a green field surrounded by choppy ocean waters. You okay? Devon asked with a chuckle. Ah, uh, that was more than a little chilly. I rubbed the goosebumps across my arms. But yeah, I'm fine. This is incredible. The rocky island we stood upon was high above the sea. It wasn't overly large, but very steep and it was sparse of any signs of life other than the lighthouse standing tall at the center of a hill and the ancient-looking ruins of an old stone chapel. An abandoned railway and stairs led up to the white lighthouse. All around the island were steep, rocky cliffs and inlets. There were plenty of areas that could qualify as a cleft in the rock. So where would we find old man Driscoll? Wow, Dom murmured. I followed her gaze to the overcast sky, where just a trickle of golden light from the setting sun was breaking through beneath thick gray storm clouds. It was much later in Scotland than it had been back at the apartment. 
Well, it looks like your best bet will be up there in the lighthouse. You want to go now, or should I bring the others here first? Go ahead and bring Sean and Gala, I said. But, Devon, I don't want Tate to come. What? Why? Devon looked shocked, but Dom physically relaxed, the hint of a grin pulling at her lips. I just think we should keep this a small group for now. We shouldn't be quick to forget that he was tasked with killing me just last week. Let's see what the old man has to say, then we can pull him back into the mix if we need to. If you say so, Devon shrugged. You guys okay here while I go back? We're fine, Dom said. Devon nodded and disappeared into the air before us. Once he was gone, Dom turned back to me with a sad smile. I think that was the right call. I hope so. I was less certain. I wanted to trust Tate, but if Dom and Rasputin's suspicions were true, it was definitely best to leave him out of this. The sunlight disappeared entirely while Devon was gone, dipping below the horizon for the night. Giant raindrops began to fall in scattered splashes on our arms and the rocky earth. I hope they hurry. This reminds me of storms back on the ranch at home. Any minute now, the sky is going to open up and dump buckets on us. Dom squinted up into the clouds, and a roar of thunder cracked across the sky. I think you're right. Devon reappeared then, right on cue, with Sean and Gayla's hands clasped in his, and Tate's half-bent form wrapped around his waist, like they'd been mid-tackle when Devon left. What was he thinking? Tate had latched onto Devon like an uninvited hitchhiker, and it was a wonder Devon was able to make it here at all. Weak from the extra exertion of teleporting a third person, Devon fell to his knees and held his head in his hands. Tate, what did you do? I scowled at him and knelt to check on Devon. Are you okay? Devon groaned with a gentle nod. A flash of lightning illuminated the world around us, almost immediately followed by a thunderous boom the opening act of an ominous storm rolling across the sky. A few more heavy drops fell from the clouds. Then, as though someone turned on a faucet, the heavens opened the floodgates and drenched us to the bones almost instantly. Sean helped me get Devon back to his feet, but he was still too weak to move. Without another thought, Sean scooped his friend up in his arms and pointed to the lighthouse, now glowing brightly atop the hill. Let's go. We took off after him, pushing through the heavy rain like curtains of water blocking our way. A gust of wind blew across the open air atop the island, and I nearly lost my footing. The ground was slick, and it was difficult to gain much speed through the mud and rocks that jutted up from the grassy earth. Another bolt of lightning flashed through the sky, striking the island itself not far from where we ran. No, it didn't strike the island. Tate! I veered off to my right, to where Tate was laying on the ground. He appeared to be unconscious. The others were by my side a moment later, and the sky lit up once more with a bright flash of electricity. Then everything went dark. Chapter 35 My wrists ached, and it was cold, too cold. Why did the girls turn the air conditioner on? A groan escaped my lips, and I tried to brush away whatever was tickling my nose, but my hand was stuck. Everly, a voice whispered. I wanted to open my eyes and see who was there, see what my hand was caught on, but my eyelids were too heavy, and it was so, so cold. I just wanted to curl up and drift back to sleep. Everly, the voice whispered again. I slowly fought the gravity holding my lids closed. Low, flickering light reached my half-open eyes, and the brightness was too much to handle. Though it wasn't more than a candle in a jar, the light felt as though it seared my brain. I groaned again, then heard a rough cough from across the room. Fighting against the pain from the candlelight, I forced my eyes open wide enough 
to see the hunched-over outline of a strange man pacing back and forth in front of a window. No light shone through, aside from occasional flashes of lightning in the distance. It all came back to me. The island? The storm? Was that Driscoll? Where was I now? I moved to sit up, but quickly realized my wrists were tied to bedposts above my head. My ankles were tied together as well. Everly! The whisper from before was more like a growl now, but the old man pacing in front of the window didn't seem to notice. I arched my back enough to twist and steal a glance over my shoulder. Gala's platinum-colored locks fell through slats of what appeared to be a prison cell built into the wall behind the bed I was tied to. Her dark eyes were wide with fear. Behind her lay the lifeless bodies of the rest of our crew. Dom, Sean, Devon. They were all there except one. "'Where's Tate?' I whispered. Gala's dark eyes shifted to the other side of the room, where Tate was strapped to a chair and gagged. He was still unconscious, and his head lolled limply to one side. "'Is he alive?' And the others, is everyone okay? I think so. I just woke up before you. But that's him. That's the old man from my vision. I told you he was crazy. I glanced back at the man mumbling incoherently in front of the window. The low light made it difficult to make out his features, but I could see a long scraggly beard and fiery orange untamed hair hanging down well past his shoulders like a matted mane of a lion. "'Wake up Devon so he can zap us out of here,' I suggested. "'I tried. He's out cold.' I turned back toward the old man. It was going to have to be me then. I'd have to be the one to get us out of here. I searched the space immediately around me, looking for anything sharp that I might be able to use to cut through the ropes that bound me. But there was nothing. There was nothing in the room at all, save for two chairs, a small table near the window, and the bed. Well, there was the prison cell, too. The floor and walls were solid stone, as though the room was carved right out of a mountainside. And perhaps it was. We certainly weren't in the lighthouse. Perhaps we were in the cleft of the rock from Gala's vision. That meant the old man was definitely who I was looking for. Driscoll? My voice was raspy, my throat raw from yelling in the storm. I cleared it and tried again, louder this time. Driscoll! The old man stopped mumbling his gibberish and turned to face me. He froze there for a long time, much longer than was comfortable, and it was too dark for me to make out his expression. A clap of thunder boomed from outside, and it seemed to restart his motor. He immediately set into motion, marching straight toward me. I braced myself, pulling my chin in and turning away slightly as he raised his arms in the air. I couldn't make out what he held, but it looked like it would hurt if he used it as a weapon. Thankfully, that wasn't his intention. With one swift motion, he brought his arms down from over his head and released the object, throwing it down on the stone floor with all his might. It shattered into a hundred tiny pieces, and as the object burst into bits, my chest felt as though it was cracked open as well. The tablet! Gala gasped behind me. He must have retrieved it from my bag, which I noticed hanging limply off the edge of his table. Driscoll met my eyes again. His glowed a beautiful shade of blue, almost a turquoise, and they were wild with an energy I couldn't decipher. Did he want to kill me? Because shattering the tablet definitely made me feel like I was one step closer to death. It wasn't just the emotional loss of the piece— but physically I felt broken as well. Everly, you're glowing, Gala said. I glanced down at my arms and saw nothing. Driscoll must have seen it, though. A strange grin spread its way slowly across his scruffy face. 
The candlelight glinted off of his teeth, casting eerie yellow flashes from his mouth. It added to the madness he already projected. Another crack of thunder drew my attention briefly to the window. It was loud enough to cause Tate to stir, and with his movement returned the strange tingle across my skin. Only it was different this time. It wasn't the invisible thread that drew me into Tate that I felt buzzing through my body. It was more like a new sense of life, an energy I'd never felt before. It pulsed along with my heart, increasing in speed and force with every thump in my chest. Driscoll threw his head back and laughed maniacally. Then he looked down at the floor, where the pieces of my tablet still lay scattered like leaves in the fall. It was easy to see where the pieces had fallen, because they now emitted that same strange glow I'd seen back in the gallery. Driscoll, Gala, and I all watched in silent wonder as the pieces moved back together, dragging themselves roughly across the floor until they snapped back into place like a magnetic puzzle. It was the same thing they'd done when I dropped it in the gallery. But this time, I felt each piece as it reconnected with the whole. As the tablet came back together, so did I. I could feel its power surging through my veins, again and again, until at long last the tablet had been fully restored. With one quick tug, I broke through the ropes binding me to the bed. I jerked my feet apart, snapping the rope that had been wrapped around my ankles as well. I sat up, stronger than I'd ever been, rubbing the tender area where my wrists had gone slightly raw, then stood. Driscoll took one step back as I approached him. There wasn't fear in his eyes. It was something else. Respect? Reverence, maybe? Whatever it was, it was undeserved. I bent down and picked up the tablet, examining the carvings in the stone and confirming it was the same as it had been before it was broken. Then I pulled it to my chest, and a bright white light filled the small stone room. Driscoll fell to his knees, bowing his head clear down to the floor. The wind howled through the rain that pelted the small window on the outside wall, but even through the racket, I heard his shaky voice croak out a single word that would change my life forever. Deliverer Chapter 36 The bright light faded as quickly as it had come on. Dom, Sean, Devon, and Tate all stirred, awakened by the flash and groaning in pain. Gayla rushed to help the others in the cell, and I shot Tate a wary glance from where he sat tied to his chair. Turning away again, I extended a hand to the old man, who was still bowing with his face to the ground. Driscoll, stand up. We need to talk. He slowly raised his face, but did not meet my eyes. I wiggled my hand, urging him to take it, then helped him to his feet. Will you please release my friends? The friends, yes. The prince? He cut a sharp look to where Tate sat. I think not. Driscoll's words were thick with the German accent, and though he looked like a hermit driven to solitary insanity, he spoke with a high level of intelligence and carried himself like a man who had plenty of experience in the highest echelons of society. Tate caught my eyes, and I held his gaze for a long minute while Driscoll fumbled with some keys to open the prison cell behind me. His expression was pleading, almost desperate. He turned to Driscoll and his irises flashed gold, but nothing happened. A siren needed his voice for glamour, and Driscoll had Tate gagged. He was as helpless in that chair as a mortal. I felt no joy seeing him in that state, but I wasn't ready to set him free either. Not yet. With clenched teeth, I turned away in time to see my friends stumble out of the prison cell. Gala and Dom rushed forward and wrapped me in their arms. Devon, still too weak to move much, slinked out and plopped himself down on the bed I'd been tied to. Sean was a whole different story, however. His guardian training kicked in, and he bowed up, chest out, hands clenched into fists, chin held high, 
giving Driscoll the most intimidating look he could muster. You've got some explaining to do, old man. His voice came out like a growl. Driscoll was unfazed. Once his keys were secure back in his pocket, he approached me and placed his hands on my shoulders. I clutched the tablet even tighter, feeling its power become one with my own. I didn't fear Driscoll. It was hard to explain, but there was a new confidence ignited within me. I feared nothing. With a gentle squeeze on my shoulders, Driscoll spoke. Deliverer, I've been waiting for this day. I knew you would come. Why do you believe that I am the Deliverer? Because you are alive. The curse did not strike you dead. The earth wants you to know of the prophecy, and you will know. And, my friends, the Deliverer's power does not answer to the laws of the Keeper's world. You wanted your friends to live, and they did. He cut his eyes back over to Tate. Even the prince, he mumbled bitterly. Please, Driscoll, tell me everything you know. Follow me. My notes are stored in the lighthouse. We turned toward a primitive doorway carved into the stone beyond the prison cell. It was opposite the window wall, and I suspected it led deeper into the center of the island. This was how he'd stayed hidden from mortals for so many years. He lived within the island rather than on top of it. Tate fought against his restraints, grunting through the gag to get my attention. We couldn't just leave him there but the list of people who didn't trust him was growing longer by the minute. If I let you free, will you promise not to use your powers on anyone here on the island? Tate nodded, and I turned to Dom. She stared thoughtfully at him, head slightly inclined as she studied his inner thoughts. Finally, with a small frown, she turned to me. He's telling the truth. He will not use his powers here as much as he hates to hold them back. His brows furrowed, annoyed, and probably feeling a little violated at having Dom root around in his mind. I could relate. I stepped toward him, and my skin responded immediately to the proximity. Energy buzzed along my arms, urging me to reach out and touch him. Tate's eyes met mine, his breathing faster. He felt it, too. Ignoring the urge, I settled on the ropes binding his legs and easily snapped them apart with some superhuman strength I'd never before possessed. I could get used to this. I broke the bind, tying his torso to the chair next, but I left the gag and his wrists secured behind his back. I want to trust you, I whispered, so that only he could hear it. But I just... The explanation caught in my throat. I wasn't sure how to finish. A clap of thunder rattled the windows, taking the pressure off of me. Come, Driscoll said. The curse is growing angry. We followed him into a narrow stone passageway, illuminated only by the flickering candle and the lantern he carried. Devon had one arm thrown over Sean's shoulder, and Sean half carried, half dragged his friend's weak body along. Driscoll mumbled more as we followed him through the winding tunnel. It was a constant incline drawing us ever upward, up to the top of the island, where the white lighthouse stood like a beacon in the night. Though I couldn't quite make out his words, they may have been German or Bavarian, there was a strong undertone of courage. He was nervous, for sure, but Driscoll fought through his fear to do what he felt was right. We won't let anything happen to you. I tried to sound braver than I felt. What do you mean? He asked over his shoulder. You mentioned a curse surrounding the prophecy. I assume it affects you as well. But if it's true that my powers somehow counteract those of the keepers and their curse, I want you to know that you are safe. I won't let them hurt you. Driscoll laughed the same maniacal chortle from before. It is my destiny. He pushed a large, flat rock up over his head and shifted it to one side. Light immediately filled the dingy stone tunnel we huddled in, flooding down from the artificially illuminated lighthouse above us. We climbed out one by one. 
I stood behind Tate, steadying him as he ascended the ladder without any hands. My hands felt hot on his lower back, and that invisible force pushing us together didn't want me to pull away when he reached the room above. But this was no time to fantasize about embracing Tate. We were on the precipice of something great, and everyone knew it. Finally, I emerged from the tunnel and gathered together with the others in a small room lined with shelves. Would you care for tea? No, thank you, Dom said at the same time Gala exclaimed. Yes. Me too. Driscoll smiled at Gala, then set off to the small kitchen to fill a kettle and bring the water to a boil. The storm raged on outside as he went about his work, with lightning flashes and booms of thunder filling the room every few minutes. I examined the books and files on the shelves as he worked, but most were written in languages I was unfamiliar with. After a short time, Driscoll returned with hot cups of tea for everyone, but Tate. Maybe it was a slight against him, but Tate wouldn't be able to enjoy it with the gag in his mouth anyway. Still, I couldn't bring myself to make eye contact with him, or else I'd probably crack from the guilt and set him free. So, Driscoll said, settling into a seat at a small table near the kitchen area. What do you know about the prophecy? Nothing, I admitted. Tate is the only one of us who had ever heard of it before. Would you like him to share what he knows? No, Driscoll scoffed. He is a Garthian royalty, yes? Tate hung his head as we confirmed it. Then he should not be here at all. The royalty is to blame for this curse on our world. They destroy the prophecy. They do not want it to come to fruition, but it must. You must deliver us from their evil. The old man trembled, revealing his desperation. Tate lifted his gaze back to mine, his eyes wide and glistening. They weren't filled with guilt or hatred. He looked very much like a victim rather than a villain. I couldn't believe that Tate had anything to do with the evil Driscoll spoke of, royalty or not. He will kill you now that he knows what you are, Driscoll continued. That is his destiny. No, Dom said. He may not be entirely forthcoming, but he doesn't want Everly dead. I can see that clearly. Tate's eyes glimmered in the light, the golden flecks calling out to me on some deeper level, and I couldn't resist any longer. With a new swiftness, I broke the binding on his wrists and removed his gag, praying that I wouldn't soon come to regret it. I will never kill you. The words spilled from his mouth in a hurry, as though he expected me to gag him again at any moment. Never. You have my word. I will do whatever it takes to protect you for as long as I live. This is my oath, through the sky, the sea, and the earth on which we stand. A collective gasp filled the room. Well, there you have it, Gala said, calmly sipping her tea. The hunter has sworn himself to you. If he kills you now, he'll die on the spot. She put a hand on her chest and looked up to the sky. Is that true? My voice was shakier than I would have preferred. Tate nodded. But Dom is right. There's something I haven't mentioned. Driscoll snorted and took a long drink from his own mug. My mission to hunt you did not come from my own Agarthian superiors, not directly, anyway. It was an order from a higher power. You see, there is a group of elite keepers across the races, the highest ranks within the royal courts, and they work together for the betterment of the earth. The order to extract your soul came directly from them, from Rossell and the Olympian king, specifically. Why? I don't know. They didn't say. But it was important. Important enough that I was promised the crown if I could pull it off. My chest cracked. It was true, then, what Rasputin said. Tate only wanted power. He only wanted the Agarthian throne. And after he got it, what would become of me? So what now? Are you still after the crown? 
No. Tate shook his head emphatically. Now there is something bigger to work toward. I don't have to save my kingdom by sacrificing myself for the Agarthian throne. I can save it by helping you destroy it. Chapter 37 Tate's words hung heavily in the air for some time. I couldn't be certain that what he said was true. How could someone, a prince no less, be so enthusiastic about destroying his own kingdom? It didn't make sense. But at least I didn't have to worry about him trying to kill me now that he'd given the oath. Well, I said after a minute, then I suppose we need to learn as much as we can about this prophecy. Driscoll grunted his approval and downed the rest of his tea. He set his cup on the table, steepled his fingers, and inhaled a deep breath. I knew then there was much more to this prophecy than I could have imagined. There have always been rumors, he began, ever since I was a child. Stories of our kind, how we began, our purpose on the earth, and how we would end. Over time, it became more like a fairy tale than actual history. But I could never forget those stories from my youth. They struck a chord in me, and I dedicated my life to discovering more about the secrets of our ancestry. At university, I specialized in lost and forgotten languages. My partner and I traveled across the globe, reviewing ancient artifacts and deciphering their meanings for museums and private collections. But a little over a century ago, we found something truly incredible, a stone tablet. His eyes cut briefly to the object I clutched in my arms, and I found myself squeezing it tighter. He watched me with wonder, his aqua blue eyes twinkling with respect, framed by his wild mane of orange hair. But there was one tuft of curls that didn't blend in with the rest of his fiery head of hair. One white swirl of curls hung low over his brow. Though he was older now, and certainly aged by the stress of his situation, there was no denying who this man was. I'd seen him before, in a slideshow on my first day at Columbia. You worked with Professor Brossard, didn't you? Driscoll nodded sadly. Indeed. The professor had lied to me. How many people were in on this? How many people knew my true identity? The tablet we found was but a fraction of the whole. We knew what it said, but it made no sense, not without the other pieces. I paused all of my other projects, devoting everything I had to this one stone tablet. Why? I asked. Why this one? because I knew it was special. I did not understand the greater context, but there was one word that revealed enough for me to know that the world would never be the same. I looked down at the object in my arms, and I could practically feel it pulsing along with my heart, faster as the power of the object became more and more tangible. What is it? My voice was a whisper. What does it say? Driscoll held out his hand, and I gently laid my treasure on his palm. He grinned, as though he were seeing the face of a long-lost friend. It says, The daughter of, together with, ignites her, centennial, shall form a, the powers, the deliverer. He pointed to the different symbols as he read their meanings aloud. My stomach sank. That means nothing to me, Driscoll chuckled. It means nothing to anyone, but it mentions the Deliverer, and that was enough for me to give it further exploration. I was so close to cracking the code, too close. The elites took notice of my efforts. You see, they've known about the prophecy since the dawn of time. It was carved into stone by the prophets of the first century, the royalty did not like what they saw. They did not want to hear of their demise, and they believe that in destroying the prophecy, 
they could destroy the truth behind it as well. But the prophecy could not be destroyed, as you have noticed. The greatest damage they could achieve was breaking the tablet into four pieces. Each kingdom took one quarter of the stone to hide within their territories, and the fourth was cast deep into the depths of the earth, buried beneath the Arctic, where neither man nor keeper would ever dare to locate it. But by some miracle, it washed upon the shores of Greenland a little over one hundred years ago. It was found by a mortal who called upon my partner and I to inspect it. I discovered what it was through ancient writings. Diaries and fictional accounts provided more information, and I made it my personal mission to learn whatever I could about this deliverer. As the world grew more evil each year, I saw the need for you to destroy the status quo and give us the reset we all so desperately need. When the elites realized what I was trying to achieve, they tried again to destroy the object you hold now, but it was not possible. It could not be destroyed, and it could not be cursed. So they cursed me instead, and banished me here to this island, which is also cursed. They created a fictional narrative, convincing keepers across the world that any mention of the tablet or the prophecy would curse them as well. They believe I lost my mind, he chuckled, and perhaps I have, but I know that you are real, and I know that you have the power to change the world. The storm roared outside, and a particularly loud crack of thunder made me jump in my seat. Driscoll looked nervously toward the lighthouse window. I've said too much. The island will kill me now. It is my destiny. It's not, I argued. I won't let anything happen to you. Tell me, Driscoll, what do I do now? How do I change the world? He took my hand in his and gave it a firm squeeze. You must find the other pieces of the tablet. You must travel to each of the three kingdoms to restore it and use its power to accomplish the task before you. I can help, Tate said. I can get us into the Agarthian palace. I wanted to trust him, but common sense won out again. Maybe we should start with Atlantis. That's the one place I should be welcomed. Driscoll took another deep breath and looked up to the sky. It is time. He squeezed my hand again. I wish you well. The entire lighthouse reverberated with a jolt of electricity, followed by a crack of thunder so loud it made my bones ache. A moment later, I became aware of smoke and Tate pulling on my hand. The lighthouse is burning. We've got to get out. He pulled me through the doors and out onto the island. Darkness covered the earth like a blanket, a heavy, wet blanket, that threatened to snuff out any life that dared to stand up against it. The storm raged harder than ever, wind whipping the raindrops against my cheeks like stones. We'd made it about twenty paces away from the building before we turned to stare in awe. The lighthouse tower burned, blazing brightly even through the torrential downpour. Waves rose from the ocean surrounding us, like angry giants waking from a slumber. They grew taller and taller, an army of great walls moving toward the island. The curse is here for me, Driscoll said. I pray it won't get us all. It won't. I will keep you safe. All of you. I turned to look at my friends one at a time, allowing my eyes to linger on each of theirs long enough for them to understand just how serious I was. I swear it as the Deliverer, as my oath, through the sky, the sea, and the earth on which we stand. I repeated the words Tate had uttered just minutes earlier, and felt a lock snap taut in my chest as some greater power made my words a reality. 
The largest of the waves was nearing the island, growing larger with every passing second, and I knew my words wouldn't be enough. It wasn't stopping. The curse was going to wipe us all away into the depths of the ocean. I'd survive, and the other Atlanteans, perhaps, but I would not allow it to kill my friends. We'd come too far to be swept away by some water. Anger boiled red-hot inside me, and I lifted my arms as though I might block the water from reaching us. A guttural yell escaped my throat, originating from deep in my belly and sounding like something from another creature in another world. I couldn't explain where it came from if I tried, but it did the trick. The wave split into two, avoiding my outstretched arms and my death-like war cry. It crashed to the earth, extinguishing the flames of the lighthouse and falling back into the ocean. Enough! I yelled again, spinning around with my arms still outstretched above my head. I stared down the storm, scolding it like a naughty child, and to my amazement, it cowered at my voice. The rain slowed, the wind stilled, and after another minute, all was quiet. I turned to find my friend's open-mouthed stares. They were shocked, all of them except Driscoll. He fell to his knees once more, bowing to me. What are you doing? Get up, the storm is over. Devon was next. Guys, please don't do this. Then went Dom, Sean, and Gala. Tate, thank you. Please talk some sense into them. Tell them to get up. This is not necessary. He shook his head. The corner of his mouth curled up ever so slightly, not with derision, but more like a proud parent might regard a child on stage accepting a medal. Then he dropped, his knees splashing into the mud, and lowered his face to the ground. I dropped as well, placing myself squarely on their level and wiping the tears stinging at my eyes. The weight of everything I'd learned squeezed my chest, and I felt so alone and ill-prepared for whatever lay ahead. Please, I said softly, raise your heads. I need you all beside me, not below me. If we're going to change the world, it's going to take all of us. To be continued. This has been Fractured Secrets, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book Two. Written by A. R. Colbert. Narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Copyright 2023 by A. R. Colbert. Production copyright by A. R. Colbert.